Hey there, and welcome to Killer POV, episode 76. My God, we've been doing this a long time. Long ass time. And we're going to time travel in a little while back to a little era called the 90s. Very exciting. Party of Five crush. <laughs> I remember those crushes. I'm definitely going to need like a Sonic Youth or Mud Honey shirt. Oh, I was and wearing that today. Flannel. I, believe I was wearing my Sonic our, Youth t shirt today. I believe our guest directed a bunch of Party of Five. Mm -hmm. Did you know that? Oh, yeah. That's that's actually one of the things I <laughs> was pretty questions? excited when I saw that he did not just Party of Five, but Dawson's Creek. Oh. If you've done episodes of those two, you've covered both my major I gotta crushes. Confess, I've never seen a Party of Five episode. Uh, ah, yeah. Nice. And I'm, I was like a teen <laughs> in the 90s. Say, oh, say I know, people. Say hello. The Say Love People is Rebecca uh, McKendry, McKendry from Bangalore. Yes. Yeah. There she Best is. Best title you could ever have. Uh, to my left is Elric Kane from Inside Horror. Greetings, Elric. I'm all five Kane. of the party. He's all five. All five. Always. All five. All five. I'm uh, the Scott Wolf the of Killer POV. That, show? Uh, that they, a family had lost their parents, and so they, they were raising each other. And so it was like five kids, like the oldest brother, which is the guy from Lost, was the kind of head of the family, and then Scott Wolf, and then Hot Nev Campbell, who would just like, just blew like I wasn't interested in Scream Nev Campbell, but Party of Five Nev Campbell was oh. my ultimate crush. Hey. Freckles, her freckles, cutest ever. And then Jennifer Love Hewitt came on for a while. Oh wow, she was the I girlfriend of that. Scott Wolf, I think, for a while. And then Charlie, who's the the oldest son, starts dying in one of the later seasons, and it it gets a, a young cancer kind of thing, and it and it's all very sad. It's a very emo show, but it was wow. great. I, loved I was it. gonna say this show is already just like love that show. Yeah, on, on that dark note. So I'm Rob yeah. G from uh, <laughs> <laughs> I Got the Fright, and uh, welcome to Killer POV. All right, we so. could have a Party of Five podcast. <laughs> I, I don't think I want to be involved. In that. Yeah, I watched my So Call Life. Mm -hmm. um, I don't remember the Claire what. Dance. I never saw that one, but yeah. a lot of people like that. Must have watched what I wa I watched a lot of emo movies in the '90s. Mm -hmm. I yes. guess that was a the state. It I was a glorious that. glorious time. It was. I love the '90s actually. I don't know about horror, but we'll get yeah, into yeah. that. Yeah, we'll get into that. There, there's some. Well, it's weird because we're children of the '80s, but teens of the 90s yes. so yeah so the 90s are really when most of our formative experience are so the, on musically i'm with you i think musically, the music with movies, things like nirvana project yeah but movies in general it's it's a it's like a transition but we saw all the 80s movies mm -hmm. on video in the 90s that's true so that's it that's what it's a yeah. it's weird because to other people that grew up in it it doesn't seem like a fertile right. time for horror but for us it was like when we were Getting to absorb all yeah, that's yeah. what I was thinking about today when I was making my list of like 90s horror films that I liked is that I saw a lot of these in the theater, but the majority of what I watched was stuff I picked up at the mom and pop from video before. store. Mm -hmm. So when I think about like films I watched in high school, most of them are actually from the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, it was all like stuff that had happened long well, ago. Well, even though we're going to get into it later, what I will say when I was looking, I, I took a list of all anything good in each year <laughs> and I wrote, jotted down, I not just my too. favorite, but what I will say is, uh, because Ken Hanley, who uh, writes for Fangoria, was getting on my case when I called it the Dark Abyss of 90s. And he's right. There are some c real great movies in there. Yeah. We're going to be talking about a lot of them. But I, what I will say is the majority of those movies are all made in 1990, which means they were made in the 80s. And so they are bleed over from the 80s and coming out in 1990. Literally, so, like the bulk of the ones that I'm like, oh, they're great movies, you know. So you're going to count. Oh wait, 1990. Oh, so you're saying they're they're made? I guess we. They came yeah. out in 1990. Technically, well, like still... the first half of the 90s, I noticed there were still sequels bleeding over. Like we yeah. still were seeing a yeah. Freddy yeah, and yeah. A Jason and Child's yeah. Play two and things like that. A lot of the still, bad like, ones over towards the, the end. 90s. Yeah. So, you know what? I'll, we'll save all that. We'll see your case, but I, I already know that there's at least three classics that are definitely 90s. Yeah. I oh guess. no, no. There's way more yeah. than that. There's there's actually a lot. I'm just saying comparatively. It's just funny how many are at that first year, which is technically still 80s stuff right, that was right. being made, you know, yeah, yeah, where, yeah. where the imagination was still pretty rife. Right, right. Okay. <laughs> but we'll get into that. That's that's for two minutes from now. Okay, <laughs> two minutes. <laughs> Time it, guys. All right, I saw a couple of things. One thing with Elric, uh, but where do we, you know what, I'll, I'll kick it off and then yeah, we'll start just go with one at a time. Go, man, go. Uh, it's questionably genre, but I had to give it a shout out. Uh, I went and caught the guest over oh, yeah. at the Arclight this week. I'll weekend. be seeing that tomorrow. So the follow-up from the Your Next Guys, uh, Simon Barrett, the writer, and uh, Adam Wingard, the director. And uh, I kind of loved it. It was, <laughs> It's a... Uh, it's, um, I like Your Next, but this uh -huh. is like... This is miles ahead of it in terms mm. of the quality of type of movie. Like, they really improved as filmmakers. And uh, their lead is Dan Stevens, who... I was completely unfamiliar with. I know he's he's on Downtown, Downtown Abbey, Abbey. Was the thing, yeah. and apparently in that he's a little on the on the hefty chubby side oh, or wow. something like. I don't know. I'm huh. not familiar, huh. but he is the smoothest, most charismatic, charming mofo cool. <laughs> that I've seen in a movie all year. He's really really good. Okay, and is there um, a way to do it spoiler free? Just come see it tomorrow. Um, I, you know what? I in think terms it's, of tone. 
I think it's better if you go in not knowing it. It's uh-huh. definitely more of an, I'd say, an action drama. Okay. But it's set in October, so there's a lot of Halloween stuff, including mm-hmm. a Halloween maze. So there's a lot of fun genre kind of things in there. I and saw then, an article where he listed, Wingard listed, like, the five movies that influenced him. And anyone who's seen the guest says that you can see all five of those movies. Do you know any of them? I know, I know one's Terminator and one is yes. Halloween and yes. one is... <laughs> yeah, so I can't remember. It's, you can look it up, the thing. It's fun, though. It's that, a, but that's the fun thing. If you don't know that uh-huh. and you see it and then you're like, wait, did this movie just turn into that? <laughs> you're like, okay, cool. I, I, I'm going to so, just... I can't wait to see it. Loved it. Definitely go see it. Yeah. Uh, and uh, um, great soundtrack. Probably Chase my, Williamson has a small role, maybe? Yeah, yeah. yeah oh, I that was the other thing. Really good in it every there's uh, i don't want to spoil it there's a lot of cam like i wouldn't okay. say cameos but like a lot of significant roles from people that we've seen in genre movies cool. that we really like a lot you know cool. including aj who you'll have to really look for because yeah. he's unrecognizable in it well we worked with him on that day oh okay because he went for that's what he was oh, in that's becca's right. yeah, found yeah. okay yeah. so that he probably looks similar exactly yeah with glasses with and glasses, everything yeah. so there yeah, you yeah. go yeah that's funny so yeah the guest excellent and i recommend cool. it oh he wasn't in found he was in barista Hey? No, Chase was no. AJ. AJ, AJ. Sorry, AJ, yeah. you're right. Thank you. Yeah. Doesn't even know her own filmography. <laughs> Honestly, People are going to be writing to you, go, Becca didn't even know her own date. <laughs> I've got a lot of films. Yeah, okay. <laughs> uh, so I saw, I didn't see much, so let me just finish mm-hmm. these off. I saw The Kindred based on your recommendation. Right. I did, in fact, have a DVD copy of it. Did you love it? I didn't love it, but I thought it was pretty good. It's wrong. It was pretty good. It's pretty good. Well, I just What'd got the DVD. I said you're wrong. I'm watching I'm, it this I weekend. gave it to Becca so she could decide oh, okay, okay. the party. Uh, no, I, I threw it on, and like 20 minutes in, I, I texted yeah, Eric, and I'm like, well, first 20 minutes, nothing really what happens. I, what did I say? Is like, is this actually going to get good anytime yeah, soon? <laughs> it really does. Uh, I think But so. you know what? And I will but do you say see what I mean by a crowd movie? Like if that was playing with the crowd, I think every like five minutes, there's something in it that crazy. And yeah. Fun I mean, there. I think what's fun about it is, you know, and that's in that this lead into scary movie, mm-hmm. the movie that we both saw is that it if it was an, a readily accessible movie, The Kindred, mm-hmm. you'd probably just figure out oh, it was all right. Mm-hmm. But the fact that it's. I love that there's still gems to be discovered right. when you see something and then there's something that stands out. I will say that the second half of the movie movie is very gooey. Oh, yeah. yeah gooey yeah. and gory. Yeah, the effects are gooey. really crazy. Gooey is the best word I could come up with. And that that won me over. That and the weird humor, like you were saying. Like yeah. The way people react to stuff is pretty out of control. It's pretty bizarre. I mean, but that's, that's where you would get good laughs in the first 20 minutes. But. And there is a shot that I totally saw boom mic in oh, really? right off the bat. <laughs> Maybe the VHS so. is a little harder to read. But I, unfortunately for me, because I really wanted to do copy i heard through the grapevine that blank and ship screened it two years ago Kindred. at Santa family yeah, oh cool on 35 because i really wanted i would still love to screen that in a group of people <laughs> i just think it's it's got a lot of those things though i will say this uh not really a spoiler to you but uh gill girl towards the end no oh, amazing but but wasted <laughs> like final moment should have come back a final like ah! like there needed to be that final it was one of those movies that had everything except for a final Boo boo, and I was surprised by that because I was she was perfect for that, you know. Well, it was nineties. It was nineties. They yeah. didn't uh, <laughs> have the formula down. Yes. Yeah. Interesting, but good movie. I'm uh, glad you guys Excellent. See it. Well, I can't wait to watch it. Yeah, there's only one that I wanted to get extensively into, but we can come back to it. Do you want to talk about scary movie since we both saw that? I guess. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Which seems like such a generic title. Yeah, I mean, but it's a, all not right. The so Wayans. not not the Wayne's brother movie. What? It, let's give some context. This was Secret mm-hmm. Sixteen, Mike mm-hmm. Williamson's event that he does at Jump Cut Cafe, and he screened a print of this long lost Austin film filmmaker's film, which was called Scary Movie from ninety three, I think. Well, I believe it was made in eighty nine, but released in ninety one. Okay, at least on video. And, and John Hawkes' first role. John Hawkes' first Great role. The, the, the writer-director is named uh, Daniel Erickson. Mm-hmm. And he kind of, I mean, you know, the way that Mike explained it at the screening was that, you know, there was, there was like an error in the early, early 90s of all these exciting filmmakers like Robert Rodriguez and this guy. And then this guy just disappeared. Mm-hmm. And then Mike, for some reason, actually owns the only print. Because uh, Mike was uh, from there, too. He's from there. He contacted him a few years ago. The guy was like, sure, I I have the negative, so I don't care. I'll sell you my original print. Sold him the print. And then apparently he disappeared. So Mike's like, I don't know what happened to him. And it was on VHS circulation, like, locally. Locally. He he, he put it out himself. But now those have all kind of dried up, too. Yeah. I mean, you can't even, you can't find them on eBay or anything. They're really hard to find. Is there a trailer on? Oh, it might be on YouTube, though, right? The whole movie, movie, I think, you know, I don't want to advocate that, but there's no other way to see it. I'm pretty sure the whole movie's on YouTube. Yeah. And it's a weird movie because it it's got the it's got the setup of a slasher movie. Yeah. But it's not. And it's hard to talk about it without really 
spoiling it because it, it's not good. Mm-hmm. Well, I don't throw around the term perfect movie very often, and I mean perfect, and I definitely want to throw it around now. I was going to say, <laughs> so it's not good. Okay. Perfect no. movie. Uh, no, yeah. It, you know, it's it, you, you, Rob leaned in halfway through and just said to me, I see why it's lost. Yeah, I did. <laughs> and I did and it is too. a little bit like that, you know, whereas Disconnected, which we watched um, the year before, it's, there's something really fantastic about it, even though you know it's kind of shitty. On but every level, yeah, though. Yeah, on like, every level. It's just like a, a colossal... There is some interesting stuff in this. The performance is interesting, even though it's really over the top. It's, it, it plays more like, I guess, a psychodrama meltdown movie. It's more yeah. about watching a character kind of come undone. Unfortunately, he's coming undone from the first frame, and so you don't really know why he's coming undone. Right. And you don't understand his fear of everything. Like, he seems to be scared of anything Halloween-related. Right. And there's John there's Hawks. John Hawks. Okay. He's kind of... The biggest weenie, yeah, it's a total I've weenie ever movie. seen it's a weenie. in any movie ever. Yeah, wow. and that's the thing is like normally you're the one that wants to relate to that guy because yeah. you're like, oh, I'm watching a horror movie, so obviously I'm kind of a weenie too. Yeah. But he takes the cake, and yeah, yeah. but he's Halloweeny <laughs> for sure. Yeah, second it's, half it, got yeah, better. No, it is, and it's still interesting. I, I think everyone was glad they saw it there, but I, it definitely is one of those movies. You go, okay, if it wasn't rare and wasn't lost, and you just rented it, you probably go, oh, that's pretty. Average. I, yeah, I think I yeah. think it has a really solid ending, which is what you yeah. know. Honestly, it almost I don't want to say it makes up for the movie, but it got us all talking. So that that's like, oh, okay, this is this lost movie. Not and I do good, love the setting. I loved it's set on a, a Halloween haunted, I mean, been, yeah. a haunted. No, not really a music. No, uh, that's what he pitched maze, it as too, right? Maze. But really, it's one of the only films I've seen that's pitched in one of these Halloween mazes slash you know makeshift haunted houses where people are a community's putting it on. You get your ticket. So <laughs> fun house. on that level, yeah, but not like a profession. <laughs> but that's like a professional mm. circus fun house. You know yeah. what I mean? So this I don't. I haven't seen this very often. That's I. I really like that element. I love the decor. I love the kind of world of the movie. Yeah, but yeah, there's you know, it just doesn't quite uh, work, but you know, it will have its fans. Mm -hmm. And then uh, one last one for me. And then, uh, and then we'll move on because I've been excited to talk about this. I finally watched Willow Creek. Yes. The movie written and directed by Bobcat Goldthwait. Which I'm excited to hear about. Because i got to be honest, I was not a fan of his other film. See, now that, which, which one? The Why can't I remember the name God of it? God Bless America? God Bless America. Okay. I, I actually think he's a fascinating writer-director. And I, I, loved, I loved God Bless America. I loved World's Greatest yeah, Dad. World's Greatest Dad. I loved Sleeping Dog's Lie. The I only one I'm that. a little iffy on is his very first one, Shakes the Clown, but he's just getting his, his footing. Mm-hmm. He's kind of mastered the art of black comedy, mm-hmm. at least in those other films. So I I like those a lot. And then you hear another found footage movie with Bigfoot, but it's Bobcat writing and directing. So all of a sudden I'm like, all right, this is interesting. So I finally watch it. And, and here's the thing. This is the best way I could break it down is it's very competently made, you know, in terms of, you know, the thing with found footage is sometimes it's shot like, you know, terrible people that don't know how to maneuver a camera, Yeah. but he's a good director. So at least te- on a technical level, the way, you know, the camera works and operates and the lenses and stuff like that, the f- you know, it's a very well made film and also important for found footage. He got two really strong, likable characters, you know, like there are a couple in the movie um, what are their names? Um, Bryce Johnson and Alexi Gilmore. They play Jim and Kelly. And Jim's the one that wants to go out and, uh, you know, shoot some documentary footage, interview some locals about the Bigfoot legend and see if there's anything to it. And and they're really likable and fun and funny. I mean, mm-hmm. some, of the, some of the conversations and dialogue they have are great. However, during the first whole half of the movie, and it's really short, it's like 80 minutes, whatever. The first half... I was having trouble with it. Despite its technical achievements and its acting, I was I was almost bored to tears because if you had never seen a found footage movie before, it's great. If you have, it hits every fucking beat from all mm. of them, including the guy that gets up to the car and is like, you want to get in your car and turn back around right now. <laughs> like every one of the cliche right. things that you could possibly think of is in that first so half. It's kind of movie. So it's the more of a Becca movie. Wait, wait, wait. It's totally, it the first 40 minutes is the type of film that Becca's short film makes fun of. Yes. Uh. But here's the turning point. Then in the middle, there has got to be a 25 minute take. There is one what? really, really long, mm. impressive, mm. cool, long tape. And, and even during that, I'm still kind of like, all right, is anything going to happen or whatever? And then the last 20 minutes is fucking terrifying. Mm. terrifying and i honestly the only thing i could say is by the time it was over you know because i was watching it as the sun was going down so it was dark by the time it was mm. over i was kind of creeped out mm. you know i was like all right it worked and the only way i could describe it is 
Bobcat perfectly captured the structure of the Blair Witch Project. Oh. I know for a fact that's because I, I know I spoke to him briefly when he was making this movie. And I, th and I think that's what he mentioned. And it's obvious that he, he hasn't watched other found footage mm. movies. And if you think of everything I just said, that's exactly what the Blair Witch is essentially. Mm. The first half is kind of like, right, what yeah. the hell is this movie? Where is it going? And the da, ending da, da, da. redeems the whole thing. Yeah. Exactly. And that's how I feel about Willow Creek is it's, you know, I didn't love it. I don't think it's one of the great, like that's the weird thing about horror this year. Like I'm already lamenting like the idea of putting a top 10 because I don't love any movie wholeheartedly. Mm -hmm. There's things that I really there's love. There's so in much them. about to come out. I mean, that's the crazy hope, thing I with hope. Beyond Fest and Fant. I'm just watching everyone at these festivals going, oh God, there's so many. I think this year is going to be stronger than last year in terms I of the so. amount of good films. Maybe mm -hmm. not, maybe not like one that stands out like, oh, it's the Conjuring of the Year or whatever, you know. Yeah. We'll, see. we'll see. Or the battery. Of the, there hasn't been one that we felt well, as we did about the battery. Exactly. Yeah. But, but I, I know what you far. mean. That's far. Yeah. I think, I think there's going to be a lot in the next like, you like, know, few weeks. Like there's things I like about proxy. There's mm -hmm. some really yeah, yeah, impressive, yeah, exactly. but it's not my, in my top 10 of yeah, the yeah. year. Yeah. Willow Creek's not in my top 10 of the year, but I stand by that. I think that the last 20 minutes are terrifying. Mm -hmm. So, you know what I mean? Like it's a weird year so far. Yeah. But, and, and I also think when we do our top 10, it, uh, what is horror is going to probably be examined because just like you said, with things like the guest or cheap thrills, who knows? how we will even structure top tens because those films kind of get lumped into this mm -hmm. category nowadays, you know? Anyway, yeah. that's, that's interesting. I'm looking, I will borrow your copy yeah, right, right now and I'll probably to watch it out. tonight. Um, did you want to do one, Becca? Sure, I'll jump in what with else mine. You got? I got a few. Um, so uh, really quick, I will say I watched a non-horror film this week that I wanted to recommend. I watched Behind the Candelabra on, um, which is the story of Liberace. I, 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 it was Ooh. surprisingly wonderful. How so, are you allowed Michael, to talk about that on Killer POV? I just had to plug it. That's the end it's, of it. You guys are making a much bigger deal out of it than it was going behind to be. Michael Candelabra? Isn't that, yeah, that's Liberace and Matt Damon. Matt, it's uh -huh. um, Matt Damon and, uh, um, why can't I remember his name now? You guys just made me forget. So there, you did Rocky that. Horror, Welcome to Elegant Liberace. POV. No, I'm telling you, you would like it, Elric. It's also the best Rob Lowe movie I've ever seen. <laughs> Soderbergh would quit after that movie. It, it was good. So anyways, okay. that was my like quickie plug. Um, I finally watched Barbarian Sound Studio. Uh -huh. Oh, cool. Which um, I and, you know, I should have known going in because uh -huh. when Elric tells me beforehand that a movie is slow, uh -huh. It's really fucking slow. Yeah. And, um, and and it doesn't quite go the anywhere. actual story, like the character. It's the kind of movie like when Francis Ford Coppola say made the conversation. It's kind of like that kind of structure, but that somehow electrifies and works as a character. Yeah, the conversation has a plot. Well, yeah, but even so, like it's more of a character thing. This this character, he's a good actor, you know, Toby yeah, Jones. He's great. I just found him dull to watch in that movie. But the stuff happening around him was interesting in the, the sound recording and the, the way it looked. But again, uh, it's just like references. No, no, uh, it was very cool. And I mean, obviously the sound was great and the structure and the setting of it was great. And the whole, it's about a, a, a British guy. He's very shy and kind of, mum, uh, you know, befuddled and mm -hmm. very unsure of himself. And he gets hired to go do a sound mixing job in Italy. Mm -hmm. And everybody there is really abrasive. And it's for this really intense horror film, which they kind it's of so give, Suspiria. Uh, yeah, they give illusions yeah. that it's Suspiria, it's so but like then Suspiria. it's, it's Suspiria-like. Yeah. It's about witches in a dormitory, but then oh. there's like hot oh, yeah. pokers in the vagina <laughs> yeah, I mean, and the things whole thing like that like that are like way batshit out yeah. of nowhere. Um, and he's really off-put by the movie itself, and then he kind of has a thing for this lead actress, but she's kind of weird too. And then all of this trippy shit starts happening is the best way I can put it. Um, is things yeah. start getting really creepy and trippy, but then it doesn't go anywhere. And oh my God, I just kept waiting. And I was like, if this pays off, this is going to be the greatest movie I've ever seen. And then there was nothing. Yeah. And some people in England that was like touted as like the best film of that year, like, because it's English, I guess is a bit, they were really getting behind <laughs> it, but like sight and sound, I think it was on the cover of the year's best film. So it wasn't just a, like a hard, they were really claiming this is yeah. their next big talent. So I know a few listeners in the UK, you can maybe ex shine a light yes, why that is. I was yeah. confused. I will but, say it is the greatest opening credit sequence I've seen in like decades. Wow. It's, it's like a mare in the sense with a lot of style. Gorgeous. Yeah, there's a lot of style to moments of it that are just really yeah. gorgeous. But then, you know, you look at Beyond the Black Rainbow, that there's certain movies that do look yeah. fantastic, but maybe don't have the same narrative I don't to know. pull you in. You I know? tried, man. I tried. And I really, really, really wanted to understand that. And that was the thing. I really tried to like that one. But the and, whole I, time. and if neither <laughs> of us, I mean, if we're both trying, yeah. then that's interesting. because we're Midway through, days. I kept thinking, you know, this movie could really benefit from like a Spicoli character. And then I was like, <laughs> OK, I need to just stop now because this yeah. is not my type of movie. But yeah, I really tried. And I have a feeling there. I, I kind of summed up the entire movie to just this one scene that I swear is like the meat of the entire movie, but I can't figure out how, mm -hmm. where um, he's talking with one of the really like 
brash Italian guys. And um, he hands him some grapes and or it's I think it's a watermelon or something. He hands him some fruit and he goes to spit the seeds out. The British guy does. And he and the Italian guy says, where I am from, we eat the seeds. Hmm. And I'm kind of like that somehow has to sum up the movie for me because the movie has very little dialogue in it. Like mm-hmm. most of it has no dialogue. It's just listening to the sound mixing um, for the movie that you never see. But yeah, yeah, I mean, I think on our podcast, we eat the seeds. <laughs> Sorry, Becca. <laughs> I don't know what it means. So I have but no it's... idea what it means. Um, and then my good movie of the week that I absolutely loved was Ragnarok. Um, oh, okay. Ragnarok is um, from Norway. And uh, I actually I, new or old. I think it's Norway. I want to double check yeah. that. I'll look that up. Um, I know somewhere Scandinavian northern area up there. Sweden, we have some very somewhere pissed off Swedish <laughs> listeners right now. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, I want to apologize. Like Sweden, somewhere up there. Finland's um, always had a maudlin quality. Actually, it might be Finland. No, it isn't. It's whatever's. It's next to Russia because they go over into Russia territory. Perhaps it's Norway. Shh. <laughs> We could do this all day long. I think it's somewhere that has like herring fish. Somebody look it up fish. for me. Um, anyway, it's Scandinavian country, somewhere up there. And uh, it is, um, it's a PG-13, Norway? is it? <laughs> no, Norway's actually. That's where Monk's there's, from. That's where they go to. There is a Norway film coming out called Norway that's about vampires that looks really kick-ass, but this is not hmm. this. Ragnarok, it's only rated PG, so I'd kind of overlooked it at first, but it is about um, a guy who's an archaeologist and he kind of finds all of this stuff that's alluding to Ragnarok which is the Viking end of the world and he finds this place this all of these relics that say you know it happens here it happens here this is Ragnarok this is the end of the world and so he and one of his friends and um, his friend's assistant and his kids decide to travel there because no one else believes him that the place could actually exist so they travel and they have to like go into like Russian territory and things like that and what they find is the end of the world is this monster that's existed there for a really long time and this is what the vikings spoke of like thousands of years ago and ragnarok is Mm. this this thing and it is um i it's like national treasure with a giant monster it's pg so don't be put off by that i mean don't expect like heads being thrown around or anything Mm. like that but it's just a really good story and just a really fun film how did you see it i can put it it's norwegian um, Norwegian. yeah it's norwegian okay and yeah, they go to Norway and Russia to find this thing. Exactly. Okay. They I probably right travel the by time. fjord. <laughs> <laughs> FYI. So, um, yeah, but it is on Amazon. Um, I think it's on like an early release on Amazon yeah. right now. So like cool. I paid the five ninety nine and rented it or six ninety nine because I will only watch things in HD now. Um, so that one I highly recommend. Really fun. It is subtitled, but well worth it. Very mm. good movie. Okay. And then um, I watched Green Slime because my daughter has gotten really into Godzilla movies. Like mm-hmm. that's her favorite character in the world. So we've been watching all these Godzilla movies. Um, together and Saturday I had her all day and we watched Godzilla and then I was like I wonder if she'd like green slime because it's kind of that same kind of you know giant monster guy in suit thing and she absolutely loved it Mm -hmm. and then I remembered what just a fun movie that is it's Mm -hmm. the guy who made Battle Royale like decades prior oh I didn't know that yeah and it's got the greatest so he was an older director when he made Battle Royale yeah this was 1968 and he'd been making movies for a long time when he made green slime in 1968 and then when he made Battle Royale in 2000 I guess he was like well because Katano's in that film, Takeshi Katano, I remember. So oh, yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe they're peers. He, yeah. he made Battle Royale in 2000 and then died in 2003. He was uh, at was that his last movie? Or uh, did he make the sequel? Been, I, let me see if he made the sequel I as well. Don't know if yeah, he did. he did. He made this. Actually, that's that's his last movie, is Battle Royale 2. Interesting. That's crazy. Wow. Yeah, so I've his never name heard is, of um, I'd love to see that on the big screen. I've never seen Battle Royale on big screen. Oh, really? That's oh, the kind wow. of thing I've seen like just on video and stuff, and I always really liked it, but I bet it would look amazing on big screen. I remember seeing that in, gosh, where was I at the time? I think it was in college, yeah, because I saw it at the theater in my college hometown, but yeah. Um, so Green Slime, 1968 by Kinji Fukasaki which I'm probably saying horribly wrong. Um, but it's just kind of batshit crazy, green slime, tentacled monsters attack. Good opening song, uh, I remember. It's amazing. Oh, the song. Amazing. That's the song's okay. good. And John Landis does a really fun, um, he talks about it on Trailers from Hell. He oh, has a good cool. one. Yeah. It's okay. a really good one. It's really fun. That, it's a super I mean. fun movie. And then um, the last thing that I watched this week I tried to watch this TV show called Dark Secrets. I tried to. I tried to. <laughs> I don't anything starts Secrets. out with that. <laughs> I tried. Well, it had been recommended by um, somebody I know on Facebook, or actually a fan of the show, had recommended huh. this TV show called Dark Secrets, which is on the Discovery Channel, or it might be on the History Channel. Um, but it's free streaming on Netflix, so I tried to watch it. And the premise is supposed to be that these people had 
They were going to demolish this building, but in the basement, they found this locked door. And when they opened it up, it was crates of all of this historical information about all of these monsters and weird events. And this guy who only identified himself as the, as the teller had had all of his stuff down there for decades and then disappeared. Mm -hmm. And it was all of this like UFOs and weird monsters. And it was like X-Files in this. Kind of like your house. Exactly. Yeah, like, this, yeah. like my house. It's like a true and story. so then each episode, they go into a new file and it was the most annoying show. Show I've ever seen in my life, huh. so I don't recommend. Like seriously, and I've we seen just <laughs> lost a like I know. on our Facebook I know. page. I tried. I tried. Sorry, guys. No, the production values killed me. Like I've seen unsolved mysteries from the 1980s with higher production values than this show. <sighs> mm. So that and this, it didn't even matter Burn. if the stories were wonderful. It just it killed me. All right. So the producer of uh, Dark Secrets, I guess, is canceling his appearance next yeah. week. Next oh. week yeah. <laughs> That's a shame. Yeah, that I was tried. A long, well. And it's sad. It's a cool <laughs> premise. It's a really cool premise. I just I needed some better. Production I've never values. heard of the show, so I don't feel so bad. You slamming it like that. I, know. I feel all right. Same about here. It. I tried. Um, OK. What do you uh, got, Rick? Well, what do you got? I'll lead off with uh, just a humdinger of a movie that this will be in Whoa. every top 10 of the year. Uh, I'd heard it was great. Mm -hmm. One of the three of us. It, I couldn't see how this couldn't be uh, Becca's number one movie of this year <laughs> because uh, Housebound from New Zealand. I loved it. She started at Stanley Fest. Yes. And, and I had heard, I remember when it was in development in New Zealand because it was made through a scheme called Escalator, which was like, we'll give people a hundred grand and make, a start scheme? making a film. Like they have, they have these schemes, like government schemes where they'll be like, they actually. Okay, I think that you're using the word scheme. Well, wrong, no, scheme no, here no, I in think the that's States about right. indicates <laughs> nefarious money. I think, it's, yes. I think it probably is nefarious. Like the way but, <laughs> makes movies. but what I'd heard is that it was kind of uh, left on its own. Like they weren't that interested once the guys got going and the Ant Timpson the Kiwi I've talked about a few times on here. Yeah. He's one of the big print collectors that he, um, and does ABC to death. He got behind it on board as a producer and helped them really get it to where it had to go. And it played at, it's played at fantastic fest and all this. This film is just so flat out. A, the first half is comedy pitch perfect, mm -hmm. but it's halfway through. I felt like I, and from the poster, I felt like I knew a hundred percent everything about this movie. I, I was sitting there at halfway and there's a lot of Kiwis there. And so I was laughing. I know some of these actors. So I was like finding it, fun just on that level but they're half exactly at the halfway point i remember thinking and i talked to people after and everyone was thinking the same thing i was like oh, okay so it's this kind of movie and this is exactly what we're gonna get and from that moment on the second half of that movie is so freaking good it's i the only film i can liken to it in terms of quality is uh, it's the best horror comedy since cabin in the woods definitely easily it's easily the best wow. new zealand film in that genre <laughs> since uh Brain Dead, yes, uh, Dead Alive, uh, and it's very similar, not in the way it looks, and not being a, so much a splatter film, even though there's some, uh, but more just in the real, just absolute mastery of comic tone and yeah. timing. The timing is just phenomenal. The second half, there are moments in that where people are just like, there. I haven't heard laughter like that for a long time, and there's some real payoff on the horror element towards the very end. And so this movie, people are going to have an absolute blast. The Jared Johnston's the director. He's not Whoa. somebody I knew from New Zealand. How did you um, see it? I started at Spectre Fest. Oh, they, showed uh, they showed it, and it was wildly unattended because it was Fantastic Fest, and a lot of that crowd go yeah. go away to Fantastic Fest. So there's probably, I'd say, it's maybe three quarters full at Son of Family, which is pretty barren. Um, oh man! But it the reaction was incredible, and 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 I'll watch it again straight away because it, it also was just really nice for me to see because I think I'm really particularly rough on horror from New Zealand because often what would happen. Uh, and then this might piss some people off, but I found when I was living, growing up there that they, the government basically decided to make one horror film a year from the, not from the passion of let's make a horror film more for, well, that will offset the balance of we're making these art house things and then we'll make that one horror that maybe we'll make our money back and stuff. And it showed in most of the movies, they were crap. I really, mm. there are not a lot of great ones to me from brain dead to now there's a couple there are a couple that rise a little bit above they peak above now this year there's meant to be two because this is only the first the other one i'm hearing raves is the the fly the concords guys uh what we do in the shadows and mm, everyone who's seen so that hilarious. has said that's one of the funniest movies so oh my it gosh, could be a double great. whammy from new zealand this year which is pretty amazing wow. yeah um, and i do i will say this i think their sense of humor is better than trying to make scary horror movies i think somebody could make a great scary horror movie in new zealand because it is an amazing setting but i have yet to really see that mm. i think that there's more success in making you laugh and scare, but I felt both in this film. I mean, the film's really, it's really great. The You're going to love it. actress okay. in Housebound, She's I swear, she phenomenal. can just glance at the camera and you laugh. It's yeah, all, her, it, her the facial timing expressions is, are amazing. And what I, what made me really happy is that it's the kind of humor, if I'd seen that in New Zealand, I wouldn't have known if it would have traveled. I would have watched it going, oh, this is a great New Zealand film, but I have no idea if outsiders will find, because it's very Kiwi humor. Yeah. And seeing everyone laugh like they did, I was like, oh, okay, it's just 
funny, you yeah, know? Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, yeah. It was that, sad to see because the reception at the Stanley Fest uh-huh. was really low, too. Mm. And that was one of the few ones I made it to because I was so sick when I was at the Stanley. And that one was like two o'clock on Saturday, and I was slightly coherent. So I stumbled yeah. into that one, and I really wanted to see it because I, I love horror comedies. And um, it was the same thing where, you know, everyone, a lot of the shows had been like completely packed. That one, maybe three quarters of the way full. Yeah, but they make and, up with it. Yeah, because and it was huge. I mean, the laughter and it was huge, It was, but it was very I found it very unattended. inspiring that because I do think there's a real problem, just like you were saying with Willow Creek, when we know what the movie is. Yeah. If you're right in the middle of a story and you're like, oh, okay. And, and then it just hits those beats. There is something pretty unsatisfying. And I think that's why a lot of us love movies in the 80s that were just batshit because you can't predict batshit. You shit. can't predict, yeah. <laughs> and this movie uh, does does make twists like that, and it's really rewarding. So I, I won't say any more, but uh, people are going to have a blast with yeah, that can't movie. Wait to see it. And if I, either of you guys get a chance to see what we do in the shadows, it's the most it is getting a release. vampire movie I have seen yeah, like, it's, ever. It's, it's New Zealand's kind of hot phenomenal. director. Um, Taika Waititi, he um, directs quite a bit of the Concords, but uh, he made a film called Boy the year before, and he had an Oscar-nominated short a couple years before that. That's really great. But he, it's, his, it's a comedy. I think he had done it for a 24-hour film fest. He did a little short, and it was the same characters. It was like a bunch of vampires hang out at a diner co- having a conversation, and then they adapted it. And Jermaine, who's the funniest, Concord is the main. I think he's Nosferatu in it, isn't yeah. he? I'll and just it give pretty you one wild, scene you know? that I absolutely love. Oh, yeah, I, I saw the trailer. I, I haven't seen it. There's the a scene where one of the vampires is trying to get into, like, a hip club, and he's trying to get the bouncer to invite him in, because <laughs> otherwise he can't go in. <laughs> Hilarious. I swear. I no, that one is getting released. I think it was uh, Turek might have even uh, written about it, saying uh, it might even be that uh, orchard thing that he oh, okay. sometimes picks for. I, I heard really recently that that was going to get picked up. Excellent. Um, I'll, I'll do uh, two of these really quick, and then one I want to tell you a little more about. Uh, the Demon's Rook. We it was another screening we had oh, at right, Jump Cut. Right. Okay. Um, it's it's pretty interesting. It it's and a lot of people have told me it's too long, and they're absolutely right. And it's a real shame because <laughs> this is a fucking batshit crazy DIY horror. I mean, yeah. the fact that and one pra- guy... It's mostly practical. Yeah, and it's, it, it looks all practical, and it's this guy who is the star of it, which I didn't know while I was watching it till the end of the movie. He's the star, did the freaking, all the effects, did all the, you know, design, directed it, wrote it. Uh, you know, so it's it, it, it's most similar, not in tone, but most similar in, like, how that film got made to bad taste. Like, I'm just going to do everything, like Peter Jackson did. Right. It had that feel. It, it's The weird thing is it's trying to be kind of like a fever dream, Uh, like intentionally so, but the uh, pacing of each scene's a little too long and it really accumulates to literally being about 30 minutes where if you could just trim it, get rid of a lot of dialogue because the acting's the least interesting part because they're probably not real actors. Uh, The actual demon stuff's amazing. I mean, it's crazy stuff that like it'll be middle of the day and giant demons outside (laughs) and you're like, that's weird, but it looks good. And uh, my number one thing though, man, when I'm watching it, I was just like, you know what though, if this was on 16... I think this movie would be a cult classic. And there's something about it looking so crisp mm. in HD that almost stood in the way of me really loving that. Mm-hmm. But it's it's really interesting. And I, I would never wish a film like this uh, ill. I'd just be like, oh, it's awesome, made with a lot of passion. I just wish maybe he didn't edit it because probably there's a better version inside I that. I, I always don't I think, edit you know. your own film. Yeah, I think in general you, you probably have shouldn't. Have a second you know? set of eyes, or at least have a second editor to kind of you know help. Yeah, you. yeah. yeah but yeah. It, but it's got and it's it's soundtrack's amazing. I think a lot of people are gonna. It's gonna definitely be a cult film. Like it's. I don't even think it's in question. It might not be a ma- big one. Mm-hmm. I think it will find this really uh, kind of like um Darren's work w- with uh, Repo and things. It mm-hmm. will find some sort of audience who will really dig it. Right. Uh, it's a cool movie, and so we showed that. That was fun. Uh, this this next one was a real surprise. Um, um, I rented it on VOD because I just heard a couple of things. It's called um, Honeymoon, uh, Lee, Lee Janaic. Uh, it's actually in theaters and on VOD right now. And it's a horror oh, film with really high okay. rating. And I was like, oh, okay. Yeah, I heard a lot about this And one. so I knew nothing, which was the best way to go into it. You know, this is going to be in my top couple because this is like really? very me. This is very, I wouldn't say it's like possession, but it's like those kind of drama horrors where it's mostly oh, drama, but when okay. the horror pays off, it's, I, I love that. Wow, kind of film. Okay. It's, I mean, that's my favorite kind of horror film. It's things like uh, Invasion of the Body Snatchers, Position, oh. those kind of movies where there's something really good happening, but you have to take a while to get there. Not slow burn in the way that Ty West is like creeping tension, but uh, yeah. it, the first 15 or so minutes is kind of off-putting because they've just gotten married and they're going off on their honeymoon and it's pitched so high, the performances are pitched like, oh, we're so happy in the way they talk and stuff. It's almost like unnervingly happy that you almost want to turn it off. Mm-hmm. And then as soon as I, as soon as you get through that and the, the actual story starts to burn in, it becomes, it's really quite remarkable. It's, it's a, a woman director who I think she looks like, from what I looked up, like 25 or something. She was an assistant 
to uh, some big Hollywood kind of guy, and she had worked on all these movies for him, and then just pitched this one thing and got it made. Um, wow. it's, I really think it's it's kind of fear of the idea of um, never really knowing the person you're marrying. You're marrying this okay. person, and you're yeah. love, and this is going to get. But do you really ever know someone, and what else could be? And it plays on that fear, and it's all set within a couple of days. It, it for me, it was like really fantastic to see a movie very close to the kind of movies I want to make is always kind of exciting. And, yeah. uh, and I'm the fact sure, that she got uh, it done, you know, who was that? I think maybe Stuart Gordon or something. He wrote a thing a, about it. Yeah. Yeah. That's and, what it and I looked it up straight after. Cause I was curious cause I didn't know anything about this movie before seeing it. And Stuart Gordon wrote a thing kind of quoting Lovecraft saying, you know, the things that the number one rule is just do not explain, do not explain the horror element because that is what's scary is the unexplainable. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and he was saying this film perfectly summed that up. And I, I couldn't agree more that wow. that is what's okay. so interesting about it. And I won't say anything more about the horror elements because they are really fun to just discover. Uh, and that's on VOD now. And then uh, last, because that was a lot of stuff. Um, well, I saw Idle Hands, but we'll talk about that soon. Yeah, sure. Um, <laughs> rewatch that. But uh, I watched To Kick Off Fall. Fall started yesterday. Yes. So to kick it off, I always start with something just like everyone has their routines. I hadn't seen the Blu-ray of Halloween 2 yet. Uh, ah. Unlike most people who are, like I, I'm sure you, are all clamoring for the box set. I will not be buying the box set because I don't care about the other four or three of them at all, really. Oh. Not to diss them, but the first three are the only ones that actually hold much interest for me. Um, number See, two. I, I have to argue that for just one second. No, you can argue it. I mean, I was just saying for me personally. No, I, I but, it, you know, it's because a lot of people because a lot of people are buying it and enthusiastically and really into it. And then there's other people like you and a few other that yeah. uh, that are saying it you're saying it in that way like i don't want to get it because essentially the other movies suck but mm -hmm. aj texted me last night because yeah. he got the box set and he went straight to the documentary with daniel harris about why she didn't come back for six mm -hmm. and to some of the stuff about four mm -hmm. and five and to some of the gossip and and he's like that's the reason we're buying it. Right. He's like, it's not because we love every single one of the movies. Right. It's I'd like, still watch this, them all. I'd this be is curious, film yeah. school for us. Like these are right. movies we grew up on and we're getting the behind the scene look at a lot of the right. stories we've heard over the years. Yeah. So I, I, I would not begrudge him. I, I don't even care if somebody loves it's their favorite movie. I'm just saying for me personally, every time I watch them on TV, even when I go back to them and give them a second chance, I'm always like, eh, except actually H2 always kind of had a soft spot for when I saw it in theaters, you know, yeah, when it came I out. I was going to talk about that it's fun. Like, it's later, like, because that it, but, you was know. like a return for me. Cause there'd been a break mm -hmm. in the Halloween movies before H2O came out and it was kind of like, holy shit, they're doing another one. And we all like, yeah. I remember we drove from where I was in college. We drove like an hour to a theater that was playing it. And yeah, it was like, I mean, they're better. Thing. It's a better than other franchises. <laughs> I mean, yeah. I mean, they're still more solid, but I'll say this about so number two. Two. Okay. Uh, number two, I, I had pretty good memories of two anyway, uh, but always from TV, you know, so never high quality. The HD is just ridiculous how good it looks. Yeah. Uh, but the main thing I just thought is I kind of want to have a T-shirt that says uh, Dean Kundi is the gift that keeps on giving <laughs> because uh, all I'm watching this movie going, this material is so like kind of C grade, like the actual script material. And Dean Kundi has sequences in that that are even better than the first movie. There is a scene in that movie, which now is in my top 10 horror scenes of all time, which is oh, which one? the doctor's office. And he turns around, the doctor's dead. She starts backing up. The yes, fucking lighting yeah, yeah. is like Suspiria because yeah, yeah. there's an aquarium light. And then the shit out of the darkness, it's the him, yeah. mask just ever so softly comes out. And I'm watching it going, that is one of the best looking scenes I've ever seen. And it's they do just, it in part one, though. It's yeah, not yeah, original, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, but, but, but just everything about the way well. it looks. I'm just like, my main thing watching was like, oh, this is very interesting because uh, Rick Rosenstahl is clearly trying to, you know, what I really like about it is they really went out of his way to make a direct sequel from the moment the other one stops, even down to uh, very early on, like the second after the credit, after Donald Pleasant says, uh, you don't have any idea what evil is. Do, 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 do. Yeah. <laughs> one of the best uh, intro song credits in the history of cinema yeah. uh, is the long take. It tries to emulate the opening shot of Halloween. There's some weird breaks in it, which surprised me, maybe mm. editing, but uh, from Michael's perspective. And it's great because you kind of do feel like you're in a continuation. Uh, the funniest thing that I don't like about it, which is surprising, is I don't really like the way Michael's played. I don't like the way oh he moves. Oh, my God. That's so funny because that's that's my favorite. Favorite Michael, huh. yeah. See, I, I, no, and, and he when he's talking about, it, it's like, oh, that's interesting. But for for whatever reason, the first one is still just how I like to see him spring up and stuff. But but the kills and everything about them, I see why Tommy. I watched the documentary afterwards, which oh, I saw cool. you had a hand, and I really liked yeah, it. Yeah, And I really, I would really recommend people see that. But where Tommy Lee Wallace, who everyone knows, I'm a big fan of here, uh, where yeah. he says he flat out rejected doing the movie, he did, and he got everyone on board. They're all about to make this movie. They're all the team's back in place, and he reads the script, and he's like, you know what? That's not the character. 
I have so much respect. I can't even yeah. begin wow. to tell you how much is, respect I have yeah. for that. Because that's huge. Because he's saying, like, look, Michael's not putting uh, needles in people's eyeballs. Yeah. And and so he stepped away. And that said, I like what then later Carpenter says about it, which is, hey, you know, we've been out of this for a while. It used to be theater of the mind. Like, yeah, things yeah. could. But horror slashers have changed. We have to keep up with yeah, that. Yeah, that, that wasn't like a year later they made right. a sequel. That was like four years yeah. later or whatever so it was. things had already you been know. imitated. I also so, love the Dean Cundy. I don't know if, we, if the Dean Cundy story is in the documentary. Uh-huh. I doubt it. But you know that they had to pay him a ridiculous amount of money for it because he was asked, the first Spielberg gig he was asked to do was Poltergeist, and he really wanted to shoot Poltergeist. Oh. And it was conflicting with Halloween too. So when they asked him to do it, he actually asked for a ridiculous amount of money with the intent that they would reject him. Uh. And then Carpenter got on the phone with him and he's like, dude, what are you doing? And he's like, well, I really want to shoot Poltergeist. That's right. why I'm asking for that money. And he's like, all right, I'll tell them that. And they paid him what he asked oh, that's for. Awesome. And he had wow. to, but he, but he had to do Halloween too. Hey, he did. He, and it he's took, what it elevates took a while that movie before he got back to, to work. with. I really like it. I think it's a really fun sequel and, it's, you know, there's little differences where there's some really, uh, th- there's one thing in it that it might be one of my least favorite plot points in the history of like that genre, which is Donald Pleasance halfway through the movie being told the governor is ordering him to get in a car <laughs> with a marshal <laughs> to leave Haddonfield and you must come back. I'm like, this is the biggest hokey bullshit I've right. ever, but in the same token, it's like, whatever. You know, you know it's amazing? Actually, earlier today uh, on Facebook, um, whoa. Hey, whoa. Oh. Threw beer all <laughs> over don't worry. us. He, he dropped hey, it. I dropped it and caught it. it. Well, I did catch it. <laughs> and then beer what flew out everywhere. What is up, drunkie? Uh, I'm four sips into a beer. I can't call that drunk. <laughs> yeah. Uh, no. Uh, D- uncoordinated, uh, maybe. Uh, Ricky Bates, uh, uh, our, the excision director, was watching uh-huh, the box uh-huh. set, and people were having a, a conversation in his thread about Halloween 2. Oh, weird. And, and they were saying, like, you know what I love about the sequels is just how crazy Donald Pleasant's got? And then someone said, I just like, like to pretend that Wake and Fright is the prequel. Oh, yeah, to yeah, yeah, yeah. He's just a <laughs> drunk <laughs> character. <laughs> Wake, Wake and Fright ends. He yeah, sobers yeah. up and changes his name to Loomis. Yeah. And, and, I'm like, and then he just that's goes the Greatest feel. Halloween. No, yeah, I, I believe time. it because he's like he is just ra- like yes. a rabid dog in that movie. <laughs> but uh, no, there's a lot to really love about Clean the film. My paper. Uh, there's there's <laughs> one of the best uh, sexy death murder scenes ever. Ooh, yeah, it's a really nice scene. But there's also just um, some really nice spatial stuff with the character and people being stalked. And you know, in terms of slasher films, because it's much more of a straight slasher, it's a really good one. And I think it has never looked better. I mean, yeah, I, I, I was really happy I got to see it again like that. Perfect to kick off fall season. Cool. Right but on. man, Kundi. That work is the just, God. you really, it's really, it sometimes takes seeing the lesser ones to really see it, you know, because you, you, because he has to make it better because mm. no one else is, you know, though I, I think Rick Rosenthal straight out of college did a really good job. Yeah. 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 yeah it's good good stuff. movie. Anyway, that's, I think that's, yeah. I mean, we're seeing a lot of movies and we're, we're all going to like beyond fest this coming uh, weekend. Yeah. Uh, and next week it's yeah. like almost every night I'm there. Yeah. So things are going to get nutty, but um, we're going to go back, back, back to the nineties. You ready? Let's do it. Here we go. All right, so we are back, uh, and our our very generous guest has really brought us the party. I brought some pumpkin ale, but that's nothing compared to yeah, this. Yeah, he just put you to shame. Yes, there's there's some tequila. There's some uh, uh, skull shot glasses being opened right now. Well, you know what? It's uh, uh, <laughs> it, it's it's New Year. Happy New Year! This All right, is t- today oh, yeah. is the Jewish <laughs> New Year. To, yeah, tomorrow right. is a day off for a lot of people. Right? Yeah, it is the year. It's uh, now a day off for all of us. <laughs> yes, this is really good tequila. So is it? We I, had I just like the skull. Becca, you should stuff. have one. It just seemed appropriate. You should have two or three with the rest of us. I'm just gonna drink all of it guys it's yeah cool. yes go for it well all righty it, it's a palindrome year in the jewish calendar it's 5775 so um oh wow oh. No, i didn't know that is that good luck or something I, I, I don't know you're asking the wrong jew we'll say it's good luck <laughs> well, listen the voice that's talking is not just the bringer of tequila no he's, he's here for a very special <laughs> reason uh it's uh it's a friend of mine i met a few uh, months ago when we were doing uh an interview and commentary for the the legendary sequel classic Leprechaun 2, wow. which I have, which when I was asked to do it, I said yes immediately because I still have extremely fond memories of seeing that with my high school buddies on the big screen hmm. opening weekend. Uh, and then, uh, of course, I, I looked up his filmography and, and there was quite a few titles that I liked, in particular Idle Hands, which I know a lot of uh, our listeners were really excited when we brought that up. What would the offspring be without him? <laughs> exactly. I, I mean, I got to say, I, I did. Watch, I watched Idle Hands again because my memories right. of that. Film Wait, were, let me finish sublime. the introduction. Okay, yeah, yeah. Sublime. No, we're it's offspring. Oh, it's offspring. Okay. Does anyone have fingernails? I do. Yes. Get to Becca. There's like a, there's like a shrink wrap here. I, I'm we're sorry. Were you introducing me? Yes. Because I was struggling with the tequila wrapper <laughs> on this skull. 
Yes, mm. Rodman Flender is here claws. with us tonight. Yes, welcome. What's that way? Thank you. Yes, you thanks go. for coming. It's, you know what's weird? <laughs> you said we're back. When I, you know, and, and I've listened to this oh, podcast, yes. I've I've enjoyed it a lot. But it's always weird when you say I we're know. back because when you listen to it, you don't go anywhere. It's <laughs> not it's, it's it's not like there's That's an true. infomercial listen. for Roscoe the bedbug sniffing dog between you guys talking about. The, At some point, there's going to be an advertisement yes. there. I just don't know when. Yeah. Right, right. Hopefully, or a little so. musical sting, or or, or, or elevator or, music while we wait, like little, placement music. I just want you to know, like five minutes worth of just monotonous elevator music. This is car tequila. <laughs> I love I'm, I'm, of tequila. No, I'm actually well aware of this. So last week I actually started by just saying something like Rocky Horror Picture Show to make it like as if we were in the middle of our conversation. So hopefully it wasn't as noticeable last no, week. No, it was because you really want to get a Rocky Horror Picture Show for my birthday. I really don't, but I'm yes, gonna. Yes, you do. I'm gonna because it's your Both birthday. Both of you guys are like so excited to go. You can barely stand it. You're just so staring excited. At tequila. Depends how much tequila he's we down. You are so excited <laughs> that you have to downplay how excited you oh, are. Oh God. When's That's your birthday? It. Next week. All right. And so, uh, does um, the new art know? Are they? Uh, preparing all extravaganza that's hey, uh, where we should tell them. shows yeah, yeah they they you need know, to let's uh i mean let's get, i want to focus back on party of five because <laughs> uh, <laughs> nev campbell during the uh, the freckles right. and i assume you directed multiple episodes i of did party of five i did yes which means you and becca here has never even seen it you've never seen much. party of five i've never seen party of five so you're all like 11 years old right i i'm old but i you know what i'm not as old as fred olin ray or, or, or <laughs> jim no, yes. no, yes. you, yeah, well, they're yeah. much older fred yes. olin ray and jim winarski are much older are much than older. i am they could be my my grandfather or something you were, right. like, you were in the corman era of the 90s let's yeah. let's yeah. be clear about that no i don't I, 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 we can start any we can start many places i just am particularly excited about uh because we're talking about the 90s, but like to me, there's nothing more 90s than some of those TV shows, you know? Yeah. And, and that they are all precursors to the people who are going to be in the horror movies. Yeah, you know, and especially those ones like Dawson's Creek and that they're, they're all these actors who are going to then be filtered into be post scream. Everything's a teen based horror film. Yeah. And the second I mean, half of the 90s, that's where it all goes. I disagree with you. Well, no, then that's, that's, well, that's, that's how kind of Hollywood brought, went. That's kind of what brought it back. I'd say that's where Hollywood went. Yeah, but yeah, but that's, I that's, mean, like, I'm looking at some of the other films that came out in the late sure. 90s. But there were also, I think, that another one of the big trends from the late 90s, not necessarily were teens, were, holy shit, we have access to CG, let's put a fucking giant monster in. Um, mm -hmm. And that's where we get things like The Relic and Event Horizon and um, Anaconda and things like that. I think that was just as predominant as a trend as the teen ones, but it gets forgotten a yeah, lot. Hey, don't, yeah. don't rag on Anaconda, okay? I <laughs> that, Ice Cube. That, that, <laughs> Ice Cube. John Voight. Okay, John uh, Voight. Yeah. Let's give it up for John Voight in Anaconda. I mean, yes. <laughs> Academy Award, uh, you know, uh, Midnight yeah. Cowboy, yeah. you know, Coming <laughs> Home. And a lot of actors of that caliber, when they do a horror movie, they, they basically phone it in. John Voight in Anaconda, he hits a home run. He yeah. milks that role yeah. for all it's worth. He's fantastic. Do you remember so. him in U-Turn? Oh, yeah. As the Indian guy with the blind. <laughs> right. I, I think U-Turn is one of the most like underrated American movies. I just think that movie is such a funny, weird movie. It's like I, Oliver Stone has never Stone, been yeah. that fun. Like, wow. And that's just a really fun movie. I didn't even like part two of Anaconda, The Blood Orchid. I, I thought it was fun. Mm. Yeah. So, yeah. You're talking Becca's mm. language with those movies. Yeah, well, yeah I mean, we'll go back. my type of film. We'll go back to broader 90s discussion. Yes. But back to, so let's, okay, Wait, we can move to Dawson's Creek. That was a CG snake in Anaconda? I thought that was real. Should we down? Who wants some tequila? down the shot right away? Oh all my right. God! All right, Let's here we go. No, thing. you do. Okay, all right. Lahayam. Say hello. Okay. Okay. It's a life, Lahayam. Oh, Why? that is good too. Yeah, yeah it's smooth. really smooth, uh, isn't it? Uh, That's smoother it's than most. Now you got to yeah. chase it with the um, a little beer. Yes, Sam Adams. There. Chase it with the podcast. Right. All right. Why, right. um, wait, just speaking Here, of... let's start with your questions for okay. us, yes. because you are a listener. Right. Yes. You might have questions. No, that's a good idea. I, I like those. I do. I want to do about... 40 minutes on Judaism, okay. if that's okay. Because okay. <laughs> it is the Jewish New Year. It is. Well, here, here's um, a quick... Uh, why, uh, <laughs> yeah, why is Catholicism scary and Judaism not scary? Well, is, I think you know, Judaism is... I mean, well, they both kind the of The possession scary. wasn't scary. And, and the Jewish stuff in that was made it less scary. But, you because know, it, it just kind of felt put on. Yeah, the Dybbuk box one. But, I, I, you know, I, I The Exorcist, huge movie. Huge movie for right. me. Loved it, loved it, loved it. And so, you know, being Jewish, I, mm -hmm. I kind of wanted to do a... Uh, I, I'm I'm not um, an observant person, but I thought it'd be interesting, you know, to uh, to to explain. And it's just it's never funny. Like, what was that movie that came out last year with the nun with the white eyes? That was the ad, Double you know, inside. Double right? Double, yeah, yeah you, all, all that um, you know, uh, Catholic imagery. You it, it, you put white eyes on it, it's scary. But if you put white eyes on a Lubavitcher rabbi, I, it's just funny. See, People always, just laugh. I am 
neither, like Catholic nor But I can, I can explain the fear part to you okay. for sure. Because, uh, you know, because, and you could maybe give you your perspective growing up Jewish, but okay. I grew up, I grew up Catholic. So yes. I went to school. And to me, it's from the moment you are even remotely like an impressionable child, when you're, <laughs> when you're first learning just basic stuff, you're immediately forced to go to catechism. Like all I'll remember is sitting in the pews and staring at this, this giant statue of the crucified Christ. And my, my, my little mind was trying to comprehend like, wait, they like stuck nails through this guy and put a, cr like, that's so messed up that people would do that. So I think there's just something scary in general about kind of all the, uh, the, you know, about Catholicism and all the yeah. stories and stuff like when you're learning about, you know, people getting crucified and kind of like the torture and the crown of thorns and all this stuff. It's just like the first time I heard stuff that I thought was just so horrible that, that people would do to other people. And so in that regard, I've always been creeped out by the art, the stories, everything. So when you see something like, uh, and you know, they're always hounding you like, Oh, it'd be good. Or else the devil is going to possess you, whatever. So then you see the exorcist at an impressionable age and you're like, shit, man, I better be good. Cause I don't want to get possessed. Right. Or and I also think yeah. on the Jewish side, I think that, um, people horror films and what's scary often stray from what in real life is scary. And because of the Holocaust, I believe the shadow of that and the true horrors then basically uh, people, I think, get scared off touching things when something is big uh, and overshadowing in history has happened. I mean, the scariest movie I've ever seen is Night and Fog. It's a 30-minute film right. by uh, Alan Renee mm -hmm. and Chris Marker, and it's the bodies being dumped. You just see these lifeless bodies, or you see the half a head that had been exploded. That is so, like, mind-numbingly uh, different. Also, I think Judaism is a lot more mysterious and less accessible to a broader amount of people because there's also different language involved. There's a Torah that people wow. don't understand, whereas Catholicism, we all know, we grow up, even if you're Christian, there's so many, so much overlap between Christianity and Catholicism, whereas Judaism really is removed. You're so much wow. more Jewish than I am. Yeah, I, mean, I, 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 I was half, I, but I, not grew I, up. I, I, I didn't grow I'm up Jewish. impressed. See, my experience of Judaism is like, you know, once, maybe once a year going hungry and then right. having a huge pastrami sandwich. Right. You know? See, yeah, when I was not, a kid. Like, I saw a face in a pastrami sandwich once, but that's not the same as, you see, it's not funny, whereas like a <laughs> face, like, like the <laughs> face no, in the grilled cheese sandwich. You can sandwich. make it all funny. Yes. I don't know, because like when I was a kid, I remember going to a Catholic mass with one of my friends whose parents were Catholic, but they had both been married before. They'd been divorced and married before. And so I remember we had to sit in the, this like penalty box at the back of the church where they made people who had been previously married sit. And I was so confused why we had to sit in this little penalty box. But then I went to, um, uh, I'm so sorry, synagogue um, with one of my Jewish friends, Beth, and it was kind of like more approachable. Penalty and box? Are you sure you weren't playing hockey? I know. The only way I could describe it is like they weren't allowed to sit with everyone else because they had been previously married. And I remember them trying to explain it to me in like fifth grade about why we had to sit in this little area in the back. And I was allowed to sit up front if I wanted to, but then we couldn't sit with our parents. And yeah, it was like Judaism just seemed more approachable, so it wasn't scary. That should be your your slogan, by the way. Judaism, the approachable religion. Got it. We're so, talking yeah. about religion. What's the closest I'm, we've I'm had to tequila I, I, into I, I, a skull. Can you think of any scary Jewish films before we move on? Like, no, yeah, honestly, uh, the none. The Gollum. That one. I mean, the Golem's like the a really Gollum cool. The Golem is an interesting scary, film. But it's but not, it was a cool myth. Mm -hmm. There was the Golem, and there was uh, the Unborn, not the one that came out in 1991, but mm -hmm. the Unborn that came out where. Um, uh, it, that that was sort of a. Um, when is that? Like a what period? No, um, the unborn came out. Oh, oh recently, years, recently, yeah, 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 yeah. with right. Gary Oldman. Gary yeah, yeah, Oldman yeah, yeah. as a rabbi, just right. not not scary. You know? And yeah. I mean, the possession, the movie itself wasn't scary, but the concept of the Dybbuk box is kind of creepy. No, and yeah. I actually think parts of possession work really well, but the parts with the, <laughs> with the, the possession. Let's don't, not confuse it possession. with your possession. Right. Yeah, not yeah. my possession. Uh, but but no, I, I think it is a good film at times. Yeah, but, it is. But I think once it goes into like when they seek out the Hasidic Jew and so they're saying about it, you go, oh okay. It, it, I I just think they're saying a little mysterious that we can't get into as much because we don't know what it means. I can't I believe you guys have it. actually seriously riffed on, on a lame joke I made <laughs> 25 minutes ago. This is the yes, podcast. Is. You bring there, it up, we can't, we can't contain yeah. ourselves. There is an X-Files about, and I can't even remember what it is, I just remember the rabbis <coughs> being involved. And oh, yeah. I, I have to go back and research the episode, but I swear there's, <laughs> it's either an X-Files or an Outer Limits where it's all about like a rabbi See, exorcism. I bet you didn't think we had anything for that topic. I, 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 <laughs> I didn't. You could walk in with like, roll with it. What's next? What's next? 
give you, give you half an hour. <laughs> okay, let's talk about the Boston Tea Party. Let's go into <laughs> deep. Oh God, no, no, let's not. Uh, okay, so um, okay. Dawson's Creek. Actually, no, wait, yeah. no, Dawson's Creek, you only did one episode. All right, of. calm down. All right, I did. Let, let me bring this into control, children, okay? Take on. it easy, all right? Okay. <laughs> okay I, did, I, did, I did the Halloween episode oh, you did? of Dawson's Creek, oh, awesome. which actually had, uh, it was sort of a parody of Scream, and uh, we did, and it was, it was interesting was because uh, Michelle Williams, um, we sort of reenacted the whole phone call from Scream oh. Michelle, and Kevin Williamson wrote the of episode. Course, yeah, it's a show. Oh, wow. So he was sort of pari- parodying his own parody. Is that uh, yeah, parodying? Have, have, have I entered a um, you know a, a, a self on house now? Yeah, yeah. I'll go with that parodying. Yeah. I make up my own words all the time. <laughs> it works. <laughs> Excellent. And so, were you tapped for that just out of curiosity because you had done horror, like that particular episode? Um, yes, I think they, cool. they pigeonholed me for, you know, oh, I, I did a few sort of Halloween episodes of, of, shows. of those kinds of shows. I was like, oh yeah, he, you know, get that guy. So. I know See, Rob's but, chomping at the bit to ask him, but come on, can but, we start uh, with Katie uh, Holmes? Uh, no, okay. shut up you. <laughs> All right. Uh, no, uh, no, I mean, what I wanted to say was, uh, you know, uh, getting into that being tapped for horror stuff, like as soon as I met you, I, I kind of immediately got a sense that, that you do, you do love genre material. You're, you're kind of one of us when it comes to being an admirer of all film, but you do appreciate the horror genre. And it's funny because I, I always liked idle hands, you know, when it came out, but I revisited it obviously in prep for this episode. And for some reason, and I'm going to ask Elric the same mm. thing, but having met you now, for some reason, the humor and sensibilities of the movie, like, I mean, it always made sense to me, but it makes total sense yeah, to me. I get it. I, I guess what I'm saying is like your, your love and enthusiasm for the genre totally shows in the movie. Now that I've met you and seen it again, so um, the Leatherface line you cited, oh yeah, of course, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I had that. I had to post right away. <laughs> I almost um, wore this shirt, but I thought I'd get thrown out of Costco where I was buying this stuff. Oh, know. nice, yeah, yeah. Cannibal, yeah, Holocaust. I listened sure. to the soundtrack on the way Spiritual. here. It's in my car. I yeah. had a Great conversation <laughs> with uh, somebody a couple of weeks ago because we gave away like four or five Cannibal Holocaust shirts at trivia last time, oh. courtesy of Rotten Cotton. Thank you, Sean Lewis. Yeah. And um, so I was talking with somebody about where it's appropriate to wear a Cannibal Holocaust shirt, and right. they actually have like a cartoon version to where. It's like little cartoon people. Was it from the 2001 Cal- tour of Cannibal Hall? Oh, that's a great house release for sure. Pretty cool. bitchin'. Yeah. So yeah, do you like where where can you appropriately wear a cannibal Holocaust? Well, the shirt shirts? is over ten years old and it's never been worn. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's like nowhere. It's never appropriate. The gym. <laughs> right. Can it go to the grocery a store? A horror convention. A you can horror. wear it to a horror convention. convention. Wear it to a if you put it on in the parking lot. Yeah, that works. <laughs> and then you'll be cool for the whole weekend. Yeah, at that's that pretty convention. much it. Yeah. So yeah, uh, yeah so K- now Katie Holmes at her <laughs> new bile <laughs> greatest. Um, well, my point, my point is, you know, I mean, we always like to hear kind of, uh, uh, you know, where people's love of this material started. So, I mean, again, it's, it's obvious in your work as, you know, especially idle hands, but for you, I mean, were you always kind of a monster kid? Did you love these movies growing up or, or when did you kind of discover the horror genre? Yeah. As you, as you know, the term you use monster kid, I was definitely one of those. I, I grew up in New York city. Mm-hmm. Um, and there were a couple of, um, late night horror movie TV shows, uh, creature features yep. and chiller theater and chiller theater. We were lucky. We actually were able to license. Chiller Theater opened with this uh, claymation six-fingered hand coming out of a lake of blood, mm-hmm. and we were able to license that little piece of animation in Idle Hands. Oh, right, oh, right. cool. So I- every little thing you see on a TV in that movie w- w- was personally hand-picked. Wait, yeah. you grew up <laughs> in New York City? In the I night. did. Okay. Do you remember Robin Bird? Uh, I'm a bird watcher. Okay, I'm, I'm trying to explain it to these guys one night. Like, I lived in New York City. Baby, for let 10 me bang. Years. Baby, <laughs> baby, baby, bang your baby, box. Baby, bang yes. your box. And I tried to so explain. So you're a bird watcher. I am. Well, I lived in New York City for 10 years before I moved out here to LA. And okay. I tried to explain to these guys one day on the show that we had porn on public access. These, these two are BFFs, right. and Elric's just shaking his head right now. <laughs> I, I don't understand what's happening. Okay, where, don't where's don't your knit bikini? That's I what know. That black, like, crocheted bikini. I feel like Wanowski's back. Oh, damn it. I feel like. Like no, he no, returned. No, the ghost no, of Wernowski's no, here. Don't say. <laughs> bang your box. She had like an awesome tune. So um, right. you're just not Look a bird up. brain. You and guys that, don't get it. Right. B- and it, and it was, show, was, was Zachary Lee on Chiller back then? Nope. I, I no, don't remember. That was, I, um, just rem- I never, don't remember him, but I remember him doing all the Chiller conventions. Mm-hmm. Right. Chiller in New York didn't have a host. It just had this claymation six-fingered hand mm-hmm. that came up. And they had a lot of the AIP stuff. Mm -hmm. Um, Creature Features had a lot of the universal, the classic universal things. And the classic universal movies didn't really, I mean, uh, uh, they seemed fantastic. And, but the the movies that scared me were not sort of the classic movies. There was a movie called Horror Hotel, Mm -hmm. which was not, Mm -hmm. you ever seen it with Christopher Lane? I've heard of it. Two people sitting. Wait, I think that's Horror Honeymoon. Two people sitting with like a heart or a skull above them. Horror Hotel is a black and white movie. It came out, I came out before Psycho. 
and it introduces a lead uh, young girl who's going on a, uh, I haven't seen it in a long time, but she's going on um, a research expedition about witches and like Salem, that kind of thing. And she goes to this hotel in this uh, witchy neighborhood in Salem. Hmm. And about 15, 20 minutes into the movie, she's murdered. And this oh, wow. was before Psycho. And that, and I saw this wow, before Psycho on TV. And that it freaked like me out. It's also called City of the Dead. Is that right? Could no, be. that can't be it. But it's with Christopher Lee. Oh, he it was, is. Yeah, yeah it's was, also called oh, wow. City of the Dead, 1960. Right, 1960. And Psycho was what sixty two? No, so it was it was sixty. Sixty came out about the same so, time. So it came out about the same time. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. So I so that movie uh, because that wasn't a classic. On TV, you saw I, was, it? It was, yeah, I saw it on, on TV. TV yeah. Yes. Um, you know, Frankenstein, Dracula. These were all sort of the classic movies. And at that, when I was growing up, there were posters of all these things. Mm. It was sort of they, they you know the, were you a scaredy cat? The, I, I'm always curious if you know some horror fans are. You know, oh, I just love horror and monsters, and some are just fucking chicken shit scary cat. <laughs> like we had the guy from Motel Hell here, and he saw a picture of Frankenstein, and he couldn't. Oh, and he, he, had to, he had to hide it. Like he yeah. couldn't. And look I was at a it. bit like that. I yeah. think when I was young, I was kind of like, oh, I saw one image, a mask of a devil, and I just it freaked the shit out of me. I was you know? scared by things that weren't necessarily supposed to scare you. Like uh-huh. I think everyone That's has. Where I was. Everyone has seen a movie that they were too young to see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And for me, that movie was Pink Flamingos. Oh, <laughs> interesting. Yeah. Which I saw at midnight, was and I, I don't know. I was the uh, seeing uh, asshole didn't exactly. haunt you forever. It, 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 well, that movie, it it seemed to me that 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 somebody had given the Manson family movie yeah. cameras, yeah. <laughs> and yeah, this yeah. is what they came up with. It's like you, well, you especially give if you're a maniac like, as a kid, yeah. you're used to narrative structure in movies, right? And then you see something that's so like transgressive, right? Right. It must have been pretty outrageous, right? Yeah. So that freaked me out. And then there was a movie called Oh Lucky Man. Oh yeah, one of my favorite movies, Again, Lindsay Anderson. I, right. I love that film. Not, not a horror film, but no, there's that well, it's, scene. It's got moments, yeah. It's got moments, and there's that scene, you know, the scene I'm talking about, where he's in, in that hospital. <laughs> the sheep. Right. Or is it a sheep or a pig? I thought I, thought I think was, he's a sheep. Right. He he volunteers it's for a, medical well, experiments. Well, first, it's Malcolm McDowell. Oh, the Malcolm right. McDowell. Right yes. after Clockwork yeah, okay. Orange. It's a trilogy. And if is the first one, right? Right, which is a great right. movie on its own right. But Oh Lucky Man is like a different level of crazy. It's a it's three-hour super movie. Long, right? yeah. It's super long, right? It was on two tapes. It when has, I was it a has kid. musical yeah. numbers. But musical numbers. Alan Price. Alan Price. I've got great the soundtrack. soundtrack. It's really great good. It's like a mockumentary. No, no, it's yeah. it's a very surreal. British movie. I think right. it's one of the weirder movies I've ever seen. It is a very strange movie. Malcolm McDowell plays a traveling coffee salesman. That's yeah. it. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. it's just his adventures, you know, selling coffee. And, and one of his adventures is he winds up in this hospital volunteering for some kind of medical experiments. And it's yeah. very creepy. And he hears like this heavy <laughs> breathing in the middle of the night. And he goes down this hallway and he sort of follows the heavy breathing. And, and he sees a guy in a bed and there's a blanket. I haven't seen this movie <laughs> yeah, in, yeah, in no, decades. No, you're getting it, though. I, I haven't <laughs> seen it for a while either, but it's... There's a guy in a... Uh, this is the impression this movie made on. There's a guy in a bed with a blanket up to his neck. And he's like... <laughs> He's breathing very heavily, and Malcolm McDowell just says to him, "How much are they paying you? How, like, what, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. what are you getting paid? What are you getting paid for this?" And the guy's breathing and breathing, and Malcolm McDowell goes up and he rips the blanket, and the guy's head is grafted onto the body of a large pig. Yeah. Oh my god. And, he's, and it just it, that that, and then wow. later on, he's uh, breastfeeding from a woman. Right. There's a woman with very voluptuous breasts, and Malcolm McDowell's like, like, who's had a kid? He's like, like being. It's it's got some imagery in it where you're like, whoa. Right. And Lindsay Anderson was like a classic, kind of like a Howard Hawks director of England. He had made the uh, the Sporting Life and all these kind right. of big movies, and then went on this very surreal tangent. Like, right. But it's it's yeah, that's a weird movie. But right. I could see if you saw that young, uh-huh. you would just remember yeah. bits of it. You would just you know internalize these strange. And I moments. I tried to recreate that scene in particular uh-huh. in The Unborn, in the the first horror movie I did uh-huh. for Roger Corman. There's a, uh, a scene. Um, oh, that was a rips, corner. I didn't know that was cool. Yeah, where someone rips the blanket off of uh, one of um, Dr. Oh, yeah. Meyerling's. And, yeah, and you see pregnant woman, and you see, and her stomach is exposed and open, and I, it, it didn't quite have the same impact <laughs> as the sheep in A Lucky Man. It's, but, it's a really interesting movie. I want to I want to start uh, with Corman stuff because I'm curious uh, how okay. because I, when I met you a few weeks back, um, you, and because you were just talking about seeing AIP films, you know. Uh, on on this channel. Oh, on Schiller, right. Yeah, and then you end up, uh, was it Concord? Yep, Concord okay, New so, Horizons. And because he's changed a few times, you know, right. <laughs> his handle. Uh, but like we've had some pretty good Corman stories here, you yeah. know, and, and he's, an, he's an interesting person. And well, I think I think one of the reasons why he, he's changed a few handles and why you may not have realized The Unborn uh, was a Corman movie was because at that time, Roger had um, uh, a distribution deal um, with MGM and MGM was going to get all the Concord New Horizons films. Uh, now, Roger wanted to make more movies. You uh-huh. could make enough movies when you're working for Roger. Yeah. Um, so he started a new company called Califilm, and Columbia oh. got the Califilm films. Oh, I didn't and even know that didn't, company he, existed. Right, I right, heard that one. right. 
um, Calafilm. Uh, my first job for Roger was. How'd you meet uh, and how'd you get in? Start, start how'd you got in and then toss the whole thing. Yeah, how does I'm one curious. start working Because for everyone Roger. has a different, like, they just like walk in and become a PA. amazing story about how they, they end up working for Roger. Or What's even that? just work in the industry. I love those. Like, you know, I was working at FedEx and then was that one your day first so-and-so gig discovered here? me. So I was working at FedEx. Yeah. And, <laughs> um, I know. I Xeroxed my butt <laughs> on a... Uh, <laughs> Um, and Roger saw it. Right, and he saw it, and that was it. Uh, no, I um, I went to Harvard uh-huh. University as an undergraduate, and um, everyone, there, there really isn't a film major at, at Harvard. There's sort of a visual arts major, and within that major you can make films. And everyone who was there was making these very, very pretentious films that you'd expect to come out of Harvard. Right. Just, you know, some, some someone reading Rilke while waves crashed on rocks. Right. <laughs> Inevitably, there's someone naked and having, you know, I don't know. So I made this movie, I, I, I made this movie called The Bloody Mutilators, kind of wanting to, <laughs> wanting to be the, uh, At Harvard, nice. the John Waters <laughs> of Harvard. Yeah. Um, and when I, they didn't know whether to graduate uh, me or, or throw me out, uh, luckily <laughs> I did graduate. But when I graduated, I saw all my friends getting their films into film festivals and these prestigious things. And I didn't know what to do with the bloody mutilators. And, and there was a, uh, a profile of Roger, I think it was on 60 minutes or something. And it was actually, my mother had seen it and she said, you know, there's this guy out in California gives <laughs> inexperienced people, uh, their break. He might get the joke. So I sent the uh the real three three quarter inch tape sent it to roger wow. um he responded he, he got the joke uh he have you met roger he's uh-huh. not yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah yeah so you know he's very kind of professorial a uh-huh. lot of people yeah. picture someone more like um sam markoff or someone you know kind of no. smoking yeah, yeah, a cigar yeah, but he's he's, he's, he's and intellectual calm. he's, and intellectual, yeah. he's, he's you know. intellectual oh, he's talking about freud and things like yeah. that right you know? <laughs> he's he's preppy one yeah. might even say stanford so, yeah, stanford, stanford right yeah. yeah so stanford is his allegiance and then uh-huh. secondary he'll like hire from harvard maybe right, yale right. but stanford yeah anyway so I, I met with him and uh and we had a good meeting and i knew you know that he gave very inexperienced people their break and i wanted to direct and he said um Everyone does the voice, right? Everyone does Rod, the, Rod, Rod, Roger's voice, yes. <laughs> he said, uh, you know, do you um, have any uh, experience in advertising? And I said, no, none. I just graduated. He said, well, are, are you interested? We have an opening. And I said, yes. And within a week, I was vice president in charge of worldwide marketing and distribution. <laughs> Ooh, that's a big title. Yeah, exactly. Now are you after Jim? Because I remember Jim had the same entry, right? It was like a, I think he so. took over he marketing trailers, or something. Right? No, he it's, did marketing he first. Marketing. And, then, yes, and, then, I, and then the trailer. Right. I inherited the job I, I, um, Maybe from, from Jim. I think Jim was one or two people before me. Okay. There, uh, it was a great job. John Davison, who produced uh-huh, yeah. Robocop, Robocop among, yeah. among many other things, had that job. Um, and yeah, we cut trailers, we came up with ad campaigns, came, you know, wrote catch lines, mm-hmm. uh, often for movies that, that uh, I'd never seen and <laughs> had to write, um, these things called press books, which were sent out to, uh, you know, critics or distributors, that kind of thing. And, um, Jim, Jim told you about, uh, not of this earth. And that was yeah. like one of the first things I had to do was write a press book for not of this earth, which starred Tracy Lords in right. her oh, yeah. first you know, quote unquote, uh, you know, legitimate. legit non X rated right. movie. And I was given the directive from her, I don't know if it was her manager or a publicist. Uh-huh. And he said, Look, say anything you want, don't mention porn. Right. You <laughs> cannot mention anything about her pornography past. Why she's famous. We are, we are exactly <laughs> why she was cast, yeah. right? Her notoriety, you know, but we're putting that behind us. And I was like, Okay, what am I going to say? I had no idea. It was like two in the morning. I probably had one of these bottles of tequila and I start (laughs) typing her biography and I'm angry that I cannot (laughs) mention, you know, the truth. So I start making up all this shit that she, you know, was a Rhodes scholar and that she was in the astronaut training program. (laughs) And that she was... I see Wernowski didn't fall too far from the tree. I mean, this is... So yes, uh, veracity at the, um, (laughs) in in advertising was never, um, was never of utmost importance. So so I'm writing all this stuff. I don't think anyone's, who's going to read the press book for Not of This Earth? So I, I type it up, whatever I, you know, put it out. It gets Xeroxed, it gets mailed out. The movie opens. Um, or actually, it's the week before the movie opens, and I get a phone call. It's Sunday morning, 5.30 in the morning. I'm awakened. And I think it was, it might have been her, I don't know, her, her representative. And they said, have you seen the LA Times? And I said, why? What's it? Did you write that Tracy Lords was in the astronaut training program? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, uh, maybe. And they said, go, go get the LA Times. And I went out 
and I got the elephant at the front page of the calendar wow. section. I actually, because I, I knew you were going to ask about this. I, I <laughs> oh, I want to see this so hard. <laughs> um, I am, I'm drinking so, tequila for this. <laughs> so, so this is this was the uh, L.A. Times, the front page of the Sunday calendar section here. You can read it, Becca. Thank it's, you. It starts with a notorious thespian there. Wow. Tracy Lord springs to not of this earth, a skilled and unique talent that can only be called extraordinary. Come again. That's the opening of the bio in the official press kit for the Roger Corman produced unearthly sci-fi fantasy film directed by Jim Warnowski from Concord Pictures. It opens May 20th. The bio lists none of her many X-rated films <laughs> made when she was under legal age, but does offer other truly fantastic credits, <laughs> like she played Spritzel, the youngest daughter of <laughs> Spritzel, the youngest daughter of Fiddler on the Roof in Hastings <laughs> on Hudson's Another brunch Jewish parade reference. in right. upstate New York. The Hastings on Hudson brunch parade. I've, I don't even know if there is a brunch parade, but it sounded <laughs> it sounds uh -oh. like something I'd want to go to. Yeah. With Tracy Lord in the Sound of Music. Dusty in Peter Pan and Ms. Honeychuckle in My Fair Lady. Wow. At the age of nine, Tracy was asked by Mr. George Blant Balanchine. Balanchine to appear in the leading role of Clara in the New York City ballet production of The Nutcracker, a remarkable achievement for someone with no prior ballet experience. <laughs> it was her natural grace and poise. <laughs> Which was, said wow. the late ballet maestro, a blessing which cannot be acquired from lessons or surgery. The bio concludes she is a symbol of America and a role model for young <laughs> men, women all over the world. Explain to Corman rep, we ignored her colorful past because huh. some people look down on women who do porno films. Not Roger, of course. He once made a movie called Rabid starring ex-porn queen Marilyn Chambers. Lords, now 19, is displayed prominently with clothes on the movie's poster and has two brief nude scenes in the pic, her rep reports. Right. Roger wow. distributed Rabbit. That oh, was yeah, a Cronenberg movie. Yeah. Yeah. No, I know the yeah. film, but I didn't yeah. realize yeah. he had anything to do with it. I didn't realize that was right. a Roger film. So now. this was printed pretty much verbatim. And, um, <laughs> <laughs> now, did Roger call you? Uh, it, it may have, Roger loved it. He, you know, the fact that, yeah, that his movie the, was on the front page right. of the LA times calendar section. I mean, it's fantastic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I think even Tracy got a kick out of it. So yeah. she That's intimidated fine. me. I, I was at a, a photo shoot. I mean, I was, I was like, you know, 14 years old basically yeah. and, and had to do the poster <laughs> and, and, um, she was, she was very sweet and quiet. And I think she, she was probably as scared as I was, but, but I was just very intimidated yeah. by, um, you know her experience. <laughs> I guess you might say. <laughs> wow. Yeah. No. She. I actually. Uh, she's a very intimidating person still to this day. Is she? Okay. I interviewed her for the Now of This Earth DVD oh. that, wow. that they put out. And uh, did she say there's there's some uh, prick uh, who wrote this no, bio about me? No. But what's funny is that that story about the bio is is on the DVD on the. Oh, is it? Oh, I didn't cool. realize that you freaking wrote it, <laughs> which is kind of hilarious. But uh, no, she she was all she's super nice, but she was she was all business. She showed up and didn't want to be personal. She just wanted to get straight to what we were talking about, and she had no problems bringing up the adult film stuff and, and being like, you know, yeah, yep, that's what happened. That's where I was at the time, but we were moving on. So um, yeah, but you know, that's yeah, it's pretty, pretty, pretty well. So uh, with and then, then so advertising, cutting trailers, all that yeah. stuff. Well, yes. and and at New Concord because uh, when we met outside uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre, right? A great, a great spot, and uh, <laughs> it was a fun conversation. After uh, you were talking about how because uh, we just screened Frankenstein Unbound. Oh, that's a right. Couple mm -hmm. week, a couple weeks, a few weeks. No, it must have been last month at Jump Cut uh, on sixteen and. That was, I, th I believe that was the period where Roger left for quite a long time, right? That's right. And, and you had you said it was his last thing he had directed. Directly directing. But and until I, Conan. I, I, yeah, I knew I that. Watched uh, that. I watched oh, that. It was a see, great interview. I mean, what, wasn't that great? When I did LSD. Right. <laughs> and the boobs right. came at me. <laughs> right. So Roger actually directed something recently um, uh, with uh, with Conan for... Um, uh, uh, sh uh, so Sharktopus, yeah, yes, like, Sharktopus, one of the Sharktopus yeah, yeah. sequels. Oh, so. that's right. Yeah, but yeah, just yeah. a scene. It, 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 was, it was just a scene, but he came but out of retirement. But the thing about um, Frankenstein Unbound is it, the one thing I did take from it uh, is it, it's actually a fairly polished and well put together film, but I definitely got the vibe of him putting himself really out there with an artistic intent, and then when it probably wasn't received, I could almost see him going, oh, well, then I'm not relevant and I shouldn't be make, directing anymore. Like it felt like he really, it felt like a big film. Like, like he was really trying to make a great film that was about 10 years out of time. Maybe yeah, I, 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 I should see it again. I'm, I'm too close to it. I, yeah, yeah. 
Because um, you were, and I was, well, tell, tell I, people I, what you I, were doing I, I was when there, Roger was doing that. I was there when he did story. that. Not only was it was I there because he, he what happened was he went to Italy to shoot it, and I was I had moved from um, advertising to actually his head of production, always wanting to direct, hating the desk job. I'm, yeah. I'm not an office guy. Yeah. Um, and w- what's weird is when you when you work for Roger, if you're in his office. <laughs> Kind of the way he fires you is he gives you a movie to direct. That's sort of his <laughs> nice way to, to, to you know, that you're, you're kind of pushing the bird out of the yeah. nest is is uh, is directing a movie. Um, and he uh, so he went to Italy and he you know basically gave me the keys to the kingdom for you know eight, ten months, well, a year, however long he was gone, huh. and Thanks, did a bunch of Jim Wynarski movies. Did like three of those. He's Jim, I think, snuck in two or three extra ones. Yeah, that and explains because be, I noticed yeah. my favorite Jim Wynarski film is Haunting of Morella. And oh yeah, you're the producer on it. Oh yeah, so. that's that's one of them. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that's like his highest like production value one. It's it looks great. Yeah, it is. Um, we did that. It's Summer Party Massacre three. We, yeah, there were two. a bunch. Um, three. Maybe three. Oh, all right, three. No, I think you did three, right? Cat Shea Rubin did a few. Cat, Cat Shea now, but yeah. uh, at the time, Cat Shea Rubin did did a few movies. Strip uh, to Kill. Strip to Kill. And strip to Kill 2. Strip to Kill 2. At that time, she did Strip to Kill 2. Uh, there was a vampire movie. She did all these back-to-back, um, and a movie called Streets, which was with Christina Applegate, who right. was huge at the time from Married with Children. It was a very serious movie, uh, and we it's the kind of thing where no you know we never could have gotten a star like Christina Applegate, Applegate at that time had it not uh, afforded her the opportunity to show her serious acting chops because mm. she was only known as this you know kind of sexed out bimbo from that that sitcom. Yeah. Yeah. This, here she played a runaway who was being you know uh, abused and chased by a, a bad cop. She's brilliant. I mean, really really good wow, in the that movie. That's kind of free. Yeah, 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 it does sound. Yeah. Like Chef yeah, Factory so. put it out as a double bill, but it was like super limited. Like uh, cuz you know, Chef Factory did a whole ton of the Roger Corman line. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. it's in there. Yeah, I yeah. know it, and I know it's on DVD. Right. Oh, I want to see yeah. that. Conspicuously missing uh, the unborn and in the <laughs> I <fashion>. know. <laughs> now, so you still hadn't done the unborn at the stage. Uh no. no. Um okay. not not when so I done still, that. You still hadn't so directed. You you were still I had, I had directed some um some scenes uh, similar stories to to what Jim yeah. had said. There was a movie that I, I think it, it may have been stripped to kill I'm not sure that that um did not perform with its original advertising mm-hmm. key art. Uh, and one of the things that um, our, our sort of market research is, we you know we'd have uh, artists do these sketches, and I'd have to go to a mall with mm. a, a sketch of a woman draped around a knife or something, which was the uh-huh. poster for Strip to Kill, uh, and say, you know, would this make you want to see a movie? You know, really, really uh, wearing the Cannibal Holocaust T-shirt is nothing compared to some <laughs> some of the things I had to do. But there was there was um, a uh, a piece of key art that that tested very well. It was like a woman uh, on an altar in front of a skull. And uh, we released the movie with this new artwork. It did much better. So then I had to uh, reshoot a scene for a new trailer and TV spot with a woman in front of a skull that was nowhere near uh, right. in, in the actual in, movie. In, in, and in, did she <laughs> ever uh, turn herself inside out? Was it something I said? No, yeah. um, uh, <laughs> she did not turn herself. Oh, okay, I love yeah, that yeah. story. And it's funny. That is, that is one of my favorite stories I've heard. I've got to say, just and purely in terms of like how movies are made and marketed. It's yeah. just so unusual how. And, how you can get away with that false advertising. And yeah. I remember seeing that poster. I was in high school when I remember seeing that poster, Screamers. Uh, and it was like um, it was like a cigarette, you know, Surgeon General's warning. Uh-huh. There was a box on the poster and it said, warning, like the Surgeon General. Oh, yeah. You will actually see a man turned inside that's awesome. out. Yeah, that's pretty cool. <laughs> wow, that's yeah. cool. How, the, how yeah. did they do that? Yeah. And then I saw it and I was like, what? They they, they poured yeah, slime yeah. on the guy. You know, yeah. you remember that stuff, slime? That, uh-huh. that oh, yeah, out? I remember that well. Yeah. I, I think yeah. that, that, that was it. So, um... So, yeah, so I, I got to produce, and that was my film school. I didn't go to film school. Yeah. I just produced movies and learned from all these others' mistakes. Right. Um, saw some good movies made, some really bad movies made. Was and, Roger uh, checking in all the time, or did nope. you have a pretty... Okay. <laughs> so he was, like, totally in his own bubble? He was directing a movie. I mean, yeah. he was, and that was a difficult shoot. And, yeah. you know, when, when you're uh, now having directed, when you're directing a movie, and it's it's important for spouses and partners of directors to realize when you're directing a movie, you're on Pluto, you're orbiting Pluto. You can't yeah. check in. You can't, it's, it's, it's really hard to, um, you know, be a part of, of the world. Roger came back and, um, uh, cut the movie, tested the movie. And there were some pickups and, and some additional, mm-hmm. uh, I think maybe an additional scene or some additional shots that needed to be done, which he did at the studios, mm. uh, in Venice. And I was the only time I ever AD'd. I was his first AD. Mm. And Roger, you may have heard, gives all his new directors, what you know, the talk, the famous talk. And one of the lessons was, 
never ask the cameraman if the shot was any good. Never ask how, how was it. Mm. You move on. If you like what you've got, you say, you know, I got it. We're moving on. And if there is a problem, the cameraman will tell you. <laughs> I was like, okay. And, and, uh, and that, that has stayed with me. So I, I haven't a, heard that one. That, yeah, I like that. That's interesting. Right. So I'm ADing for Roger and he does his, and I'm terrified. And he does his first shot and he says, cut and turns to the AD and says, how was it? So, <laughs> <laughs> so there went that, um, <laughs> there went that oh, that's funny. lesson out the window. So um, was he happy with the job you had done? Uh, he must have been because he, he said I only had to do it for a year before he'd let me direct a movie, and uh-huh. he kept me on for two years. Oh, wow. So, <laughs> so I, I think I did too good a job because he didn't um, push me out of the nest with um, with a film. But all that time, there w- uh, this um, treatment for this movie, The Unborn, had uh-huh. had uh, had floated in, and I didn't show it to anyone. I liked it, and it um, it was Cronenbergian. Yeah, and, yeah. yeah. And, um, and pa- contemporary, Polanskian you know, it was and, the fear of in vitro and right, things like that. Right, and it was all those things. So I didn't show it to anyone, and I, I kept it for myself. And after two years, he said, okay, Rodman, you know, you're ready, you can do this. And uh, I did The Unborn, and it's kind of, um, it's a little bit of a, a schizophrenic movie because I wanted to do... That's funny because that's uh, my exact review. Oh, was, was like, it? Well, my review was, it, it's positive, but it's the first half. And in the intent of the director, to me, feels like they're trying to make an invasion of the body, an adult, an adult drama horror film. Repulsion. And That's exactly, what I wanted Repulsion, to do. which is one of my favorites. And then the second half, it's 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 vying for a spot with somebody making the cheap B creature feature, <laughs> you know, and like having to kind of shoehorn that as part of it. But I kind of liked both parts of it, but <laughs> together they're kind of funny at parts, you know. It's, it, it switches gears, and that's exactly why. I wanted to make Repulsion. uh uh-huh. And Roger wanted to make Child's Play. You know, yeah. uh, Chucky was very popular at the time. He was running around. He wanted, you know, a little, a little yeah. born. <laughs> right, <laughs> you know, right. I, I wanted the unborn. He wanted the born running around yeah. causing mayhem. And so the first two thirds, yeah. you know, I, I think I won because most it's, it's, most it's, of the film is it's that more way, yeah. repulsion-y mm-hmm. than... And uh, you have that final image where it's a big image, but uh, I, I was really impressed by that final image in the, at the sino- science lab where you see just all these... It, it wasn't the little dolls, but it was just these images of embryos and fetuses growing and this right. kind of red light. It was, it was interesting. Well, it was I, like a, I had a very good team, a uh, production designer a guy named Gary Randall, um, who, who made all that stuff out of nothing. Yeah. It was fantastic. And Wally Pfister, who's gone yeah, on yeah, yeah. to direct and I remember and I did mention the, that. Yeah. Uh, he was, he, what was his film the this Bat- year? Batman movie. No, no, this year he directed, he finally directed a big Johnny Depp movie. Right. Whatever it was about online, uh, the scientist who gets uploaded online. Oh, the tra- transcendence. Transcendence is his first big movie. Transcendence, yeah, yeah, yeah. directing wise. Yeah, beautiful. And um, so I had a I had a good team. Uh-huh. And if you look closely at the end credits, um, it, it was my first movie, and I wanted, um, you know, uh, a, a DP who had a little more experience than I did. And there was a, um, a guy there who uh, had been gaffing for uh, Fade and Papa Michael, who's since gone on to yeah. shoot a lot of movies. And he wanted to shoot it, and I thought he was very talented, but I don't think he had shot anything before. And I was just a little nervous, so I gave him second unit. And if you look at the end credits, the unborn is the second, second unit director of photography, Janusz Kaminski. Ah, so, from yeah. Chicago. Yeah. He's come out of Columbia College. Right, right. Who's, who's yeah, yeah. Spielberg. Done every Spielberg movie yeah. <laughs> wow. yeah, yeah. since Schindler's List. So That's it was. Great. So we had a great team. I mean, we had a really What about really Brooke Adams? Because uh, uh, we talked about it just before you I started. Like but has a thing for I do. Her. No, she really is. I, she <laughs> has I get a presence. it. That's why I cast her. I mean, I was. She has the presence of, you know what the difference is uh, back then and compared to now is you could be like really attractive, but you didn't have to be like, um, now there's this like untouchable, hot model quality that people cast that has no interest to me. I like people who look like real people, but they, Mm -hmm. she had intelligence and like looked like a, just, there's something, uh, especially Invasion of the Body Snatchers, Shockwaves, there's just these movies, she always seems intelligent and attractive. And vulnerable. Yeah. She had a vulnerability, which... Is scary to a lot of actresses today. To, and to she's really good in the film. Them. I mean, oh, it's her. It's her in her early forties, so it's like her just after the period where she was like a go-to actress. And it's I don't know. I thought I think it was an actually really good role. I, I I like films about something, especially horror films where they like pick a topic. And I thought that fear of in vitro and what it could mean to artificially have children. You were pushing it, and it's it's a weird, wacky movie. Right. But I like it. I, I think it's an interesting. I love that sub genre in general. We. We talk about it a lot. I watched yeah. The Kindred last week and thought that was batshit crazy fun, you know? <laughs> it's like, 
<laughs> That's with the uh, the squid babies in squid the basement babies, yeah, or something. I've never seen little, that. Yeah, I think it's a little it after, you, after yours. So. Squid yeah. babies. That's what we have to I look can't wait for squid babies. <laughs> this so sounds like my film. Did you have <laughs> to really stalk her to get her in? Because that seems like a um, must have been pretty low I budget did, for her. I did. I uh, I had been a huge fan. She'd worked with all my favorite, you know, directors Cronenberg yeah. and Kaufman and. Um, it, you know, uh, Days of Heaven. I mean, yeah, Days was, of Heavens. Yeah, of it course. was uh, so. It was, and I was so scared. And it was, you know, it's, it's funny you're talking about like fear of in, in vitro fertilization mm-hmm. and all this stuff. Uh, you know, I was so young. I, I, I think I barely knew what sex was at that time, yeah. let alone babies and in vitro. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, um, uh, so yes, I met with her, and I think she saw, you know, that I was serious, and um, I, I did not wear a uh, Cannibal Holocaust T-shirt. I wore right. kind of a nice. <laughs> preppy Harvard button down style t-shirt yeah. <laughs> shirt. And, um, and I was very, very lucky, uh, to get her. And, uh, the whole cast was wonderful. James Karen, mm-hmm. who's, uh, um, Myerling, the, uh, the mad, uh, geneticist in the movie. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was the path mark man in, on the East coast. I don't yep. know if you, uh, that might've been before your time. Maybe no, no, I don't no, know yeah. if you remember, remember path mark. It was, it was, this, it was like CVS was this chain yeah. of drug stores and James Karen was their spokesman. So oh, yeah. on, on TV, it's like, you know, this week at Pathmark, antihistamines. So it was just great to cast this sort of trustworthy yeah, 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 yeah. druggist That's a good um, idea. Like that. as the, uh, the, you know, the person. And that, that kind of theme of, um, that has always scared me. I think going back to like, oh, lucky man, the theme of like doctors doing something to you. Yeah. You remember a movie called Scream and Scream Again? Uh-huh. Yes. Yeah. Movie I remember guy. the uh, the cover was a girl in Formaldehyde. Am I yeah, remembering the right a, cover? And a head. I think he's holding And a guy is like on, waking up again in a hospital room yeah. and, his, and each time he wakes up, his limbs are missing. That kind of, um, you know, well, being you, put under is a scary concept, yeah. right? That yeah. you're going to have something happen to you, but you're not going to be conscious. Have you guys seen Tusk? Did you, did not, you talk yet. About that? Not, not yet. yet. Oh, not, okay. yet. Yeah. not yet. I mean, I actually do want to see it. It's gotten very polarized. What's well, a podcasting years. movie, right? So yeah, exactly. <laughs> I can't believe it. Yeah, you're just yeah, this as long is yeah. as yeah. a podcast. From scream and scream again that I remember is the girl in like, okay. right. Whatever the body, the, the body parts and stuff. Whatever yeah. it's melting her. Yeah, exactly. How, how um, did the so, but, Unborn do when it came out? Like, because I, I obviously I don't remember specifically I remember, um, the cover. I remember. I but. remember because I remember it did a theatrical, right? I and was then, very lucky in that I made movies for Roger right at the tail end of his theatrical distribution, uh-huh. when his movies could still sort of play, you know, get out and and play in theaters. And he, I, you know, I think like the it was uh, the, the very start of the nineties, right? We're like ninety. Or 91? Exactly, like 91. So that's just when it's, it's changing, it's, it's, yeah. It's just when it's changing. I've, I've got a photo of um, the uh, it, the theater's closed now, but that that uh, theater on um, like Fairfax and Beverly Boulevard, mm-hmm. uh, it, was, it was a twin theater. Hmm. And in one theater... Is oh, the, the one that's closed, uh, the yeah, one near the silent theater, but around the corner. Right. And it still looks like a theater, but it's Yeah, closed. the marquee yeah, is still that there. Well, that used to be a first run. You uh, know, when The Unborn opened, it was a first run. Oh, and it, uh, The Unborn also played at the time was a big... There was the Avco, which is, uh, uh, is now something else on, on uh, Wilshire, but I have a, a photo of a marquee where there's a twin twin theater and it's like The Unborn is in one theater and Goodfellas is in the uh, other cool. theater. So I was very, very lucky. And it, and it played 42nd Street, yeah, which is cool. w- yeah, yeah, where I grew heart, up. Yeah. And... and um, and my second uh, film I did for Roger in the Heat of Passion, which was um, you know, an erotic thriller, uh-huh. uh, in in the wake of um, uh, oh uh, Michael Douglas. Um, oh, Basic Instinct. Basic Instinct. instinct yeah. yeah, in the wake of Basic Instinct. That's who was were, in the Candelabra that I was trying to remember no. earlier. Michael Douglas. Right. You've talked about him two weeks in a row. Right? I know because <laughs> I talked oh, about I romance in love with him. Yeah. I yeah. am. <laughs> so both of my core movies got you know uh-huh. somewhat decent. You know. Theatrical releases, and I was very, very lucky. And um, you know, pe- people at that time went to see it. Now, so, so you guys uh-huh. saw all these movies on video, right? Was yeah. it? Yeah, it yeah, was because yeah. it was yeah. very, very different. And what was that? I mean, you'd see it with your friends, or you'd see. I mean, I wh- saw Unborn. I remember seeing it. I remember seeing it with Ben, who was this guy in high school that I didn't date, Ooh, but we watched. No, we, we actually we never dated. We just always watched horror movies. Yeah, yeah. you guys a cop? did things. Oh, shush, no, but uh-huh. um, no, like, he's the cop, yeah, I've Your talked about it before. quote, unquote, friend. My uh, quote, unquote, friend, no, and, but we watched, that was our thing, is like, we just You know what I find funny about together, our generation? I remember seeing it with him. That's true. Our generation yeah. is like, we're, especially people like us, like film nerds, are the ultimate ones who go, the theatrical experience is so important, we have to, the reality yeah, is all the films that, that we loved, no. we saw alone. No, that's yeah. true. We saw alone no, on, with a alone. stack of eight VHS or some of our friends spending the night. No, I, I had I had a friend like you did, my friend Michelle lived on the block. And, and we'd walk over and rent horror movies every day. Mm-hmm. And we would just watch a new one, me, her, and her brother. And so a lot of, I mean, that's the funny thing we were saying before you came on, how 
even though the nineties is looked at upon as like a weird time for horror, that's when we were discovering all the eighties movies was on video in the nineties. But you weren't aware of movies coming out, right? Right. Like I remember I, I heard your, uh, probably your, not till the mid nineties. Right. No, no, early nineties. No, yeah, early nineties. Yeah. From, from the moment that I was capable of taking a bus <laughs> to, yeah, the, yeah, yeah. to the movie theater for sure. Yeah. Because then, you know, you saw a pre, I saw a preview for Leprechaun too. And I remember distinctly taking the bus to the Limbrook, you know, movie theater <laughs> to go see it because it's like, you know, and, and that was, was did that you still? Or? I can't remember. Yeah. No, of course I did. Okay. Yeah. 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 No, um, and I remember movies coming out like way back when I was in like end of elementary getting into middle, because I remember always like the amount of time that it would take from a, for a movie to go from theatrical to video was, was a lot longer back then. Longer. Yeah. Really long. lot longer. Yeah. And I remember being like Beetlejuice is coming. Isn't it weird yeah. that now yeah. it's before? Yeah. Oh God. Like, like now right. it's before it's within, theatrical. Yeah. Within, yeah, well, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes like it's, you know, that's where you're Gonna say no, well, I mean, it was. I heard your uh, podcast with Charlie uh -huh. Band, and I remember, I remember he was talking about like that Ghoulies uh -huh, campaign, yeah. Yeah. and I remember like the weeks before that movie opened, seeing that that thing pop out of the right. toilet uh -huh. and being so I, I gotta see that movie I gotta see like <laughs> creatures come out of toilets and yeah. bite people in the ass and all I mean I had this whole vision of what the movie was it wasn't my no it was really a scary movie, movie. <laughs> it was very, the first one. Uh, yes it was not what I thought it was no. but um I I, I just can't it, it's weird to me to think. What was excite? You know, how was excitement built for? You know, well, the, the difference the, the video is video store generation. The difference is now it's everywhere. Like it's, we can be entertained more, anywhere, video, TV, our phones. I do, I do but miss back that then though, it because it's easily accessible on the internet. Where like like nowadays, as a full grown adult, what I normally like to do is something like, all right, so Fantastic Fest just happened right. in the last couple weeks. So in the next week or so, I'm going to see a, a slew of reviews come out from it, mm -hmm. and that's when I'm going to decide. Oh, that sounds like a good movie. That right, sounds like cool, right. or whatever. But back then, it was you know you discover stuff on video, and back then it was like as a kid you would just box rent. Art. You'd look at the box art. Mm -hmm. You'd rent whatever was cool you'd or Leonard Molten friends. occasionally sometimes exactly. I'd go to Molten not for B movies but you know but not everybody that I went to school to high school with or junior high or whatever they weren't as it, it was funny to see who took it to the next level I kept taking it to the next level where it's like all right well now I have to go to the theater and wait outside until somebody <laughs> pretends to be my older brother right. and gets me in and then of course I went to the bookstore and would sometimes maybe steal a copy mm -hmm. of Fangoria or something uh, because they wouldn't sell it to me. That's yeah. it. I'm and, right um, yeah. and, then, and then that's it. it. You, you read, <laughs> I read through Fangoria and, uh, and I'd see pictures of a movie that, and I'd be like, I have to see that. I don't know what it is, but I have to see it. That's so and funny. And then you'd look mm -hmm. for it, you know, mm -hmm. and then once you saw the little teaser or the trailer, like Tales from the Dark Side, the movie's mm -hmm. coming out. It's like, oh, I'm there opening day. And I mean, you know, back, back when I was a kid, there were a lot more theaters. That's the thing. Like right. there was one within walking distance of where I lived that only showed two or three movies. Yeah. You know, it, over the years, people forget that, that there was tons of theaters everywhere that showed maybe one or two, whereas now it's all been kind of like swallowed by the multiplex. Mm -hmm. right, right. Like you could only go to a giant place to see 12 movies. And spend like, 15, that was the fun. It was yeah. like kind of hunting, like, all right, that one movie that I want to see is playing there. And then I had to take the bus if I want to see the, you know, that other one at that one. So but yeah, it was the, interesting. Um, it's funny, your experience with Fangoria, I had that experience, but it was Cinefantastique. Right. right. And I remember that one. they had all these, you know, like the Wicker Man mm -hmm. and like these strange pictures. Like what, you know, what is this? And movies that were really hard to see mm -hmm. um, that Cinefantastique featured. But the excitement of the fact that the entire universe of movies is in our pockets on our phones now. I remember when I, I, I saw Exorcist 2 the day it opened. The 11 a.m. show. Wow. At Cinema One, across the street from Bloomingdale's in New York City, 3rd Avenue. And it was all the exorcist freaks were there. And mm -hmm. we couldn't believe there was going to be more exorcist. We could not believe there was actually yeah. a sequel to The Exorcist. By the then, guy who made Deliverance. Right, right. right. By the <laughs> guy My made, God, yeah. that's got there a used guaranteed to be a hit. There theater there? Yeah. Is there still a theater? I think there's still a theater. At Cinema like 52nd One. 52nd? Third, no, 3rd third? Avenue, 59th Street. Um, really? Across the street from Bloomingdale's That's on where Third I Avenue. My dog. Oh. There's a dog store right there. I got cool. my puppy at. So oh. also wow. not a horror Sweet. story. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry. But it's really becoming very family be friendly. Is your dog line. is your dog's name Leatherface? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yes. Okay. No, there I, I don't recall a theater. There. I need to know That's the punchline. Punch going to see Exorcist too. Okay, so there was okay. so much excitement. We had like waited for hours. Right. Huge line around the block. There's more Exorcist. Linda Blair. There's more Exorcist. More. Okay, the movie started. We sat there. Open jaw. Now, th this was a cut of the movie that I don't think you can see anymore. No, I mean, no, they did change. Yeah, yeah. they, they uh, changed. Original theatrical. The, yeah, the movie ended. The movie ended. The version that I saw ended with Linda Blair 
and Richard Burton walking off hand in hand in the sunset. <laughs> okay, that's how the movie wow. ended. People stood up and shouted at the screen. Somebody had a Coke and hurled it at that's the screen. Awesome, and I remember this brown stain dripping down the screen. People were so angry. And, the, and I mean, that story actually has been, has been written about the, uh -huh. the, the Coke at the screen and they had to pull it from distribution yep. and completely recut, recut the movie. It. Yeah. yeah. Now, at that um, point, was it still called The Heretic or was that later? Yeah, it was Exorcist, Exorcist, yeah, Exorcist, Exorcist 2. Heretic. Heretic. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That was it. And um, I, I, can that happen today? I mean, is that, I don't think it that came happens. with certain audiences. I, I guess, but... I've no. been to certain crowds where the vocal yeah. range is a lot stronger to a movie than other I, you places. Know, no, I, mean, I, think, I think now people are a little more, like, uh, in terms of the testing process and figuring things, you know, figuring Devil out... Devil Inside was pretty close. I saw pretty people yeah. almost you know protest true. at the Devil Inside. Hmm. And I haven't seen it yet, I saw it at the opening it. night, and there was a party for it, and it was, like, a press... It was a lot of press, but it was also mostly people, like, who they... A targeted demographic yeah. with DJs and everything and stuff. And the trailer was really scary. It, they cool. it had some great imagery. The key art was good, a nun with white eyes. Yeah. And that film just flat out didn't have a fu a fu an ending. No ending. No. It just, just cuts to a, it just cuts a to a website. website going for more information. Cut and, <laughs> and people like were the screaming the No, at the I theater. saw that one in my hometown uh -huh. back in Virginia. And so and I saw it on opening night. And it was another thing where like, you know, it had a great trailer, it yeah. had great PR. And so it was a packed house and I had to review it for Fango. So I was there for like the midnight show the night before. Uh. And people were Pissed. I'd yeah. be pissed too. Yeah, well, I, I was pissed. I, I thought it was I trash. I thought it was absolute rubbish. And it made me actually angry. Like, you can't even finish your freaking movie. Come on. <laughs> There's all these people who want to make movies That's and you can't even to. finish your movie. Yeah. Like, it really did feel mm -hmm. like you were ripped off from something. Did but... you see the big yellow house? Mm -mm. I'm, I'm not I'm not gonna as a filmmaker, I can't rag on other films. Yeah, yeah. Other films. Um, but that that was a movie that didn't seem to, <laughs> to have Big Yellow it, House, I don't know. Yeah, it's uh I, I won't see it. Okay. Um <laughs> So, uh, so yeah. yeah. What do you think now, John? I don't know much about the making of that. Would be a great documentary about John Borman and the making of Frederick. But wh where do you think he uh, they went wrong with that? Was he was it just on the script level, or or d did Borman just have a crazy vision of that film? I don't know much about. There is a a long article about it in Video Watchdog. Oh, cool. Oh, Tim Lucas. That talks yeah, about oh, cool. the whole. Yeah, up. I mean, it's one of their great, yeah, great, yeah, yeah. you know, college thesis kinds of articles that goes goes in depth and huh. and it mentions the incident of the Coke. On the screen oh, cool. and the anger at uh, at it. Now, on the other hand, I was also at opening night of Dawn of the Dead, and it was a similar kind of experience wow. where no one. It's what funny, year is that? Seventy eight. So, yeah, I think so. Seventy eight. Yeah, yeah. It was the kind of thing where again, no one could believe there was going to be more Night of the Living Dead. It's it's so funny. Like now, Saw. So next year, there's Saw two and right. Saw three right. and Saw yeah. four and Saw five. Expectation six, 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 of it. Yeah. Eight, nine, ten, eleven. You know, every movie. But at that time, it just it wasn't like that. And I've heard you guys. Uh, you know. Uh, talk at length about like Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but mm -hmm. but for me and I love you know I was there that lo lo fantastic movie, but all, uh, you know also on that Mount Rushmore mm -hmm. <laughs> of of great horror film like right next to Toby Hooper, I think you've got to put George Romero right, right. Yeah, of and Night of the Living Dead because here's a guy who basically invented a whole mythology that is still adhered to today right. yeah. completely. You know, right. just just out of he, he just yeah. Before it, that, there's only really Tuneers. I walk with a zombie. Right, and that's a, a real kind of voodoo. That's zombie. like a Haitian that's kind a different of kind white of thing. zombie. Right, white yeah. zombie. Yeah, yeah the, the, the meaning of zombie. In popular, the, the word "zombie" doesn't even appear in *Night of the Living Dead*. I right. think he called no, them it doesn't, like yeah. ghouls or something. Yeah, he called, called, yeah. called them something else. I mean, that that, that came later. So at, at that time, the fact that there was like this *Dawn of the Dead*, yeah. and it was, I, I think that's the perfect sequel because it wasn't a sequel about a character like *Psycho 2*, but it was you know about the situation and moving the situation mm -hmm. to contemporary times, and it really said something about consumerism and all everything that's been written about a million yeah. times. But again, there was so much excitement, and I that opening night, I actually thought if if have you seen if you've seen the movie recently? There's a uh -huh. scene where the SWAT team goes into a housing project, uh -huh. and this guy starts yelling all these racial. Ep, ep, I've had too much to get. Ep, ep, what's the word? Racial slurs. Slurs. Racial yeah. slurs. <laughs> at the, much better. Racial <laughs> slurs at the screen. And this was in Times Square, and it was it was a diverse crowd. And again, people started yelling at the screen. And it was scary. I mean, I was being scared yeah. in, in, in a in a film in a in a theater. I mean, that was he so successfully you know riled up the audience, and then when they got it, there was such happiness and relief. And, <laughs> right. And um, I, I was so fortunate. I, I met George Romero, and I told him that experience. I said, yeah, I was there opening night at the Rivoli, Times Square, and he turned to me. And said, 
I was there too. Oh. And I was like, well, of course you were, you yeah. know, of course. And he, he remembered that, um, <laughs> that, that riot that almost broke out. Huh. Um, I'd love to see that again. I'd love to be able to make a movie that could do that in a theater, you know, now yeah. that could really inspire people yeah. to yell at the screen. I don't know. Can it be done? I, don't, it, it, I remember people yelling at 28 days later and I, that was a great screening. Yeah, uh, but that was in New York too, and I think it's again different kinds of audiences. Don't mm-hmm. some audiences don't talk back? It's very yeah, quiet, summer, you know? yeah, so, yeah, especially yeah. out here. I mean, it yeah, depends yeah, where you go. Yeah, yeah it's very here professional in LA, it's in very, LA. Yeah, it's a very professional environment where you always assume that mm-hmm. someone from the film is in the audience and things like that, so you don't yell. But to truly shock and push boundaries, yeah, it's difficult because so much has been done now. Now right. after you know fifty years of a lot of intensive horror. You know, a lot of horror every year. Right. It's, you know, but, and not but somehow horror, people do it. I mean, they t- push buttons every once in a while. Not only horror when, you know, two girls in one cup is right. on. Is, right, you right know, yeah, no, When school it. children are looking at two girls, reenacting God. two girls well, in one cup. I thought that was interesting. In, in uh, Darren Bowsman, who did Saw 2, 3, and 4, he oh, on the show was talking about when they were repitching for the rebooting saw mm-hmm. and his pitch which to me uh, we're not allowed to oh, we're not allowed? About that. i thought it was on here <laughs> that was off the air oh, okay all right. all right well it was viral related you've not heard that at all <laughs> anyway i thought i thought i did hear that on yeah the, on i told here. this in the parking lot oh, okay yeah. 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 anyway it all blurs yeah, guys. Anyway. But, all but, blurs. but i do think that's that you're right i think the things online are pushing boundaries far worse than anything else. Absolutely. Could yeah. The stuff on internet porn is going to be worse than anything you could have rented in a mom and pop place. <laughs> God. Oh yeah. And, and do you remember a just child like, can I, I stumble don't, on I, that. I, we don't need to get into porn too much, but like, do you uh-huh. remember like, just like being able to sneak a look in a mag where you yeah, might yeah. see boobs? My and parents like, had oh my this God. book and it was this 1970s book, which I now have called Making Love. And it was this like hardback book that it sat on the shelf for years. Until Page 217. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, it was this thick hardback book and it had this cover, this very kind of mundane looking cover. And it was just called Making Love. And I was probably like in middle school before one day I just went... I wonder what that book is and pulled it off and it's full of like naked people and seventies bush uh-huh. and just weird positions. And there's a chapter on slang where it goes through all the slangs for all the different things. And it's like little men in the boat and you're reading these things. And I remember just being in shock looking mm-hmm. at that, that one, this type of thing existed. And two, my parents had had it sitting on the bookshelf since I was a kid. Shocked, but intrigued. Yes. <laughs> because you're only getting yes. a little glimpse of it. And now it's like, I wonder what it's like. Like, it must be hell to be a fucking teenager right now. It was I just, very I can't hairy. imagine. That's it. all I can say. You can see your expectations also stuff. are going to be at right. a totally weird level yeah. now <laughs> from things but and inter- human interaction. It's weird. Looking back, that book is so tame. Yeah, because right? yeah, yeah. it's yeah. just like talk to your partner is the majority of it, and I'm just like, wow, this is so tame compared to you know what. Oh, I Fire could... was in a Playboy. I remember mm. uh, as Cassandra Pizza in early <laughs> days. Redhead. Uh, I remember that. I remember uh, old, and also they had articles and they were. <laughs> Right. You know, I, mean, I think I've got the Roman Polanski and the Stanley Kubrick Kurt Vonnegut. Is yeah, they, Kurt Vonnegut yeah, for Playboy? No, there was there was all that stuff. It was a real magazine. Just but, the articles. Uh, all right. Well, getting, right getting back on track. Anyway. Yeah. 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 Um, so, at what point did you make the transition? You, you know, you were working for Roger. You got to do a couple of films with him. Yeah. And then you, you know, Idle Hands was a studio picture. So was it was it difficult to make that leap, or did you do Tales from the Crypt before that? I, I did. I, it, you know, it's all a blur to me as well. <laughs> like the '90s probably should be. Um, but yes, I had done uh, Tales from the Crypt was um, my entree into television. Okay. And uh, where that, was Leprechaun? Was Leprechaun two before? That, that was. Uh, you know, I did a, a few Tales from the Crypts. Right. Two and, episodes. Yeah, two of them. And um, and uh, I think Leprechaun was like right smack dab in the middle. It was all around the same time. Right. Uh, and um, I, I got into television because I, you know, all the really good, very good scripts were going to Sidney Lumet, you know, or these A-list actors, and there was no you know, chance. And this was, I, I think, um, I don't know if I, if I was talking about this with, with you or Elk, but um, that, when I, that time for the 90s directors for Roger Corman, that was right at the time when um, Steven Soderbergh and Sex, Lies, and Videotape kind of changed the game for right. independent um, filmmakers. Yes. And you also had um, uh, people, you know, the uh, rock video film directors uh, were, be- were becoming very hot. All of a sudden, David Fincher, people like that. At that, that same time, yeah. you had, you know, Fincher and, and the whole rock video world, and then the, the Sundance, um, Steven Soderbergh's. And that, I think that is one of the reasons why those of us who, the directors for Roger at the time didn't, re, you know, weren't really seen in, in the same way as all the, the directors who had done all those great movies for Roger in the 70s. Mm. 
Um, so, uh, um, what was your question? My uh, the transition. So I. So it seemed like TV. So was... TV, you know, um, there were great scripts and great actors, and like one of the first things I did was was Chicago Hope, and to work with a cast like that was amazing. I, um, and to you know work with David Kelly scripts. I mean, this, this was really good stuff. And it all kind of, um, as I said to you outside, it's my, my resume is very weird because I've got horror movies, I've got dramatic television, I've got you know teenage television, I've got documentaries. Mm. Um, I, I guess I'm lucky in that I've been able to pursue all the things that I'm interested in, but I don't, I'm not, you know, I don't have a brand, as they say. I'm right, branded right. myself. But it must have been exciting coming into Tales from the Crypt because, I mean, I, like, I remember as a kid, you know, we had HBO. I, we were fortunate enough to have it. And that was just like, just at the, for me, the right age, the right time. That was the show that was made for me. I, I did not grow up with the generation that got to read the Tales from the Crypt uh, or, you know, the Vault of Horror comic books or anything. I got to see the show on HBO, and I remember it, it just... It was just huge. It was a mm. huge, huge deal. So you know, what you know, you you stepped in uh, for season five, right? Uh, uh, what do I got it right here. Season five, episode four, Food for Thought with Ernie Hudson and Joan Chen. That's right. I'm madly in love with because I love Twin Peaks. Yep, me too. Uh, so I mean, Kimmy was, was in uh, Leprechaun too. Oh, yeah, that's from, right. Yeah, it's yeah. Kimmy, yeah, from, from Twin Peaks. Yeah, from Twin Peaks, yeah. So, uh, I mean, so at that point, you know, this is season five, five seasons into the, the show. Like, was it, what was it like stepping into it? I mean, intimidation, that sort of thing? Yeah, or? well, um, you know, uh, season five, Robert Zemeckis was no longer directing the episodes <laughs> for this. You know, they were, they, were, they were moving on to Rodman Flender. Yeah. So, um, but, but it was a great opportunity, and it was one of those things where someone had dropped out. I don't remember why, but it was the kind of thing where I got to call on a Thursday, and they said, can you start shooting Monday? Mm -hmm. And one of the great, you know, th things learning, working for Roger Corman, that training is thinking fast, thinking on your feet, yeah. um, making movies for Roger. You can solve any problem any way except throwing money at it. Mm. You know, you really, <laughs> that, that, that is the one solution um, you don't have is money. Any mm -hmm. other, you know, yeah, and it forces you to really kind of look at the script. So um, when they said, can you start shooting Monday? I said, yeah, yeah, you know, piece of cake. Um, and I guess they, you know, uh, liked what I did cause they, they asked me back and I think that's when I was doing Leprechaun. And then, um, I came back after Leprechaun and I did, um, I wrote and directed one called 99 and 44, 100% pure horror with which Willard, had, Bruce Davison. Which has um, to be a, is that a, um, isn't there a John Fra Frankenheimer movie that has a similar title? Yes, 99 and 44, 100% dead was, okay. and it, and that, and that is a riff on something that is before any of our time, which was the ivory soap campaign mm -hmm. in like the, in like, you got to be 99.44 pure. Is that it? Yep. It was, it was, it was, it was, <laughs> it was the I just, I remember their song. You got to be as pure as ivory. Well, well that, yeah. uh, that's a campaign that goes back to like, you know, 1722 or something mm -hmm. was wow. you know, 99, 44, 100% pure. Eternal. Right. Yeah. Been here <laughs> since the beginning of time. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, um, so, and Tales from the Crypt, man, when I walked on that set of Tales from the Crypt and I saw a ceiling, I couldn't believe it. I was like, what? They've got a set, huh. a ceiling? Yeah. I was having, you know, I'd only That's done Roger fancy. Corman things. Yeah. And, you know, uh, Roger Corman thing, I mean, the, the Unborn, the, the reason why I did my second movie for Roger was because um, right before The Unborn was a science fiction movie. I can't, I, I can't remember which one it was. It was a spaceship or something. And Roger didn't want to tear down the set because The Unborn was a contemporary house, you know, contemporary movie and he wanted to shoot another sci-fi movie i think it was like lords of the deep or something on uh -huh. the, on the same spaceship set yeah so i was out of a job because i had already given up my head of production job and i couldn't afford to take the time off so i i said roger let me write something for you and i pitched a couple of stories huh. for him and he liked in the heat of passion i wrote it and uh i think it was like the second week of shooting the unborn he was looking at the dailies and he figured okay you know i'm not uh, as incompetent as some of the other people. <laughs> and he said, okay, go do In the Heat of Passion right after The Unborn. So it was a lot of the same crew, Wally, yeah. you know, same, uh, rolled right into that back to back. And we couldn't, there were no ceilings. Uh, the, in the Heat of Passion was about a, a guy from the barrio who has a, a, a dangerous affair with a very, very, you know, wealthy, dangerous woman played by uh, Academy Award nominee, Sally Kirkland. Uh -huh. It was great. But um, when we shot the scenes uh, for the guy who lived in the barrio, the poor section, look great. We just pulled garbage out of the trash in the alley. That was our production. Just, you know, it was just garbage. It was great. But then when we had to do the wealthy woman, you know, in the, in the, in the uh, you know, Bel Air home or something, we had a 
like a painted two by four and it was like supposed to be this high society party. And I just remember the guy, the, the uh, art director just had like a, a plastic container of nudes and cottage cheese that wasn't even like <laughs> Greeked out. I was like, come on. So um, you, you can't, it's hard to do wealthy on a very, right. very, very low mm-hmm. budget. So we, we had nothing. So when I got to Tales from the Crypt, I was like, you know, ceilings and, and that show just looked amazing. Rick Boda, fantastic DP. Um, I was, you know, I had, it's like I had died and gone to heaven when I got to do that show. Mm-hmm. Uh, the production value was so high. Huh. And, uh, you know, Joan Chen working with these, these uh, wonderful, wonderful yeah, actors. Yeah. It's a good episode. And I, so. Ernie in particular gets to be kind of a, a, a bastard in it, which <laughs> is not what we know him from in uh-huh. the Ghostbusters yeah, yeah. movies and other stuff. Um, so uh, I, I want to touch on, I mean, I'm, let's touch on Idle Hands because uh-huh. that's definitely, it's weird. It's weird because I, I don't remember... Um, you know, I don't remember exactly the reception for it when it initially came out. Like, I don't know if it was a hit or there not. Was or, no re- there was no reception for it. But, pro- it, but it, it is one of the, it's kind of like everyone I know. It was I flushed know, down the toilet when it came out. It, 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 it had the, the horrible, you know, it's just, you're at the, <laughs> you're at the mercy of so many things. A lot of people think that, that I forget who, who told this name. When, when you direct, a lot of people think that directors have complete control. Everyone wants to direct because you have control. <laughs> the truth is you're at the mercy of, of everything. You're at the mercy of hair. You're at the mercy and you're at the mercy of timing. And, um, Idle Hands had the tragic, um, uh, time, r- release time, um, right around when the Columbine tragedy happened. That's what it was. Okay. And, uh, it it just it got swept up in this whole political shitstorm at the time, and it, it it was you know it was a national tragedy, and um, uh, people were saying oh you know um uh, I think it was a uh, Joe Lieberman at the time said uh, it's movies like Idle Hands that contribute <laughs> to a climate where Columbine can take place, and it got right. caught up in this wow. whole argument as you know the response you know the media and what and what does it mean and. It, you know, I, it's, I don't want to get into a whole, like, you know, political discussion, uh, but if you're talking about, like, uh, you know, violence inspiring people, a movie about pot smoking zombies, you know, I don't know if that right. is, is, right. Is, is the right movie to have an intelligent conversation about it. It's but, funny, I saw it in New Zealand and, and it didn't have that same burden probably on it. It felt, because I remember, because uh, how many years later is Final Destination for Divin? About a year or two. About a year. Yeah, it's it's close. Years. I remember yeah. having seen Idle Hands, and I mean, I remember it being quite a hit there, hmm. and maybe Australasia in general, and it did really well. And everyone thought, oh, this is a really playful, fun movie. And then when he came, then he eats in Final Destination. Oh, it's the guy from Idle Hands. Yeah. So I don't think, even though it was still the tragedy bleeds over to other countries, but it's not the same as right. when you're in yeah, America. Yeah, as in America, know? yeah. Oh, Just no. like 9 11. Yeah, you can't I don't get away from that. No, I mean, that was devastating yeah. at the time. It was absolutely devastating. Yeah. And nobody wanted to see anything that had anything to do with any kind of violence yeah. in, a, in a high school. And we had the high school dance scene and all that. So um, so it never really, I don't know, it, it, hmm. it, it never really had a chance. So years later, um, people looked at it and said, this is a god-awful movie. It rips off other movies and, and it stinks. <laughs> yeah. uh, Rodman Flinders should have his... DJ card taken away from. I mean, these are you know. So people were Are able you talking to, about like IMDb message boards, which don't mean anything. Oh yeah, yeah. So yeah, yeah. Well, so, yeah. so it, it was great that people could slam the movie without the baggage of a <laughs> national tragedy. Let, let, let them but, slam but it so on many, its own terms. Yeah. Well, so many of the '90s films that we'll get to, beyond the artistic and interesting ones that pop up here and there, because there are a lot of classic movies in the '90s. But there's also post Scream and almost post Craft. Right, they they right. are. They all, to me, start to bleed together in this kind of very neutral uh, teens running around being slashed, not showing, no real nudity, and a lot of implications, but no real payoff like the '80s. And right. then, set, but I think Idle Hands really does stand out, and it does uh, because it's '99. It really does usher in the early 2000s, yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Final Destination, movies like that. But it's so it's so playful and fun and strange. It is kind of our lucky manish. Now that you're talking about our lucky man. It's kind of random. Some of the humor is, <laughs> I mean, when the guys come back, it, it doesn't go s- seek to explain, oh, how did they come back? Right. I, it, was yeah. Yeah. it just goes I with love it. That, yeah. Actually, yeah, yeah. No, it's a lot of fun. And you know what? I, I, I Because I just watch it, you know, obviously now a lot of our, our listeners and people are getting into the Halloween spirit and wanting to watch stuff. And, and I don't know why I forgot that it took place around Halloween, but I did. And I mean, you know, right away I was like, oh, man, this is like 
kind of my like the perfect Halloween ish movie. To oh, because the two characters blend in when they walk down the street. Right, everyone's dressed, yeah, and so they're, they're just yeah, like, yeah, all right, yeah, I got yeah. my yeah. no head. Yeah, and the two parents are in the you know in the the Jack yeah. Lantern setup. So well, we, when we met movie. outside of um, Chainsaw, and Rob will tell you, and I'm, I'm very honest about it. He introduced you to me to you, and he said, oh, you directed Leprechaun too, and it's nothing personal against Leprechaun. I just don't know those <laughs> movies that well. Oh my god, you know, honestly, that's kind of funny because my reaction was kind of flat, and I was like, oh, cool, cool, and nice to meet you. And then a couple seconds later, he goes, oh, you also. Somehow, idle hands come. I was like, "Oh my god!" Honest, <laughs> idle hands. That's the fantastic. No, honest, one. Elric. You said that to my face. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You yeah. said to me, "You just, you, you just went from just the guy. You. you just went from the guy who directed yeah. Leprechaun Two to the guy who directed Idle Hands." Yeah. Yeah. I didn't write, suddenly he's so, a Tarantino of the conversation. Yeah, yeah, so. I was very excited. So uh, that was, no, it's funny because I mean, that's a, that. I think that's the thing that's fascinating is that it has acquired this kind of like. Um, I don't know. People people seem to dig that movie a lot. I know I do. And that's it's, actually the opening of the Wikipedia page right now. Is like though critically penned, it's now become a cult <laughs> film. Yeah. No, and, totally, yeah. totally. Also, Devin Sawa is a, is a real um, find in that film. Yeah, his comic ability with his body is is the best for, since Bruce Campbell and Evil Dead too. From right. that point, oh, yeah. and there's yeah, a lot yeah. of similarities too. Of course, yeah. but yeah. he's really good, and, and everyone's really good. But he really holds the whole movie together in a ridiculous. Like, Which, what should be ridiculous? Like, right. when he's trying to get the girl and his hands, like, you know, well, acting like, against himself. Like what we were saying earlier about John Voight and Anaconda. I mean, uh-huh. he threw himself, literally threw himself yeah, physically into it, yeah. you know, 200%. Yeah. Um, he's fearless. Yeah. Completely yeah. fearless. And it uh, paid off because he's also great in Final Destination. Yeah, I, yeah. I, I've often, he's one of those few actors from that period that I actually missed. Most of them I just don't care because they're all these kind of like teen people from Dawson's Creek or from those shows. But he was one of yeah, the he few was really good in who both those I films. would actually look for and I go, ah, oh, it's a shame. I, I, I hope. And I know he's acting now and, and it'd be good. To, I, I, I mm-hmm. wanted to see him in more stuff because he really is had a good presence. You know? and, and I mm-hmm. mean, I told you before, but I mean, Jessica Alba will never be <laughs> hotter yeah. than she is in Idle Hands. That's like her at her, you know, peak. Yeah. Were concerned. you now? Were you married when you were directing all these things? Like, uh, I still am. Party five. That's incredible. <laughs> you, you, I still you traversed am. all my crushes, and you stayed married. Yes. Well done. Yeah. Well done, sir. Well done for you. Uh, now, uh, well, let's uh, let's talk a little bit about nineties. Can, can I just call my wife right now? Can you can you tell her that? <laughs> I'll tell her. Yes. Congrats you. on getting through all this. Uh, now, uh, and I, I guess that answers. I guess for me. Not knowing, I didn't know the story about Columbine. So I, I was always like, oh, I wonder why they didn't have a sequel to that film. But now right. that explains it, I guess. it. Now, was it a hit on video and DVD um, comparatively? It, I mean, it, 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 um, it may, ha- I don't know. I'm, I'm really the wrong person yeah, yeah. to ask <laughs> yeah. um, because the whole, because <laughs> the head the whole, of marketing is a very boring guest. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, um, it, it, frankly, I mean, the whole kind of experience was, it was, it was hard at that right. time. You know, it was just, it was a, it was a tragedy and it was difficult to, 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 um, you know, be kind of a you know swept Did you up into a conversation. Do you start yeah. to buy that shit, like, like you know oh, when I've people done something. Yeah, do you start buying it, or you're on the other side firmly where you're like that's total horseshit. Was it, was I the third gunman at Columbine? Yeah, no. I mean, I mean, do you, do, you, do what I, did no. you think during that? Uh, I, I thought it was a shame that um, that the movie just cannot be judged on its own merit that that right. it, that it is being used um, by politicians for you know for for their own agenda because these people yeah. hadn't even seen the movie and i right, think if anyone yeah. had the movie hadn't come out yet no one had seen it uh, but it was just like oh hollywood and that is why you know we have all this violence because these movies that don't you know it, it is it is hollywood and these movies yeah. that are doing it. and i i think you know I, I like i said i don't really want to get into a whole political you know mm-hmm. i think i think the the religious thing was tough enough so if i don't want to get into a whole political <laughs> um well i mean and, it, and we all probably think similarly uh, yeah i mean i saw tarantino last year right around django oh we yeah i mean just like how many more times do i have to answer that but that was good and, and i really I, I really liked that interview that that the way he just it just was enough like no i'm done Sorry I'm guys, answering this question. is just it's bullshit. Stupid, yeah. It's no, silly. There's, you know, we've had we've had we've had blood warfare and religious wararfare since the beginning of time. Yeah, yeah, right. Right. As soon as there's two humans, there's people killing each other. You I know, went it's to not the Django movies. premiere, and he actually talked about it at length here yeah. in LA about it. And yeah, it was just very much like the fact that they were saying my film caused this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it was it was just very kind of yeah. like it's, right. it's pointless. And, yeah. and 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 where do you stop? Do you stop? Do you ban Catcher in the Rye because right. you yeah. know the inspired, Bible? Yeah, the, the, yeah. <laughs> I think that might have inspired a few acts of violence just over a couple, the, the, the thousands I mean, of years. Yeah. 
So um, I've never actually understood the catcher in the rye one, to be honest. I, having read the book, I remember always being surprised about how many gunmen had had that and not. I, I, he's kind of an outsider, but I never understood the psychopathic also yeah. side of that. Does anything? No, like, and that's he's, one and of he's the actually quite a like. I don't know. I've never really he's very understood much that. Like, right. He's like a very lethargic character. He yeah. just—it's all about movement with no action. Yeah. Well, it's and, yeah. yeah. It's Hol- Holden Caulfield talks about phony balonies. Yeah, phonies. Yeah. He's, there's a lot right. of time, anger at phonies, and yeah. I think. And that's um, where you're right, but you can't, you know. Yeah, it's, you it's, can't act on it. I, I and your audience probably, um, I don't know how many uh, <laughs> people listening to this are, are thinking, "Wow, these guys have a point." I mean, right, they're listening. What's, well, what, the, what's, what's that the gag? Do, yeah. What's the gag in? I'm sorry, I just have to bring it uh-huh. up because because that's the thing. It's like it, I find it amazing that like this is the type of movie that gets like you know you know uh, unfairly picked on in in lieu of Columbine. Where what's the gag about like smoking? What is it? Oregano mixed with something, and it'll get like oregano and cinnamon or something like that. I can't remember exactly <laughs> what it was. And the only reason I mentioned is because I love that he actually tries it. Uh-huh. And there's a moment when one of the, when Seth, I think Seth Green's character gets killed. He's like, I can't believe you told me to smoke that shit. Right. <laughs> and I just, I'm like, how can you not have fun? And, and how can you yeah, possibly take this seriously? It's, and it's a comedy first before yeah. it's a horror film. That's the other silly thing to, for people to react to, you know? Yeah. Well, like I said, I, I actually, I, I don't know how many of the people at that time had seen the movie. Right. right. Probably very few. Um, and it's, uh, you know, and I, you could take I, a few shots from any film and be like, oh, pretty look, much. there's a hand killing everyone, a teenager at a pulp, at a, at a dance or whatever. Yeah. Mm, yeah. Right. That's inj- now, uh, how did that affect you beyond just the film career wise? Did that make it very hard for a period or did you have to kind of reinvent what you were doing? Uh, you ever heard a phrase called director's jail? Uh-huh. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> uh, it was, it was, sucks. yeah, it was, it was hard. It was, it was really hard. I, um, uh, completed a documentary uh-huh. that I started working on before Idle Hands called Let Them Eat Rock, uh-huh. which is a documentary about a uh, rock band, The Upper Crust, who, um, Rob, you heard of those guys? They, they, they're out of Boston, and they dress like 18th century European noblemen and play ACDC-like rock and wow. roll about being very wealthy. Yeah. It was, um, <laughs> yeah. I, I had studied documentary filmmaking um, as an undergraduate at Harvard uh, with Ed Pincus and, and Ross McElwee, yeah. who, who made yeah, Sherman's yeah, March. And, one of the best films ever made. Yeah. I, love, I think that film's hilarious. Yeah, and, and Ross remains... Um, it's funny, you know. Time and Definite sort of, is a yeah, great film. All, really great. All of his movies are yeah. great. I just, I just had lunch with Ross last week, and it's funny. Roger Corman and Ross McElroy are kind of the yeah. two ends of, of and so some of that Venn diagram is, is, yeah, is me cool. in there. Um, well, very personal. He, so, he, he definitely always put himself at the center of his films. Right, which right. I love. Oh, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's autobiographical film yeah. making completely. Uh, so I'd, um, got, I'd finished this documentary, and I played a few festivals and sort of continued... Uh, uh, TV work and um, I, I, you know, I was able to keep working. My TV work sort of kept going mm-hmm. uh, and uh, wrote a few things and you know, here I am. Did it change how, you're, how you felt about horror, like in terms of your interest in doing more of it? Did it, did it affect just how that, that experience? Okay, I was gonna. I'm gonna put this shirt on now. Not, okay. not, <laughs> not one bit. I love horror. Yeah. I go. I go see. Uh, I still go see horror movies opening weekend. What are some? I let's love, talk about what you've been watching. Love the genre. Like. Love. Um. No, not at all. I think. Mm. Uh, I think it's an important genre. And when an intelligent horror movie is made, um, I, I just I couldn't be happier. Mm-hmm. Even, even even when a stupid one is made, and if it's fun and if it's engaging, yeah, great. You know. Mm-hmm. Um, He's gonna love know. Housebound, right? He is. This, this New Zealand horror see. comedy, you're gonna love yeah. it. Horror Housebound. comedy from New yeah. Zealand coming out this year. It's a festival kind of film, and it's, it's phenomenal. It's almost pitch perfect in terms of comedy and horror, the mixture. And that's I liked rare. pitch perfect. I mean, that's a, that was <laughs> yeah. that was good too. Um, so great. So yeah. So definitely, still still love the genre. Um, and uh, we'll we'll see. You know, I, I listen to some of your recommendations. Uh-huh. Some mm-hmm. of them I agree with. Some of them, yeah. like, what the. F- what is really like? Thinking. <laughs> Which was he like? I want to know our bad ones. Yeah, yeah. I'll tell you off the air. <laughs> <laughs> I really think it's bad form for for directors to diss other directors. Right, right. 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 Uh, well, let's talk a little bit about unless the, they're uh, dead, and then I'll <laughs> piss all What's your least head. favorite dead director? <laughs> least favorite dead director? Ooh, um, wow, that's a that's a that's a that's a tough one. 
Um, you can tweet it later. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I want to know later. Uh, let tweet but let, later. Let, let's set the scene a little of the we 90s, 90s because we, we were talking okay. about just general. And I don't I assume because you were working in the industry at that period, were you also watching a lot of the new stuff while you were making stuff like Idle Hands? Or were you watching like Scream and like, do you remember seeing those kind of movies? Oh, sure. And I loved and I read this. I read uh, the script of Scream when it was uh, when it was still called Scary Movie. It was originally uh, yeah. called Scary Movie. And that those first whatever was 20 pages yeah. as a script yeah. before it came out. I remember I got, I got the script and I was standing in my kitchen and I did not put it down. Yeah. It was just like page, page, turning the page, turning the page. Uh, I, I thought, I thought that I thought those first 20 pages were just so brilliant. It, 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 it's so good. It's like hard to recover. I mean, much like when a stranger calls that first. Right. Yeah. Was well, it scooped up so. straight away? So if you're reading it in the kitchen, there's obviously some other directors reading in the kitchen. How quickly do you think that oh, yeah, went Wes from... Craven is reading it. <laughs> did he get, did he get like... it quickly or do you think <laughs> oh, it went yeah. through was other it people? Like no, they I'm went sure. to him first or did it go Probably. to like a bidding war? Uh, he, he didn't want to do it initially if I'm... Because he did I Vampire in Brooklyn the yeah. year before. He read it and liked it but didn't want to do it and I don't know how it came back to him. But it seemed like a script that floated around... For a short period of time. Yeah, it may have kicked around a little bit. And, yeah. you know, yeah. having Wes Craven, I mean, that gets it made when you have... Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, right, right. Um, so, uh, so yes, definitely aware of Scream. Mm. Um, and, uh, you know, so when we were making Idle Hands, Sony at that time, uh, sort of in, in, in the wake of Scream, uh, they were doing... Um, it, it was funny, there were all these uh, kind of teen movies. Some of them weren't even horror, like um, uh, The Dangerous Liaisons, mm-hmm. um, Oh, oh, the, the teen movie, uh, God, the Cruel Intentions. Cruel Intentions. Cruel Intentions. But they all had the same yeah. kind of cast. Yeah. It was they done at the same they time. They all had the same poster of one person in front and mm-hmm. then like a tiered people yeah. standing black. behind yeah, them yeah. all wearing black. Yeah, you're black. right. Yeah, they all right. the way through Disturbing Behavior, Urban Legend. Urban yeah. Legend. I know you're doing Urban Legend. Legend. Last Summer. Last summer. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Disturbing Behavior. Um, yeah. Go was made right around yeah. that time. But Go was fun. Go was fantastic. Go is different than all. Just like Auto Hands is different. Go is different in the same way. It was very strange. The humor is really great. Yeah. That gay couple is just phenomenal. Like you're watching these two cops and you have no idea. And then Amazing. suddenly yeah, that yeah. was a great twist. That's a great film. I haven't seen that in a long I love time. Go. Scott Wolf and, and Jay Moore, the gay uh-huh. couple. Yeah, yeah. That's, when, it was um, so good though. When, Timothy uh, when Scott is, uh, he's, he's like burying a body and Jay Moore's like kind of talking him through yeah. like an acting <laughs> exercise. And he's like, you're, you know, whatever it is, you're on the beach. And, then, yeah. and, and, and Scott was sort of, sort of going along with it for a minute. And then he just looks up and he goes, I'm not delusional. And yeah. it's just, just fantastic. Yeah, so no. yeah, so there, were a lot, there were a lot of good uh, movies. Movies, not necessarily horror, but within right. that sort of, you know, hitting that audience yeah. um, at that time. Do you remember seeing, I mean, there's <clears> some, obviously there's big classics we have uh, from, you know, things like Jacob's Ladder, Misery, Nightbreed, well, Candyman. Right, so, I so, mean, so we were talking about the turning point. So you were yeah, saying that a lot of stuff that came out in 1990 mm-hmm. was technically movies made in the 80s. Yeah, like no, like I'm just saying that people, if the they want to continue, yeah, if they the want to, if people want to say, oh, some of the best stuff was made, still made in the 90s. It's like, it just, all I know is I look through year by year and I started with like 20 pretty good films in 1990. And then it goes to five decent ones in 91. And then it's about five more. And then it's five, four or five. Yeah. Mm-hmm. A- a- each year, it seemed a little less until yeah, 96. Time, 96. 96 is, is like a renaissance with around Scream. And yeah, suddenly Scream there's... Scream reboot. Yeah. And, yeah, then, and then when you get to the end, it really yeah, dropped. Yeah, 95, there was like maybe... I remember I was yeah. looking on Wikipedia today and it was like the list was slowly getting shorter. And by the time 90 got to like 94, 95, it was like 20 films. Well, the watchable movies of 95, mm-hmm. The Addiction, which I think is a great <laughs> film, but yeah. it's an indie. Demon Knight, which is a fun Tales from Crypt. Lord of mm-hmm. Illusions, Lord which of is Illusions. a, you know, a fun... But but not quite up to Clyde this is Barger. 95? Yeah, mm-hmm. Prophecy. And then you're going with the big films, which is a big, what part of the trend is going to Species. Movies like that, species, like these yeah. big yeah. Uh, Tales from the Hood, obviously. And, but then what was Wes Craven doing in 95? Vampire in Brooklyn. You know, a, a borderline, almost unwatchable comedy. I mean, to me, it just doesn't work at all. Yeah, but, uh, but, but that what's the, what's the to me, in that chunk between 90 and 96? Because mm-hmm. Scream is kind of the turning point. Mm-hmm. What's the stuff that sends out? Like Candyman was, what, 92? I mean, can, uh, yeah, of Candyman that decade, it's the, is, it's the best film of yeah, that decade. That but. Candyman's by far yeah, one yeah. of the best of the 90s, for sure. Candyman, uh, Candyman is 92. 92. So it's still early. I um, mean, People Under the Stairs was 91, so that's like even... Yeah. But that wasn't Craven. good. No, no. <laughs> I'm saying like, this is where Craven was. <laughs> well, it's interesting. And I'll, I'll, I wrote yeah, down... you went right to Shocker and People Under the Stairs yeah. and that I kind sometimes of like, like to come up with theories and I wrote down a theory for you. You have guys. a theory. I have yeah. a theory. <laughs> right? uh, because they're close together. I was saying, I, I was wondering if they'd ever been paired together, uh, Candyman and People Under the Stairs. And what I realized about these two films when I stopped for even a second to think about uh-huh. is that they are uh, the exact same movie, but inverses of each other. Uh, Candyman is about uh, basically privileged 
upper class educated white people going into a poorer black neighborhood and exposing through the, through the interaction with the film, they expose a white crime of slavery from the past and they expose what happened to the candy man. Uh, the other film is urban, poorer black two people going into a white privileged neighborhood and exposing a white crime of slavery again, because they find that people have been kept on. Unsta- so they are literally taking genius. I'm a genius. So professor, I, I know, but they're, and this is, this was when I was looking through all these titles today, I realized they're exactly the same thing right. in terms of uh, directors who, and look, Wes Craven's a very uh, good human who, who has a very good firm understanding of mythology and stories and probably has, you know, is probably trying to say something with his movie. And, uh, you know, Bernard Rose is a great filmmaker. I don't know what Clive was saying, but those two films I realized are you really, the end point is almost the same, but the execution is quite different. <laughs> That's a good, yeah. uh, but you know, it was, it was just interesting how McGill, close they get. The other yeah, is yeah. not. Ving Rhames, <laughs> uh, that <laughs> shirt Ving Rhames is wearing is criminal, but, uh, but you know, and so at least they were trying to go for something, which right. I really respect. And, and especially something that's kind of <laughs> a big thing to kind of go about this, like slavery. But you know, we're, everyone thinks that just came about this last year with 12 years of slave. But right. you know, people are, are toying with it about that. But then the things like misery, you know, misery, yeah. misery is 90. Yeah. You, 1990, 90, yeah. uh, what year was Blair Witch Project? That was, uh, that's that was 90. 90. Yeah, that's what yeah. Yeah. Was and that, and that what's interesting about that, that's kind of the period. I, to be honest, I think I remember that year almost better than any Blair Witch 99? Was 99. audition. Yeah, I wrote oh. that Blair too. Witch. Yeah. House on Hunted Hill, Sixth Sense, Idle Hands, Sixth Sense, Star of Echoes, Ravenous, Lake Placid. All movies I, I remember. Yeah. What about Body Parts? Oh, well, that's early. I love that film. What was um, that, early 90s? That's 93. 93. Uh, mm-hmm. Eric Red's Body Parts. Yeah. And that, that for me was a big uh, video film that I, I watched a lot of times. Yeah. See, I said the basketball that. Basketball legs. Terrific the little legs movie. running with the basketball. And 98 and 99 were the big game changers because it happened right at the end of the decade because mm-hmm. the two things that we start seeing then, we see Blair Witch in 99 and in 98 oh, yeah. was when we see Whispering Corridors. And that was like the first kind of like Asian film that had oh, creeped right, over right. here mm-hmm. that people were like really paying attention to. I remember seeing that like my sophomore year of college and it being like oh my gosh i just got this film from korea it's crazy and watching whispering corridors and then in 99 actually was um Vi- uh, tome came out and then there was i think 99 was also ringu what about was audition it? yeah was it was 98 audition was, was 99. 99. 99 and so that's right when these asian right. films start kind of coming over and making an appearance here and if i remember but they hadn't made waves yet because the teen stuff was holding so strong yeah. like people were interested in it because it was a great movie right but the if you look at 98 it's the worst it's like well the faculty is oh, actually fun mm-hmm. but it's like a halloween h2o i still know what you did last summer yeah. That's urban legend but I never even thought because you know? the original ringo is 98 Whereas mm-hmm. it's like, it seems like the Asian market was what led us into the 2000s. But there was, I, I remember that there was some type of embargo on Ringu where like as soon as it had come out in Japan, it was purchased by the studio yeah, over here and they had put like an embargo on it being Makes released sense. here. Cause I remember watching a bootleg version of it in like 2000 cause I was still in college and I remember seeing like a bootleg VHS and it hasn't been released here. And it was like way undercover cause I was I, working at a video store at the time. I haven't seen it in years, but I still think that original Japanese version blows away mm-hmm. the American remake. I, I remember also I know liking the American, the American one. one. I, remember, but, I remember it being good, but the but Japanese the original was much, yeah. really great. much scarier. But all these movies you're talking about, I mean, it's funny because you, you told me you want to talk about the 90s. For, I mean, in terms of like mo- movies that I think people are going to be talking about 20, 30 years from yeah. now, from the 90s, I think there are two. Mm-hmm. Jacob's Ladder. Yeah, Jake, yeah, yeah 1990. Yeah, which captures New York like no other movie. I think it's like Adrian Lyons' mm-hmm. masterpiece because he really, it's I mean, great. that kind of, yeah. that, that, that New York of that time um, and the kingdom, Lars von Trier's yeah, yeah. original oh, The right, Kingdom, right, yeah. which yeah. I don't know if you if, if you had the I, I, I saw it. Um, they screened it as one six hour movie. No, I've never at, seen at, that. At, the, at, <laughs> at the New Art, and I got to tell you, it went by like ninety minutes. Yeah. When wow. you see something like that I, I, on when the big was it, screen, I was pitching that. What episode? You mentioned it two two episodes ago, I think. Yeah, I was yeah. pushing hard because it really has some of the most unusual stuff, and it's really genuinely scary at it, certain points. There, and you know, funny. Stuff. Yeah, it's both. It's brilliantly it's acted, best. funny. But I, you know, I think there's a few things. I mean, there's. Uh, I mean, I definitely. Well, it depends. In terms of comedy, there'll be people like oh, Tremors and all these kind of people night love breed, Tremors. Uh, night misery is you know a kind of. Uh, but Gremlins brain dead. too. Gremlins dead alive. Too, dead alive. Yeah, dead yeah. alive. Brain dead is one of the best. Jackson kind. Uh, Francis Coppola's Dracula, obviously, for the big I like that movie a lot. Frighteners. Frighteners is fun. You know, I like Dracula, too. The thing about Dracula is, is it a great Francis Ford Coppola movie? I don't think so, but what I like about it is it has a, for 
you know, being very pretentious. It has kind of a what I call a joie de film. Yeah, it's you know yeah, what I mean. Yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. It, 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 he it's loves very watchable, movies. very grandiose, very so fun. So much. Yeah. Yeah. It's just so much fun, and there's there's a real joy in that filmmaking, which you there. don't uh-huh. see when you see the trailer right now. If you turn on the TV and uh, not, I have no idea if it's going to be good. Of the new oh, Dracula about Untold? Dracula because the difference yeah, is yeah. there's no personal touch. It just seems epic. Frankenstein 3D, whatever well, the hell it was. Guy it's or just whatever, yeah. an epic I about a character with big scale. Whereas yeah. Francis Ford Coppola is like, I mean, Gary Oldman just, you know. Well, I mean, yeah, you got yeah. Gary terrific. Oldman. And, right. and, uh, but I mean, even in the in-camera tricks and like just the, the filmmaking at, at, at hand in something like yeah. Dracula. How's oh, Argento's yeah. Dracula? I just got it. I watched the first 20 minutes and I, uh, you know, really? oh, I, more rough, Mantis. Man. I, got a, I, got a 3D, I have a 3D TV and a 3D Blu-ray player. Yes, I've had it for three, four years. I've seen one 3D movie oh, on right. it. We'll, we'll talk after. Yeah, he's, he's, got, he's, got, he's got the hookup. <laughs> but what I'll say is if you scan this, I'm just scanning this list, yeah. there are th- the things that stand out of being really strong that will be remembered as classics tend to be things made elsewhere or independently. Uh, you, you, Delamore to Delamore, Cemetery right. Man, yeah. Ringu, uh, Hardware. Audition. Yeah, Hardware's in there somewhere. i um, trying to th- see what else... Uh, Kingdom. Oh, I see you have Army of Darkness listed in, what, 93? Yeah, mm-hmm. 93. That's interesting because Kronos, I remember yeah. going to see that to a very empty theater, mm-hmm. and yeah. that was not yeah. a success at all. But, I mean, you know, now it's funny because, you know, now that Halloween's upon us, I'm going to do an Evil Dead, like, marathon at some point. Right. But I just put on a couple of scenes from Army of Darkness the other day, and I've always said that Evil Dead 2 is, like, one of my favorites of all time. Yeah. But I, I think in terms of, and this is why it will be exciting to talk to Bob mm-hmm. if, if he ever comes on, mm-hmm. Murawski, in terms of directing and editing, Army of Darkness is probably one of the the best directed and edited Sam Raimi yeah. movies. Like yeah, watching yeah, yeah. it now in retrospect, it's really, really thoroughly entertaining. Yeah, yeah, oh. it's it's really fun. Uh, one of the big movies that really uh, made it very difficult for um, Rodman's career at a certain point, he was <laughs> struggling with The Unborn, and suddenly this little movie called Popcorn. Uh, sprung up in 1991, yeah. which, yeah. Um, no, I, but, but we do have some relevance that we might be uh, at a certain screening this coming Sunday. I, I remember this that. Coming, no, no, the following next Sunday. Sunday. I remember that next ad Sunday. campaign, buy a bag, go home in a box. Yeah, yeah. Go home right. in a box. Very, very, Love that movie. Uh, we'll yeah. have more details on our Facebook page. I always liked um, the late 90s, and I talked about this earlier, where, you know, that's when we were really pushing the holy shit, we can make a giant monster type thing. And the late 90s saw this very small resurgence of creature features just because we could do it. Yeah, like and Mimic that's and the Relic. Mimic, mm-hmm. Relic, Night Flyer, Dust Till Dawn, even Demon Knight entered into that. Bats, like Placid, Deep Rising. Um, They're these also were big all budget movies. Of, yeah, they, they these are. weren't the small, yeah. um, independently made horror that we all loved on VHS. This was stuff like The Relic and that. There are big action movies that are within them. Contain- I actually really love The Relic, yeah, Peter Himes. That That's actually one of my favorite of those. I have kind to of- revisit it. I remember the CG being a little off, and I, I had preferred Mimic, but I, I don't, you know, I haven't seen either since they yeah. came but out. But they were really big, and I think that was part of the shift was going towards these kind of big studio films mm-hmm. with more pressure to make more money. Also, and species. especially, well, by the end of the 90s, that's when we start getting into the Dark Castle pictures because House on Haunted Hill was right. 19. 99 and that's when we develop what i'll call twitchy technology Mm -hmm. or ooh, we can make you know jeffrey comes run at you skipping frames so that it looks william malone was good though like he i think he was before that trend and he was actually a great director i think he's a very strong he is good he was doing tales from the crypt yeah yeah yeah, yeah. too and he did some excellent ones do you have man bites dog on your list i didn't have it as car but you're right it's a great film yeah i'll say we missed a big one in 91 which is uh in terms of cult level but not mainstream begotten in terms of like what the hell is that right that's a that really stands alone that. Yeah, like and it he, became yeah. one of those sought after. Kind yeah, of. And, it, yeah. And, it, and it makes sense. That was, was that 94. was. It's funny you mentioned Begotten because that was, I think, the one DVD I bought because of the cover. I mean, I've yeah. since that was like yeah. the first one I bought because of the cover. I, I've since you know spent a lot of money on DVDs because mm-hmm. but, but kind of like what you were talking about, you know, renting a v, VHS with a big mm-hmm. clam. That I saw DVD that. is worth hundreds of dollars now because they did is a it? very limited yeah. run on DVD. Really oh. Because oh. Elias Mirhinge, who directed the film, right. hated the fact that it was on DVD because he thought it was much more true to the VHS tape. Oh. And um, so it did. This is the rumor. It could yes. be completely wrong. He did a very limited DVD run, and apparently it huh. didn't do very well. So it was <laughs> cut very quickly. Huh. So the DVD is worth like hundreds of dollars, and even the VHS tape. Like I have an original pressing VHS tape, and that's worth like ninety. No kidding. So yeah. I don't 
don't know who actually would pay that for it. There are many movies. That's on Amazon. Are my laser discs worth anything? I've got so many laser discs. So many laser discs. Do you have leather face? We know someone desperately looking for the leather face. Sex Chains of Three. You know, I might. Who? David Scout. I found it on eBay, but it costs a lot. So you're the other one. I have Let It Be on laser disc. And it's falling apart. It's got laser rot. No, I love my laser disc. I got it when I was in New York. NYU used to do these kind of um, equipment sales, I'll call them, where they would like this. They would sell off things that they weren't using anymore, like old cameras and things like that. And the students could come buy them. And I bought a laser display for like twenty five bucks at one of them. <laughs> I kind of want one too. I kind of <laughs> love mine. Oh, man. Now I have a question for all you guys uh-huh. in in regards to the late nineties. Uh, something that's just like impossible now because of things like Twitter and Facebook and all that. But uh, you had mentioned from Dust till dawn, mm-hmm. uh, and even something like the Sixth Sense. I thought I remember. Did any of you know what was going to happen in From Dust Till Dawn when you saw no, it? Because no. I did I not at really all. I just it. remember a That's friend right. of mine saw it before me and said, we have to go. I know you love Quentin's movies, but this one you're going to love. And like being blown away yeah. by the direction See, that I, the third act went in. And, like, I, and, I, and, and, the, and the same thing with The Sixth Sense. The Sixth Sense was that strange movie that for whatever reason, everybody that saw it before you would say, you just have to go see it. Whereas now, like everyone oh. fucking ruined it on yeah, Twitter yeah. or whatever. I saw and that. I, I saw that coming. The Sixth Sense. I gotta say, I saw that coming in the trailer. I did. I, I saw did the trailer on and Howard I just, Stern. Uh, yeah. Oh, before see, I saw it, and I, I, was so no, I didn't see it like that. That's what yeah. I wanted to see like that. And it worked for me. In terms of From Dusk Till Dawn, I have a cop. I have a copy of. Uh, Quentin's screenplay from Dusk Till Dawn printed <laughs> on a dot matrix printer. Wow. I think he sub- I think he must have submitted it to Roger. Uh, it was, early, I, my, was that his the first thing he'd written or it was it was early, uh, early, no, early because it was romance was, right? Yeah, true no, romance. No, no, Natural Born Killers oh, yeah, yeah, was yeah. the first thing he wrote in the true romance, and then from Dusk Till Dawn was actually Robert Kurtzman from K and B, who at least had the concept of it. Mm-hmm. And in oh, fact, if it? you go on YouTube, there's a pitch film of it. Where the Greco brothers played by uh, Joe Pilato oh, from wow. Day of the Dead. It's uh, I'm sure it's on YouTube <laughs> wow. that that Kurtzman directed. Once Tarantino got and Rodriguez got involved, they kind of took his idea and turned it oh, into what it, it became. Yeah, Interesting. from what I remember. But um, yeah, so it might be the Kurtzman script or maybe Quentin's first draft. Maybe, of maybe it was. It. That, that's like one of my most my most uh, prized possessions is, is the dot matrix printed yeah. <laughs> screenplay from. It's cool. From I mean, but that's on. you know, I still. I mean, I, I watch it maybe within the last year, and it's yeah. just such a quotable, yeah. amazing little movie. But right. I, again, I, I miss that thrill of going to see something and not having any clue. That you're expecting like oh, a yeah. pulp fiction yeah, movie, yeah. and then you get vampires, and you're like, "Whoa!" Okay. Yeah, to be truly surprised is pretty difficult, but you do have to kind of just give yourself a self blackout on yeah, yeah, yeah. press materials. I mean, yeah, there's other films. I mean, '94 we got um, John Carpenter's last really interesting film, In the Mouth of Madness. You know, right. last time he did something just that was really unique and fun and playful and and dark. Um, I'm also looking at the end of '97 with Funny Games and Lost Highway, where again you see that art house and farms that really was shocking yeah. and scary, but not what we traditionally think of as horror. Yeah, Lost Highway yeah. was uh, nightmarish. I, I remember <laughs> yeah. getting lost. I mean, we talked about it a few times on here, but anyone who would ever say to me, oh, it's the horror, it's like, well, uh, there's a moment in there where I'm more on the edge of my seat than I'd ever been in any movie and with the phone wow. call. The uh, first right. time, I remember sitting on the edge of my seat going, what is happening? The sound's gone, dip down. Oh, He's God. at a party, and suddenly they're in a wall of silence, these two characters, and there's a guy with no eyebrows talking to him, oh, handing God. him a phone. Before I knew Robert Blake, I didn't even, I, you know, this yeah, was yeah. pre-trial, pre all you know, and I, I was did. just in that moment. That yeah. was for me, because it, the language was so disconnected in mm-hmm. that whole movie, and it wasn't even just that, like, fucked up scene. I remember yeah. the, the cops walk in, and the cops are like, is oh, yeah, this yeah, yeah. your bedroom? This is our bedroom. And it was just the fact that you could have just this disconnected language like that that can exist on film. I thought that was just like only in theater. And yeah, it was very, it was a very, yeah, it was a very interesting film. I had to to share with you guys that lost highway scene you just referenced Mm -hmm. with the phone call. Somebody reshot that just that Uh one scene with a, a, I don't know if it's just digital stuff or whatever, but the Robert Blake guy has like almost this like enormous head and looks really fucking disturbing. Uh And uh, and that's it. He just reshot that one scene huh. as with this like as if a modern take of it, and it's really creepy. Huh. Just as creepy as the original. Weird. Is yeah. it in the movie or is this someone's theory that Robert Blake is a is a character that lives between the frames of the film? Oh, I remember interesting I, because I, of, because of the video because of the video that that huh. he's actually like a you know a, a being like um like Bob and Twin Peaks, you know, he's, he's yeah, one of these yeah. kind of beings, but he lives between the frames of film. And that's, yeah. I mean, do you know, of, have you ever seen uh, the pervert's guide to cinema? 
it's uh, Slavoj Žižek, the philosopher oh, from yeah. Eastern Europe. And it's, <laughs> it's amazing, it. but his stuff on Lost Highways, because he basically goes, you know, this is one person being torn into three. You have the id, the right. super ego. And so one is uh, the reality of the character who yeah. has to deal with something real. Like, I need to fucking kill my wife. That is when <laughs> that is when he needs help, and that's when the mystery right. man comes in. Mystery man's the part of himself that can't bring himself to murder his wife, so he brings in this other part of his persona to kill his wife. And mm-hmm. Balthazar Getty is the part where he reimagines himself. Well, what if I could go back? What if I could go back and be young and cool again? And oh, by the okay. end, okay. you can never have me. Even in his fantasy, he doesn't get the girl. Even in his fantasy, she cock blocks him and he fucking kills her again because he's in this fucking loop now because that's who he really is. That's mm. the real self. Bill Pullman's the real self. And it's it's fascinating. You see this philosopher throwing the in your guy. Oh, so many of Lynch's movies start to, and I'm sure Lynch wouldn't buy any of it. He'd go, this bullshit. <laughs> but, but, but this guy's perception and the birds is the other one. Right. He does an amazing thing <clears> on <throat> birds that... To me, is really fun just to watch someone yeah, throw yeah. out crazy ideas. What did you think of Inland Empire? Speaking yeah, of you know, I only saw it once in theater, and it didn't yeah. really work for me. And I think it, uh, there's a couple scenes in it that I thought were terrifying. Mm-hmm. But I think the reason it didn't work probably is because the lack of script. I think Lynch is able to go really far non-narratively because he has a very he has a script, and he is a very actually a very responsible filmmaker, and has delivered movies every time. So Inland Empire is shot without a fixed script over a course of five years. And I feel like that freedom actually weakened what to me was a film. But I'd like to see it again. But there uh-huh. are certain parts I really like. The, the Hollywood stuff I liked, some of the other stuff in Poland, right. just didn't, I didn't really connect And what do you think all. of David Lynch's coffee? It's phenomenal. Oh, it's I good, isn't it? it? It's yeah, not it's as good as amazing. Bob Marley's, though. I oh. will say. Bob Marley brand coffee. Mm-hmm. I, I kind Wait, of s- Bob Marley's deceased, isn't it? I drink Lynch he coffee. He has a Bob, Bur- he has his own coffee. I, swear, I, I, I like coffee? I sample. That's fantastic. <laughs> How do you have dead coffee? And I'll sample all of the different types at like Whole Foods. Intelligentsia is still one of my favorite. That's, that's my favorite. Good coffee. Yeah. Yeah. That's my that's favorite really stuff coffee, right now. But David Lynch Chicago. is pretty good too. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's um, up there. That's good stuff. But to quote uh, Sam Neill on Event Horizon, I am home. <laughs> that's a great moment. Oh, I mean, that's a good they, moment. You know, Event Horizon's another really f- yes. That yeah. that had some good freaky moments. Uh-huh. That was one where I didn't know what I was getting when I first saw it because right. the trailers definitely kind of played it more as a sci-fi film, and I remember going to see it kind of expecting like a you know a spaceship you know sci-fi ooh, right. something's going to go wrong with yeah. the ship how are we going to get off the ship thing because that was kind of one of the trends at the time was the sci-fi films and um then when people started eating themselves oh yeah i, I mean it's really like, where the fuck film. did that come from there's right. barbed wire on people except it's the ultimate false advertising because it made us think that other paul ws anderson films might be fun <laughs> <Right. laughs> that's the Sorry. only good one yeah. and event yeah. horizon do, i mean that do you think that influenced uh, sunshine at all yeah yeah i mean uh, i think so i mean i thought sunshine you know the first uh first two acts of sunshine i thought were actually it was probably my favorite film of the year and then the last act was kind of rubbish it, right uh-huh. it felt shoehorned in like oh suddenly it's a weird serial killer thriller it, right it didn't make sense but they started that film's amazing well it surprised me and yeah. i and, and i appreciated that yeah yeah no it's it's now, good it's i still film. put event horizon is one of the scariest films i've ever seen just because hmm. i didn't know what was coming and right. when i finally saw it i was like oh my god that fucked me up and i thought about it for days afterwards it was definitely one of my mm-hmm. more disturbing moments well that that's kind of what i was talking about earlier like for me with um you know uh, pink flamingos and, and oh lucky you know movies that that that, that sneak up on you and you don't expect them to be scary or uh, something that you know that is surprising exorcist 3 was 90s as yeah, well yeah, correct? yeah, yeah. That's, that's that was totally. another one that i another still one say that's 90 scariest the film ever. really i mean yeah. the old lady crying on the ceiling scary but Giants, yeah but there's that one this, this, there's just the that hall, one moment the jump yeah. scare it's, it's yeah. but again it's, it's having good scares. talent just like you were talking about with Brooke Adam when you have good talent when people like George C. Scott do enter these kind oh, of films yeah. uh, it really does elevate the material and that's why I think Sam Neill's always been so good in these small roles yep. he, he really can channel both charming and you know right. uh, antichrist as right. it were I, uh, you know, I totally forgot. I actually put a call out if anyone oh, had for some questions, any, yeah. any of our listeners yeah. had mm-hmm. any questions for you. So I have a couple, if you wouldn't mind entertaining some curiosities here. No. Uh, Ken Handling, uh, <laughs> okay. Fangorious Ken Handling, uh, would like to know, what's the story of the appearance of the offspring in Idle Hands? Was that a studio <laughs> idea or something that you brought to the table? Well, we had the, uh, the um, school dance scene was always in, in the script. And I wanted a real band. You know, I wanted... Um, I didn't want to have a DJ and I didn't want, and, uh, um, my other passion like yours is, is music and rock and roll. You know, mm-hmm. I, I, I'd done that documentary about, I was in the middle of doing that documentary about, uh, the rock band. And, uh, we just, you know, put the word out to, um, and the offspring had always, um, loved horror films as well. They, they, um, had some horror imagery and met with them and they were 
great and and great sports and allowed us to uh, to you know rip their lead, lead singer's scalp off. Yes. So yeah, that was always um, that was always a part of it. And to have them you know do a Ramones covers, you know, being a New York City kid, huge Ramones fan. Yeah. Got the Ramones license plate frame on my car. You know, that was uh, that was a real treat. You know, it's awesome. The one though, now I bet it maybe once or twice. I've met Joey Ramone at least wow. two occasions. Once at CBGB's because he used to go there all the time, yep. and I used to always go. But the one time I distinctly remember, I was with a friend, and we talked to him at Tower Records in hmm. Manhattan. And he, I mean, he was super. He's such a nice guy, but he was walking around, and he kept saying his list out loud to his head, so he wouldn't forget. And he kept saying, "I need that new Offspring record. I need that new Offspring <laughs> wow. record." So I, I saw him buy an Offspring record. Oh, so it's cool. kind of fun that Boy. they got to cover yeah. the Ramones in the movie. Yep. So that's awesome. Uh, let's see. Uh, Julietta Bott asks, uh, Hi, Julietta. <laughs> <laughs> what project was your favorite to shoot and why? And be honest, was the Crypt Keeper an a hole to work with? Um, <laughs> uh, the Crypt Keeper came and saw me in my trailer, and after that, um, we were friends forever. Uh, the, um, did you I, even shoot that stuff? I did not. That, that no, was shot no, separately. That, right? that was shot separately. I, I, I saw them shoot some of it. It was fascinating to watch. Um, well, what was the question? What was my uh, favorite? What was your favorite project to shoot? Oh boy, that that's an impossible question to answer. They're like your, like every director says, they're like your children. They're all they're, your all, kids. they're all your kids. Um, you know, I the first one is always, you know, the most special. Um so uh, you know, the very partial the unborn, very fond memories of the unborn because it was all so new. I was nervous, you know. Mm-hmm. Um but they're all they all have great things, you know, great memories for different reasons. Right. Do you have a favorite piece of advice from Charlie in Party <laughs> 5 to the other kids? <laughs> from uh, Elric on Killer Pete. Uh, <laughs> piece of advice from Charlie. Uh, uh, you'd have to ask, um, you'd have to ask Matthew Fox that question. Now, isn't he the killer in the latest Tyler Perry? <laughs> <laughs> uh, he looked pretty buff in that, I gotta say. Such a fan. I gotta say, it's pretty, he looked like he really good. <laughs> okay, sorry. Okay. Uh, just uh, Damon uh, uh, Brazel, uh, he wants to he just wants to know what it was like to work with uh, Warwick Davis on uh, Leprechaun. Oh too. yeah, we talked about this on the on the commentary. commentary. Fantastic. Yeah, I, I, w- one of the high points of of, uh, of of my career's work working with Warwick. I hmm. I said this, you know, I probably wouldn't, you know, I, I saw the first Leprechaun when they talked about the second one. I said, okay, is he he's, he's got to be a part of it, right? And they said, yes. Said, okay, I'm in. Um, uh, a delightful man, a wonderful actor. I was so happy when he did that, um, the HBO show, Life's Too Short, because yes. I always thought it was a shame that um, he couldn't do more work without all that makeup on his mm-hmm. face and all that, all that prosthetics. Cause he has such a wonderful face and such wonderful eyes and yeah. so expressive. Um, and he improvised and was fun. And a tr- I mean, that was a hard movie. It was Leprechaun. I mean, low budget, long hours, never complained, was, was, was just a joy to work with. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, uh, Jason LeBlanc, uh, just context here. Uh, one of the documentaries that Rodman made is Conan O'Brien can't stop, which is excellent. Very recent. Yeah. yeah. Yep. Uh, he wants Jason wants to know how often did Leprechaun two come up in conversation when working <laughs> with Conan O'Brien? He never stopped talking about it. It's his favorite <laughs> movie of all time. It was inspiring to him. And it's why he asked me to, uh, to join the tour and do the documentary. Cause he loves it so much. Right on. Um, is that true? No, <laughs> it's a total lie. It never came. I don't well, think how it ever did came you meet up. Uh, Conan actually. Uh, school we all went to school together oh, and um, uh, Conan was in one of my uh, student films oh wow, um, wow. and uh, um, yeah we we've, we've hmm. uh, remained friends mm-hmm. was that uh, was that did you learn a lot about I see a very different side of a person you already knew but through the course of going through that documentary well I always thought um, you know I I I, I always thought the, the the funniest Conan wasn't necessarily the Conan that you see on TV all the time he's got you know great writers and does brilliant work. Uh, I was at the, like on his show, kind of the, the remotes he does out in the world are all, he just shines on those yeah. and the, the sort of, you know, off camera cone and he would just sort of drop these, these comic bombs that were just hysterical. And that's kind of, I, I wanted to capture sure. that on film. So, you know, Hopefully I succeeded. Hopefully I, I gave people a little window into just how naturally and that was funny he is. During the period he was largely off air in the transition, right? I remember it coming out. Lar- right largely off air. He was he was banned. He yeah. could not be on okay, the air. So that, that, was, that, that, that was the name cool. of his tour, the legally prohibited from from oh, being on crazy. television tour. Um, they he could not huh. be on television. He couldn't be on the radio. He couldn't be on the internet. He was uh, contractually banned from everything except live. They didn't right. say anything about live, so that's why he went on. But tour. well paid for it. 
Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> well paid for the silence, yeah. Yes. Uh, uh, lastly, keep them coming. Come on, give me some. These are all yeah. softballs. Yeah, softball. Sorry, these are is, all softball. This is the last Becca, one. Give me a tough <laughs> question. Uh, give, give me a give me uh, one that's gonna like, you know, it's really gonna put me on the spot and is going to um, you know. Gosh, I'm so sorry. Why yeah. why why, why didn't you guys balls. get a little more? I know. During Millennium, there was uh, rumors <laughs> of a pregnancy scare with Lance Henriksen. <laughs> Some of it, true. Is, uh, All true. it is true. No, you did an episode of Millennium, and I, I don't, I haven't I been did. able to look up which one, but I, I really, I really liked the tone of that show. And what was that uh, whole world like? It's so funny you mentioned that because I, um, I, I had just um, sent that on to someone as a sample of my humorless, serious uh-huh. yeah, uh, yeah. horror it is very, And it was a very, very straight yeah, show. I right. mean, that was very serious. Right. And um, I, I was I was trying to track that episode down, and, and like there's like some millennium canon on the internet, and someone had said, uh, you know, uh, it was their favorite episode, and, and dozens of responses saying, are you, have you ever seen the show? Are you, <laughs> are you out of your mind? That is the Aww. one episode that should be, you know, burned and erased. Oh no! Why um, was that? It, it was. It was. Um, it w- was an episode about Native Americans early on, or in the it, second. It was season two. Uh-huh. Um, and, uh huh. And it uh, again a difficult show. A lot of night shooting. It all uh-huh. took place at night, which is hard. Um, we sh- uh, my episode took place in New York, and I had to shoot Vancouver for New York, which is hard for me being a New Yorker. Uh-huh. So, you know. Um, but it was, uh, yeah, tonally, I mean, it was, it, it is sort of like one of the most serious things I've done. Yeah. So. Yeah, we've uh, had Lance, we, we were like, I, or like in his book, he talks about how difficult that character was to play for him. Yeah. He wasn't well-educated, but he had to become this very well-educated uh, yeah. he, man. No, he, he had to carry that show. I yeah. mean, that was, that, 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 that he was whole great. show I was think that's a shoulder. great character. Uh, I, I, I almost wish X-Files and that had merged more. To, yeah, yeah, and then they could have both survived longer. They did have a little overlap. There was some, some overlap, point, yeah. a couple characters, but it felt like they, if they'd gone further with it, Lance could have replaced Fox. I mean, oh, yeah, yeah. that right. would have something like that might have made it work. But, yeah, yeah. Uh, right. I, I know that was out of your control, but I <laughs> yes. still wish you could do something about that now. <laughs> maybe <laughs> I can. Who knows? If maybe. we drink enough tequila, maybe, maybe we can yeah. turn back. <laughs> yes. The clock. Keep, yeah. Keep, keep them coming. Any more uh, questions? Uh, it's just our friend Adam Lima says hello. Oh, and, Adam. Uh, hey, Adam. Yeah, he hi. was he was back at Corman in the in the. <laughs> Uh, he asked for, he asked for he has I mean, great stories. We already talked about oh, yeah. Unborn, but he, but, he, but he was asking if he had any Unborn stories. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe one other thing that, that stands out from that whole experience. I, I still have the um, the uh, the Unborn baby. Oh, cool. Oh, oh cool. wow. And, uh, you have the fetus. Well, it's sort of crumbling. It's in, it's, uh. it's in a Ziploc bag. Um, and for the longest time at that time, um, I, was, uh, I, I was driving what was... The number one uh, stolen car, broken into car in America, it was uh, it was a '70s model Toyota, and the parts of that they you know very popular in, in the chop shop, and this car kept getting broken into. Oh, wow. So for years, I had the unborn uh, baby <laughs> uh, that I had put some um, some like uh, sriracha sauce on it or something, and some rags, and just zipped it and left it sort of in the back of my car, and it wow. never got broken into after that. It was like That's amazing. You know, oh wow! No, 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 like you're a good luck. No, yes, exactly, wow. exactly. <laughs> Well, people no one, see it and be like, "What the?" Right, hell right. Is no that? one, no one uh, Not breaking into that car. No, yeah. no one would would break into into that car when that happened. Yeah, you know, I saw a movie on on Netflix uh, streaming, uh-huh. and it was one of the, you should be being surprised. Um, and I'd never heard of this movie, and it was called Bloody Birthday. Oh, that's an Have old you, one from the eighties. Yeah, yeah, but it just got the re-release yeah. that because uh, uh, Elijah yeah. did extras on that. Is, it, um, it's that, pretty. Crazy. I haven't seen that, it. That, I haven't that, seen that, it with the fingers is, of the that candles. Is, yeah, it's, it's no, it's about these kids and these kids are on basically. Uh, it's a serial killer movie, but the, the killer is a bunch of kids and there's no, of them. Yeah. And, yes, and it's no spoiler. And you kept and I kept thinking, okay, like, was there going to be a twist? Is there going to be like some Svengali like? Oh, yeah. And no, it's just these evil, evil, evil huh. children evil. and great kid performances. Huh. If um, you ever talk about like, you know. I haven't seen it. Evil I children great. in movies. Yeah. Um, I own it. That, if you yeah, no, it's on Netflix. I've seen it. Yeah, yeah I knew it was on there. It just I, I and their I birthday kids and didn't really. Uh, their uh, birthday movie. is my birthday. And I'm, that, that's why I kept watching it because it opened. It says like June 9th. Oh yeah, oh, and full all moon. Three of them have <laughs> and that's, that's and that's they were all connection. born like we, it was like a full moon that blocks Saturn or something. Right. So, they so all, they're all so, evil. They're all They have they have no morals or something. A really good version of my soul to take or something like that. Yeah. But they but I mean you could never you could never make that movie now though. That's that's the weird thing is no there's there's so much taboo right like yeah. 
subject matter to it and the idea of these three kids just killing people for no other reason than right. they just and they just want to. There's like the nerdy kid yeah. with, with the glasses and he's yeah. like smiling and shooting people. And it, and and to me that shocked me. The fact that wow, they made this movie where there's this like th- this preppy kid who's who's gleefully gunning people down. I forget wow. his name, but that actor is the little brother in just one of the guys, which is like one of my favorite. <laughs> um, yeah. They used to play on Comedy Central all the time when yeah, I was yeah. a kid. I watched it on repeat. That's right. cool. you know, and we're talking about shocking ones. I forgot one that I wanted to talk about. In 1996, this really twisted film came out of Hong Kong called Ebola Syndrome. Oh, yeah, I think and you've talked about that. I've mentioned it before on the show, but that was my, like, holy shit, I didn't know you could do that film. Because mm. I'd seen some disturbing stuff before, like the 70s House films and the the video nasties and things like that. But Ebola syndrome huh. was the first one where I was like, oh my God, this just, it like, it pushed every envelope I didn't think you could push. Well, again, I guess it's more important porn. now than ever. Yeah, Ebola syndrome. yeah there's yeah. that one uh, same year, Amenabar's uh, Tethys, which was Thesis. And it was oh, about, yeah, it's a really interesting movie. movie. Yeah, it's, yeah, hard to see a good copy of it. But no, they, um, they re put it out on DVD oh, in a pretty but decent version. But it's interesting, version. you know, and it, and it's, and it plays with form like, Pre, kind of pre found footage and I mean, oh, so of what we think of now and it's an interesting movie. So it, I, you know, I, I guess I was kind of joking that it was a dark spot in thing, but no, there's all these great movies, there was good stuff. but there's less yeah. of a through line like there is now where we, there's an expectation and there's a festival circuit for these movies, just like we're talking about fantastic fest existence guarantees us that there's 12 probably really solid genre films are about yeah, to get to see. There's yeah. always a couple that stand like people yeah. can't stop talking right. and you're like, oh I gotta see that. That's on my list. Shrew's Nest is the one I keep oh, yeah, hearing Shrew's about Nest from I hear, Fantastic uh, Fest. Yeah, my, yeah. One of my favorite directors. Of the ones we haven't I'm heard. I'm psyched. Oh really? Who's yeah. that? Alex D. Iglesias did it. No, no, he? not Shrew's Nest. Uh, oh. oh he's the producer. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Oh, okay. You're right. He produced it. Yeah. He's a producer it's, on it. It's probably I somebody new. He, okay, I'm looking it up right now. Definitely didn't direct. That's a new film? I do think you asked about my interest. I mean I think it's a very exciting time for horror. I, I think this whole sort of mumble gore mm-hmm. um, movement, if it is, is a Are movement. there some that you I, enjoyed, like I, Ty West or I, people like um, that? Or? Yeah, what's some of Ty West. Uh, really t- quick, Alex, yep. uh, before we uh-huh. jump, um, Shrew's Nest actually has two directors, Esteban Roel and Juan, I suck at this, Juan Ferrand, uh, uh-huh. Andres? Any clue? No. Juan I think they're probably newbies <laughs> with Alex. Yeah, what, yeah. What, so what recently has, uh, in, in the last couple of years, has stood out for you as, as really good genre Oh, material? I, you know, I, I think Adam Wingard is a very exciting guy to watch. Um, have you seen The Guest? Yeah, I yeah. talked about it at the I'm top of the show. I'm going to see it tomorrow. Yeah, so I loved it. it. Yeah, loved there, it. Yeah, 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 terrific, terrific movie. Um, and uh, I think Your Next is a movie that, that is, a, is, is a touchstone movie, and I think that's going to be talked about for years and years and years and years. Uh uh, I liked Oculus. I know that's a uh-huh. controversial one, but I, 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 I haven't seen it yet. I, yeah, I liked it. I, I yeah. talked about yeah, it. I, I, it I saw it opening weekend in the in the theater. Yeah. I know some people think it's like a video a lot of movie, got but, upset but, with but it, yeah. uh, um, I think the first Saw is a is a movie. I, I've heard, um, heard it's you guys a movie. It is. A, talk, I like the first one a lot, it, I, it, but it's great. <laughs> I mean, I think yeah. I, I, the sequels. I mean, I think the sequels are are there are some good ones, but I think the first one uh-huh. is a great movie. I mean, I really do. I think it, and especially for his age as a director too. I mean. Some of the performance stuff, I think, falls a little now in, in retrospect, but but, but I think a lot of But for a low-budget movie yeah, that takes place primarily in one room, it's oh, yeah, pretty yeah, it's brilliant. It's very super creative. You know, right. and the whole torture porn thing is more relevant to the sequels, not really exactly. the first yeah, no, one at no, all. It's, it's really the Darren's first one, fault. It's, it's Darren's fault. It's all Darren's fault. <laughs> it is. It's not a, it's a, it's a great psychological thriller with a, with, mm-hmm. a, with a great twist that I think that was the last time I actually heard people screaming in a theater in, mm-hmm. in the oh, first saw. Oh, yeah, I remember that. When that happens in the first saw, people, and I don't want to say in case anyone hasn't seen it but there were people screaming in yeah. the theater and that, Carrie that, Ellis when that was that, <laughs> that was fantastic um uh it's not really considered a horror movie but i thought it was a horror movie synecdoche new york uh, i saw it's one of the few oh, philip yeah, seymour hoffman philip, Sil- philip seymour hoffman yeah i mean it is it it, it 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 is just to me that's a horror movie it's like one of the it's, it is <laughs> just, I gotta uh, see yeah it. he's you know he's philip seymour hoffman what what can you say about him mm-hmm. you know, greatest greatest actor and just a scary for me, scary, scary, scary movie. Um, and I did like Tusk. That um, yeah, I gotta see just, it. Just saw. I want to check it out. So a lot of people. Have, it's been mixed. mad. It's totally we mixed. have friends. I have friends. Uh, Matt, who just wrote to me, he's just furious after seeing. It. He's like, it made me mad every time Kevin oh, goes in an interesting direction. He does something that it, to me felt like the wrong way to go. But I don't know what that means because I haven't. He seen did one it. thing, and this isn't a spoiler. Uh-huh. But he, it, I, I, you know, I always watch movies, I stay until the end credits end, and, you know, the um, the uh, uh, AMC, what's next, comes on the screen. Or I mean, I still, 
I would tell people to leave during the end credits mm. because he does something that the movie it, it takes it takes itself very seriously. It's a crazy movie. It's a crazy concept. Mm -hmm. The actors take it seriously. They and, but you know it's it's based on a podcast that he that Kevin Smith did. And, and at the end of the end credits, he plays a little bit of the podcast, uh, and, and, he's just, and, and he's just sort of laughing through it. And I thought, wait a minute, this this was a Cheap terrific Nick. movie. This was. Yeah, so I, cheapening the I, effect. I, yeah, you. exactly. Mm -hmm. I, I wish he hadn't done that. No, I, 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 I really well, enjoyed the movie. I'm well aware of the actor that shows up that I've heard ruins the movie. Uh, that's not credited. I didn't even know it was him. That's, really? Was, you I, didn't? I, I, okay, I, I, interesting. Yeah. All right. Mm -hmm. I heard Michael Parks is really good. Fantastic. Yeah, and he's yeah, a good yeah. actor. He's, and, yeah, he's when solid. He's, when he's on, you know. And, yeah, yeah, yeah. Fantastic. Um, but uh, yeah. Well, well my, you know, if if um, you know, obviously you're a genre fan, if you were to go back and do any kind of genre project. If you had free reign, is there any specific one that, that speaks to you, whether it be the horror comedy, whether it be zombies, whether it be a thriller, like what's the sort of thing you would like to tackle if you could? Um, I, you know, I would, uh, I'd love to, uh, tackle, a uh, like a slasher film in New York. Oh. Um, <laughs> right uh, on. cause I really, you know, I mean, it, it, it uh, it, I haven't really seen one that that captures the city the way Maniac did. Driller, yeah. killer. Um, and forever driller killer, killer, and forever driller killer. Yeah, I mean that the, that's a whole genre of movie, like Driller Killer, Maniac, Act. Ms. Forty Five. I mean all these movies uh, that that took place in that. And quack, I mentioned quack, um, quack. New, New York, York Ripper. Ripper. New York Ripper. <laughs> New York was, Ripper. Yeah, the New York. ugliest of all movies, but pretty would much. You, yeah. Would you portray New York today, where it's like very clean and upper crusty? Well, I can't even call it upper crusty, but like. Well, here's. I mean, there are there are corners of New York that haven't changed. You have to find them and alphabet, uh, alphabet city is still kind of stabby at parts i would <laughs> mm, kind of stabby no I, I love that i moved to new york when i was still doing theater and this is like when i was in my early 20s and i definitely remember like we were performing on avenue b and i remember like walking to that and it was kind of like stepping over crack files and things like that i walked all over new york by myself at 2 a.m without even regard if i wanted to get a bagel at 2 a.m i lived in chelsea so i mean it was it was very safe so you know i'd walk to the corner and get the bagel mm -hmm. but there were parts of brooklyn too i had friends who lived in bay ridge and yeah. i definitely remember areas like mm -hmm. eh. it's all i mean there's no more cannibals in Tompkins square park that, no. that, uh, that's, but it's i mean sorry to, sorry sorry to say is that the film that really and, like i mean i assume it's a pretty accurate uh anthropological uh, detail uh, street trash of yep. New York City. Yep. But, because <laughs> every street, time I've gone, flying penises. That's the story of my trash, life. I always street thought trash. street trash was further out in like It actually Queens. does. It feels almost it or feels like New Jersey or something. Yeah, it does feel Queen, a bit yeah, like, yeah, like Queens It's much to me. more of kind of like, because as you're entering yeah. New York, you see this kind of industrial ring of like salvage yards and shipping mm -hmm. crates. And that's where I always pictured street right. trash. It's the same place I always pictured trauma. Like trauma didn't happen in New York City right. for me. Mm -hmm. It happened on this like outer ring of industry and salvage yards. That always seemed like to be like in New Jersey. Jersey with the skyline yeah, yeah, yeah. like around or something. Yeah. You ever see Liquid Sky? That uh, captured yeah. New York. Liquid Sky. I mean, that that, 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 that was actually one. supposed to be like Midtown, wasn't it? Yeah. 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 That, that I, yeah, I, the... I talked about it last year, but Basket Case, last Halloween, when Basket I saw that on the so, big screen again, it just movie. felt like the ultimate New York film to me. It just yeah, felt totally. so perfect of a of a time that just had kind of gone. So and Maniac too, but. So if there's any producers listening, any, Robin would like to direct a New York based slasher. That's it. There you go. A few people have been talking about like how would you Cooper. bring back a slasher right. film you yeah. know it is a genre that is yeah firmly in the ground for the most part like it hasn't had you know with after scream it's kind of been bled out what yeah. would what would be a next What's incarnation the version of it yeah i mean i guess your next is uh close to being a, yeah it's a basically it's a home invasion that's film, a home invasion but it's yeah. got a slasher yeah. element but but you know that real uh ten little indians right uh formula of or nine or however right. many yeah, uh, what's the unique way to, to I don't know. approach it? Well, there was it's the not musical, right? Obviously. The musical in the summer camp. Right, that right, came right, out, right, right. Uh, Stage, Stage fright. fright. Yeah. Stage fright. But that's not yes. going to catch. I mean, you're not going to see a wave of musicals, right? <laughs> I, I wonder it's if it would shame. be. shame. I actually BJ wonder. Is also hurt. I wonder if it would be going towards more of a giallo. Uh, sexual psycho, almost I back like the psychosexual thrillers. <laughs> I'd love a Giallo resurgence. I've, I've seen that though. There are a few. There was one of the Arrow. I mean, well, I'm there, but yeah. but they're yeah. throwbacks trying to imitate something. I mean, like an American version of that, like See, where it's more psychosexual rather than just oh, you're the teen girl. And yeah. Yeah, I wouldn't you know. say psychosexual. I'd say it'd have to go much more of like an elaborate mystery route. 
yeah. like much more. And I mean, this is very Giallo where mm-hmm. everything is very, you know, it can't just be like, oh, shit, Bill was the killer. It's got to be much more. No, like those films never really cared woven. about who the killer was. Yeah. It, it was always this, the, the surprise was always kind of <laughs> stupid. It was more the elaborate way you went to get there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But the psychosexual stuff is what made those Giallo. I mean, they were always so it was always so strange. See, yeah. I think mm-hmm. that yeah. like if Fetishistic. we go back to like the you mentioned 10 Little Indians, like the uh-huh. Agatha Christie, where it's right. like an elaborate structure of how the murders are being done. I think that would I actually could, I work think, think that would be good, but I don't know if it would be popular. That's the thing. It, it, I mean, you know, it's, it's hard to know. I mean, it's hard to predict trends. Right. Yeah. But I think it is an interesting I time to think about you, the slasher Ulrich. film. Well, you can't make it. Sexual. Make, yeah, you make, but I mean, I do think, what would is there a way for a slasher film, that formula-ish, to ever come back? It, it's Maybe it's the casting. Does, is he, uh, Iggy yeah. Azalea listen to this podcast? I would uh, cast her in something. Who does? Iggy Azalea. You don't know Iggy Azalea? Mm. Oh, man, so. I'm younger than you okay, guys I'm are. I'm looking it up. Come on. I don't know. Uh, I know Sybil Danning. Sybil Danning. <laughs> exactly. And they're, and they're playing with fire. Ow. She sings nasty. Ow. <laughs> <laughs> You're singing the how to song. I love that song. You? That's the right. greatest song. And yeah. how. Well, I, I mean, I feel like there's a lot of good stuff in the 90s. Uh, you know, Linnea Quigley's workout. Yep. <laughs> uh, actually, you know, the one cool one we did talk about. Uh, actually, I think Tom Savini's Night of the Living Dead remake's actually oh, really good. Oh, it's great. I love, mm. I love it. And The Reflecting Skin, even though it's like, it is one of the most interesting movies. Yeah. You go back and 90s? see that. Yeah, it was 90. Very creepy. Yeah, very, very creepy totally, movie. That That's totally a creeper. is about as. Out, okay, you know, I'm looking up Iggy Azalea. She's a, uh, she's a singer, rapper. I think, like... I think she's from New Zealand, actually. Oh, really? I think. Hey, yes. Lord is. Lord. That's the one I know. Yeah. Um, but I mean, we could do this at home. Yes. Right. <laughs> yes. Uh, we've, we've no, got let's do it here. here. <laughs> well, I guess, you know, uh, what are you, is there anything you're up to now or anything that you want to plug or talk about? What, yes. What are, no. what are you excited um, about? Yes. Um, yes. I'm, I'm excited about being here. Yes. Oh, well, doing, doing, doing this podcast. Tuesday, the Leprechaun box set comes out on uh-huh. Blu-ray. Every single one of the movies, all in one set, including the new one. And Which one did Brian, Brian Chenchard Smith do in the hood? I think so. Brian, he has a fun oh, Is that why those people are lined up outside Best Buy? I've been right the, now. The, yeah, yeah. The, uh, the leprechaun box right. set. Lep in the hood come to do no I, I thought you got them directly downloaded to the new iPhone. I thought they were just putting it on. No, that's oh. you too. Oh, that's you too. not the well, leprechaun well, movies. No, well, you have to buy the movie. Irish band. No, oh, I Irish see, I see. Yes. The one thing I know for sure is that there is a director's commentary for every single movie. They managed to pull that off. They're not the directors of the films. No, just some directors. Who did one? Who did the first one? I don't I don't remember. Okay. I don't know. I can't. Jeez, why do it. I even bother coming here? It's <laughs> like three hours in. Okay, I can't. Okay. I can't All right. Get fair these facts there's right. a lot of liquor and uh, there's a lot of beer involved. Yeah. yeah okay, I took Benadryl, so I'm just, yeah. You did take yeah. a shot. I'm very proud of you, I, Rebecca. No, I didn't. Elric drank most you of didn't? it. You did? And I thought, yeah, I drank one. Do you know how much Benadryl I have in my system but right you, now? I saw you drink one. No, I took like five. Are you not allowed to say on air that you just took a shot? Is that what it is? No, no, she didn't. I drank it. I drank it. drank it. I 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 raised her child. I cleaned her laundry <laughs> I, you know i pay her bills oh man uh, I'm a well that's why i'm allowed to be mean to her here Elric. uh in this place he well, won't let me speak i won't i won't let you speak so are you under the weather is that the benadryl thing no or is, I, it, is I it actually, just fun it's just for you you know just for, for goofs just, for I just you know i free base benadryl i smoked some in the parking lot no um, awesome no earlier today i was having allergy problems and my eyes swelled till i had to take my contacts out and so like you're all blurry right now which is kind of fun anyway Excellent. but Aren't then you glad you my asked? eyes were really <laughs> swollen i was having lunch with P- morgan peter brown at the time and i was like guys my eyes are swelling and really itchy so i had to go to the bathroom take my contacts out and then i had to take benadryl not you started her story you see what you Way started. No, let's go with uh, last question. I want to ask yes, you. And ask this is way. just instinctual. I don't even want you to think. You ready? <laughs> okay. Nev Campbell, Katie Holmes. Uh, Iggy Azalea. <laughs> oh, <right. laughs> She's oh. pretty cute. I just looked her up. Yeah. Okay. Right on. Uh, well, I, this has been a lot of fun. I really want to thank Rodman for coming on. As soon as I met him, I knew that he'd be a great Killer POV guest. We, so we, thank you. Why thank you? Next week. It was my pleasure. Or next week. Next, next week. Next week. Get get the Leprechaun box set. Leprechaun season on there. Yes. Revisit Idle Hands. It's not, we saw it on HBO Go. Yeah, it's free right now, and it looked great. And uh, yeah, no, and I'm not gonna. I, I, it's I out on Blu-ray. To, they did do a Blu-ray of it, a Blu-ray and, and of it. it looks beautiful. I have to say, yes. I was skeptical that it would hold up because a lot of comedy from that period doesn't hold up. I I was kind of going, oh, I'm gonna rewatch it again because you were the guest, and I remember really liking it. Yeah. And for me, it really held up as a I, great yeah, comedy. It is great it to now. have low expectations. It is. Yeah, you should. It's really. It's a very average film. You guys yes. might not even like it. And then you'll, you'll love it. it. Yeah, yeah, yeah right. much better. But no, the comic timing of it's really strong. You know, yeah, and, it's cool. Um, to revisit it and let us know your thoughts. Yeah.
Do we have a guest for next week already? Yes, we do. Yeah, we're doing distribution stuff. Yes, we can. We're, Uh, we're, uh, yeah, this, it's going to be exciting. I know a lot of people love when we have the Scream Factory guys on, uh, uh, Nick Redman from Twilight Time, uh, is coming on. They just announced the Blob remake on Blu-ray. They went on sale today. And uh, he's got a few announcements for us, and uh, he's going to do. A little and some bit. of their titles are under a thousand dollars on eBay. Uh, you can try. <laughs> but you something. shouldn't buy That's them why on eBay. We're hear. Yes. And he's going to come we're in and explain the how they operate and uh, why you shouldn't buy off the eBay people. How do you mm-hmm. get it if if they only make like eight copies of something, right? So the, well, get... he's going to talk about we're, that. Okay. We're going to get into it next week, but there's only one place you can get it from directly, and it's uh, Scream Archives, which mm-hmm. is uh, uh, the yeah. website that they. They for. have a few horror ones coming out this month, and that's why it's relevant. We will, I think it's yeah. three horror things. They're so. not announced yet. So okay. the, one, one, one in particular online. will be okay. will be the big discussion next week. Uh, and I think but, you'll but want obviously to hear the about blob it. was today. The blob blob went on sale today, and that is something just for the effects alone. It would be worth. Oh, yeah. ordering that. It's pretty yeah, incredible and, what they yeah, pulled off. Yeah, you know, I helped set up um, a commentary. Uh, I, you know, I put uh, Nick in touch with uh, Ryan mm-hmm. on the Bloodcast, who is in touch with Chuck Russell. Mm-hmm. They did a brand new commentary for it. So yeah. some fun stuff on there. And then in October, we have some big shows. West Toby, George, they're all going, you know, uh, everyone's going wow. to. <laughs> just, they're just first names. I'm not telling no, them. In all seriousness, huh. we have a pretty killer October coming yeah, up. Yeah, I'm kind of psyched October's about awesome. my birthday show. Rebecca's awesome. birthday show, yes. where she picks the topic and guests. Yeah, I'm not yes. going to that one. We'll get no, to that. That's in two I'm weeks. Elric's not showing up. Elric is showing up. We'll have Red, uh, Rodman come back on if Elric doesn't I'll be the up. bartender. I'll <laughs> just keep these here. <laughs> I've already and, uh, chosen David Scout to always replace me. I will yes. be drinking on that show, so yeah. it's going to be fun. And, so. and, and I don't know. Uh, I, we're still working out the details, but after Rebecca's birthday, I think we'll have three really, really killer, guests. We killer Halloween themed episodes. And then we're on a break for a little while, but yep. it'll yeah. be worth it. So it's the ground cover from Let's Halloween yes. screen archives. I just need to say one thing because yes. you mentioned them. Yeah. I, I, uh, on my Instagram feed, I have a screen capture of a screen archives, uh, ad and it says, I can't, can't remember what they were, what they were selling, but it said list price, 1895 hour price, Twenty one ninety five. Wow! Wow! Yes. wow. The, the yeah, screen, screen Roger art. Corman would have loved exactly. that business model. <laughs> that, 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 what a that, selling point! I got an Instagram. It's like that. Charlie Band selling yeah. yeah. tactics. Oh, yeah. That's amazing. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's yeah. great. Uh, well, all the best, cool. Roman. And, well, thank uh, you. Thanks for having me. This yeah. was fun. Yeah. Um, Thanks for listening. I really appreciate uh, the well, feedback. Yeah. Like I said to Elric, when I met him, like, I, I've been listening to this podcast and it's it's been a, like a conversation I wanted to uh, participate in. So well, I'm glad we awesome. got you in. I do thank wish you. we could have a live call in function because I think a lot of people would want <laughs> to correct us. Yeah. live call in function. Yeah. Set it up. Man. Come on. Uh, Don't shake no, your head no. knowing first, me. First, troubleshoot and find a way. All righty. Thank you so much. We'll see you next week.